history, prestige, legacy, words synonymous with the most coveted title in chess. To be a world champion means your name etched in the history books alongside greats of the past. Dingley Ren, a deserving world champion. Ding is overtaken by emotions. What a match this has been. But for eight men and eight women, it's here and it's now, as the road to the world championship goes through Toronto, Canada. Over three weeks, chess's elite compete for their right to challenge for the crown. For some, it's a story of redemption. Jan, he's in the zone, he's been there, he's done it before. There's experience, there's youth, and for one nation on the rise, fortune could favor indeed. An incredible mate, he's proven himself that he can rebound. Only one will advance, only one will play for it all. Watch the 2024 FIDE candidates on chess.com. And we are live. It is the final round of the 2024 FIDE candidates. There you see the beautiful shots of Toronto. Weather is starting to heat up. Chess games have been hot for the last few weeks. Toronto's beautiful. I enjoyed visiting and cannot wait to see what happens today in the Great Hall. The chess has been great. What an, what an epic experience this has been for everyone. And I'm sure that the last round is going to deliver as if we need any more hype sitting here alongside, not physically sitting here alongside Grandmasters Robert Hess and Daniel Naroditsky, but thrilled and honored to be here in the last round. I feel just lucky to be able to sit with you guys. You guys have been holding it down, but Robert and Danya, what can you say about what we are in store here for on a championship Sunday? Well, I think that we know who's leading. That's Gukesh with three people who are right on his heels. And Danny, I have to say, I'm a little bit disappointed you didn't hit me with a Mis Amigos. I, I guess I need I guess I need to do it. Mis Amigos, we're here. It's the <laughs> candidates. We are excited. The 2022 Madrid crew. Danya, you said before we went live that actually that was the last time me, you, and Robert worked together was at the birth of Mis Amigos in Madrid, Spain in 2022. I was gonna say, Danny, Rob, you're you're not Miss Amigos anymore. I'm. Um, is is the chat gonna have to be Miss Amigos today? I'm just kidding. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, it's really a great privilege uh, to be sitting here uh, remotely this time, but still with the two of you watching chess history unfold before our very eyes. It's just not something that I take for granted. Uh, these are opportunities. These are moments that I will look back on. For many years, many decades to come, as the scrolls, the pages of chess history are about to get written on this Sunday. It's a privilege. It's an honor. I'm going to bring my A game because I certainly know that each and every player in the Great Hall will bring theirs. I don't think it, I don't think the table could have been set any better, John. Yet this is going to be a day that that writes history. What will the history book say? Obviously, we're all going to find out together. Cannot wait to see what happens. But to remind everybody and properly set the table, let's take a quick look back at was was yesterday, Saturday's round 13, that set up the crazy experience we're about to have together on this Sunday. It's either now or never. Four players still have that shot at playing against Ding Li Ren for the title. When Hikaru played C5, that was the first time we had this position on the board. Like, officially, it's a draw, but if no one claims it, it's not a draw. And they're saying, is it three-time repetition? There's obviously no need for this. We, we know it's a draw. They've played it the same thing many times. In fact, it's already been a draw, and neither side really wants to change it up. Yanda Pomps, Hikaru Nakamura drew, and Ali Reza Feruza right now He's mixing things up. It's the mate. Oh my gosh, we have to bring oh. up the board. Rook takes b7. If e3 check. check, white does not have to give up the knight for that pawn. King to e2. The knight uh -huh. goes to d4 with check. That's and I think king, calculated. D, king d3. He popped the collar because Gukesh may find himself in clear first place heading into the final round. What a and moment. There it is. And for the wow. The clock. If white takes the bishop, black makes the queen first. If white pushes the pawn, Black has a choice of wins. You could even let white promote. That's what you're saying, Robert. And then force the queen trade. And even though the pawn's the wrong color, black, white's king way too far away from the correct square. There's the menu of options. Fabiano has this under control. And for Prognanda, 
It's just a matter of, will he play it out? He does. Mm -hmm. We have queens, but after queen a2 check, that should be all that Pragananda wrote. That means that Fabiano Caruana, he is tied with Yanda Pamchi and Hikaru Nakamura, just a half point back of Gukesh. The G-pawn will control uh, Black's duo, uh, the G6 and H7 pawns. Um, so white will just promote there, but she goes in queen c1. Whoa, she's going straight down the line you mentioned. She has won her fourth game in a row. Vishali, she is playing the role of spoiler as Lei Ting Che, now a full point behind her nearest rival. What an amazing day it was. What an amazing call watching you two guys work, setting up all the action. The drama was real, and there you have it. Uh, just when you think somebody might be slowing down, it just never stops, guys. Gukesh Dalmaraju wins again, is now sitting in clear first, as everyone can see. But three people very closely behind him. Those are the four guys we're going to be focused on here. And of course, anyone looking for the women's candidates, remember we saw the, the highlight there. You can head over to our main channel, twitch.tv or youtube.com slash chess and check out our women's coverage. But all right, guys, let's talk a little bit about the standings. You had the call. Gukesh sits on top. What, what more can we talk about? I mean, we're going to have to preview all of this, but how amazing was it to see that unfold yesterday, Danya? Listen, uh, that endgame technique by Gukesh, uh, it cannot be overhyped, all right? It cannot be exaggerated, just the extent to which he was able to handle the pressure with all of the baggage that he had to handle. This is the penultimate round. An entire country of fans are staying up through the, through the night, burning midnight oil, making arrangements at work to watch you play, You've got a chance to get into the world championship and you deliver move after move after move. Ali Reza, you got to take your hat off to Ali Reza in Prague. Yeah. I said this yesterday, Danny, it takes two authors to produce a masterpiece on the chessboard and they fought their butts off. But man, oh man, did Gukesh and of course, did Fabian and Caruana deliver to set the table for an epic finale today. Robert, obviously you were sitting beside Danny. He talked about Gukesh's endgame technique. What was your biggest takeaway from the action yesterday? Well, Gukesh's resilience. It's unbelievable to watch a 17-year-old fight the way he has. He lost a heartbreaking game earlier. We all saw it. We witnessed him just feel that destruction, the temporary sense of, can I really do this? And then to storm back with these wins and enter the final round with the sole lead, Gukesh, He's awesome. And Fabiano, he's been here before. He's won a candidates. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe on the biggest stage with the number one rated player in chess history. So to see those two down to the wire, able to get those wins, it set us up for the perfect final day. I couldn't agree more. Obviously, three of the other names involved in the hunt here in Nakamura, Nepomnishi, and Karwana are traditionally more household. But for me, it was also Gukesh this morning. Samai Reina called me while he was already live. I was on a walk with my wife. I just have to share real quick. And he, I answered the phone. He's like, hey, you're live to a bunch of viewers. India's going crazy over here. And all, all I could say, guys, was we thought Gukesh was going to be in this event to get experience. That's what everyone said, young 17 year old. Turns out Gukesh was here to give all of us an experience, which is that India is not the future. India is now and he's ready. And speaking of now and ready, we're actually gonna throw to catch up with Mike Klein, who's on site. This was actually from earlier today as the action is getting set to start in Toronto. Let's see what our own fun master had in store for us there. Thanks, guys. Here we are inside the playing hall moments before round 14 begins, and I can hardly remember such excitement in all of my reporting. Perhaps only the final round of the 2008 Olympiad compares when both the men's and the women's USA teams were fighting for medals. And interestingly, in that event, Nakamura was playing, and at the time, he was bouncing back and forth between Canada and USA, so everything has come full circle. In fact, the first move today will be made by Rex Singfield, and Rex has all but sworn off international trips, but even he had to come check out the two Americans playing. However, the man who could end it all is Gukesh. He will be playing black here against Nakamura. Should Gukesh win his game, there is no more drama. Gukesh advances, but there are three people fighting it out that all need a win. Gukesh's opponent, Nakamura, and also, of course, Karawana and Napomnishi. The road is very clear for all three of those men. They need to win to keep their hopes alive. However, if any of them win, they will still need to advance to a tiebreak tomorrow. Now, perhaps the best quote describing the Gukesh situation is one that said, if Gukesh loses, we don't know how to handle this as a country. 
If Gukesh draws and goes to tie breaks, we don't know how to handle this as a country. And if Gukesh wins and advances to play the world championship, we do not know how to handle this as a country. So about 1.4 billion Indians in the world's most populous country will be staying up late to watch this one. Over in the ladies division, things are much more simple. Tan Jiang Yi only needs a draw against the winless Anna Musichuk to end that event and for her to advance to try to reclaim the throne of women's world championship. It's going to be quite a day. Now back to you guys. Nice to catch up there with Mike. Good to see inside the playing hall there. We know the tension is real, and here is the tension across the board. There are really two pairings that matter, guys. They're on top and bottom of what you see. Hikaru Nakamura will have the white pieces versus Gukesh Damaraju, and Fabiana Caruana will take the first move against Yonda Ponmashi. Uh Danya, I guess I'm going to start with you. Uh, which which of those two matchups, not to, not to bypass the other great players who were amazing in, in Toronto, but really were focused on those two, which matchup do you want to quickly talk about there in the pairings we see head-to-head? -head? Oh my gosh. Well, here's the thing. The only player who truly con controls his destiny in the purest sense of the term is Gukesh Domaraju. With a victory, uh, with the black pieces, he seals the deal. With a draw, he seals the deal if Fabiano and Caruana's game, Fabiano and Caruana, of course, the two famous players who are facing each other. Just kidding, Fabiano faces Yana Pomnishi. <laughs> if that game ends in a draw, but this will be, as Hikaru himself put it, a massive game of chicken. Fabiano and Jan, they ruin each other's chances with a draw. Both of them, it's in yep. their best interest, Danny, to do whatever it takes to avoid a draw. But somebody, one of them, has to be the one to take that initial risk, to burn that first bridge, to sacrifice that first pawn. Traditionally, it's been the side of the black pieces, but this candidate has, all, has been all about breaking trends. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about what each player's chances are. And, of course, fans, if you're wondering, what are all the scenarios? We're going to have into that in just a second. But I want Robert to have a chance to to, to comment on that as well. Hearing hearing Donya's thoughts and what the scenarios are, I'm going to ask you the psychology question. Do you think Gukesh is finally feeling the pressure as a young player and that he controls his destiny? Or do you think he's going to stay free and loose and continue to play the high-quality chess he has been? Well, obviously, there's a ton of pressure on a person who may be the next challenger for the World Championship. But in a weird way, he might have the least pressure because at the highest level, you're taught to try to draw with the black pieces. You want to hold and stave off the first move advantage of your opponent. I think the weirdness gets there for Hikaru because let's say the position is even. We're getting to an end game. Does he go all in and sort of just lose the game? And that ruins the chances of a Fabiano or a Yana Pamshi. You have to do what's best for yourself, but you also don't want to be that guy who ruins it for the others. So it's a, just a strange yeah. situation all around, whereas Fabi and Jan, I mean, if they draw against each other, they're both out. They have to play for that win. Well, let's let's dive in and actually break down the visuals for everyone, guys. I'll run through Jan Nepomnishi and Fabiano Caruana's chances here because I want to tee you both up on Hikaru and Gukesh to elaborate further, not just on the fact that they both kind of control their destiny, but the psychological uh, approach they might have. So as everyone can see, here's where we're at. The The good news is but for both Yonda Pomdashi and Fabiano Caruana, you have to win because a draw, you are out no matter what happens between Nakamura and Gukesh. That's the main takeaway because if Fabiano Caruana and Yonda Pomdashi somehow let this game go toward a metaphorical stalemate with no real chances, they're out no matter what. So the main thing to take away from Yonda Pomerich's chances is he has to win. A win is the only way he gets himself into a tiebreak scenario. Let's go ahead and move on to Fabiano Caruana's card because it's essentially the same thing. Well, I, I guess maybe we're already doing that here with Yonda Pomerich because the picture changes, but uh, you'll notice the details stay the same, right? For Fabiano Caruana, it's the same thing, everybody. You have to win or go home. And sometimes we use that term because we're commentators. We like to have fun and drama. Drama can uh, can help everyone feel the hype, but in this case, it is literally the case. So let's move on to talking real quick about the two guys who control their destiny. Starting with Hikaru Nakamura, Jan, uh, sorry, not Jan, uh, Danya, you said already, we heard your comments at the outset that Gukesh is the only one who I guess really controls their destiny in, in the truest sense, but so does Hikaru if he gets a win. So your thoughts on what Nakamura is going to do here, let's get specific. Your thoughts on what he's bringing to the table in this must-win scenario. Oh, there's a lot of buzz. Uh, there are a lot of predictions in general every round, but this round especially, what is the strategy going to be? And essentially what that question is 
truly asking is what will we see from Hikaru in the opening? And it is impossible to predict. It is impossible to go behind the scenes and uh, to try to fill in the blanks. What happened uh, in Hikaru's hotel room yesterday? Well, hopefully there was a lot of sleep, uh, maybe some coffee this morning. But will we see one E4 from Hikaru? Essentially, there are two big kind of strategies. You can try to take Ukesh into a theoretical line. You can prepare a novelty and try to take him out in the opening or you can go for a surprise value. We might see a one knight F3 or one C4 from Hikaru, who's been relying exclusively on one E4 this tournament. We haven't seen a single English this entire candidate. So there are many strategies. You can go for a long game. You can go for an opening takeout. Each strategy has its pluses and minuses, Danny. Yep. And it's just impossible to say there's no right or, right or wrong here. It's basically a shot in the dark. I love it. No right or wrong there from the camera angles either. I love this aerial view zooming in on Hikaru, but okay. Uh, he's not in the building yet, apparently, from what we can see. But what about the other side of things for Gukesh Damaraju, Robert? Danya broke down Hikaru's thoughts. I want to come back to that comment on 1C4. But before we do, your thoughts on Gukesh, right? Obviously, he's the one with the most control because he wins, he wins. But even a draw, he's at least guaranteed a tie break. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's a tribe called Gukesh. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So what, so what, so what's the scenario? Gukesh knows what he needs to get done. If he wins his game, he is the winner of these candidates. He plays against Ding Liren for the World Championship. If he draws, and there isn't a winner between Fabiano Caruana and Jan Napamashi, hey, guess what? Gukesh is also the winner in that scenario. So here we see him shaking hands with his opponent, not just in this round, but for the chance to play against Ding Liren. It couldn't get any more exciting than this. Danny, the screenwriters, the scripters, they've done a good job. You, it had to go a tribe called Gukesh right after I drank a sip of water off camera. That almost came out nice reference. I thought I was going to be the first one with the awkward pop culture freestyle rap, but Hess delivers. It is a tribe called Gukesh. He has a massive tribe behind him, of course, as well. People are just, it, it's its crazy. Shout out to all the fans. It's already whatever it is, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. I don't even know in India, but uh, welcome if you're tuning in here. Of course, if you're watching the other coverage, uh, this guy, he just seems poised too. You see a confidence. I'm excited about it. Of course, we're not going to read too much early on to the body language because right now all that matters will be the chess moves they play on the board. But, uh, oh man, Gukesh Damaraju in control of his own destiny. Who would have thought it? You said the script writers wrote it out well, Robert. Okay, it's only midnight in India now, but it will be 4 a.m. before the show's over for sure. So um, it's that's a, that's a good call out. But um, yeah, you have four guys with chances and they happen to be playing each other in these last rounds. I don't think we could have asked for anything more. So, uh, Danya, there's uh, there's Nakamura sitting with the white pieces. I want to go back to something you said earlier. I almost tweeted last night a random prediction and I didn't because if he did it, I didn't want fans to think I had some sort of inside information, but I almost tweeted, will Nakamura take a page out of Gary Kasparov's book and the most important must win of Kasparov's career, for those who don't know the story, against Anatoly Karpov in a world championship match where a win was needed. He played 1C4 and shocked Karpov. I had a weird feeling. You said the mm -hmm. English hasn't been played yet. I had a feeling that maybe Hikaru will play 1C4. You also mentioned that. Why do you think he might be considering that? And C4, we could have Knight F3, it could be D4. Basically, this entire umbrella of non-E4 openings if you want to take the game out of mainstream theoretical waters, that is just what you do. It just doesn't make sense to me for Hikaru to go headlong uh, into some Italian or some 20 move theoretical line, because if Gukesh happens to know it, it's way too big of a risk. If there is a, is, is a line where Gukesh takes the fun out of the game, it's just not worth it because the way Hikaru has won some games in this tournament is by dragging it out, by getting a long, complicated middle game Gukesh has had some issues with his time management yesterday. He handled it beautifully. So if you're Hikaru Nakamura, get this into a complicated middle game. Try to make your opponent uncomfortable. And the people watching should not expect opening fireworks. I don't think that that is a reasonable strategy for him. They should expect something positional, something that is aiming for a long game, even if objectively the position will be equal. But Danny, Robert, my heart is fluttering. My seatbelts are fastened. This is it. This is it. All eight players, all four games. Of course, as we said, we're going to be focused on two of them. No disrespect to Ali Reza Faruja, Bidik Gujarati, Nishad Avasov, or uh, Ramesh Babu Pragnananda, because I think that 
everyone knows where we're going to be focused as the hands are shaken. I'm going to give a real quick shout out before we fully focus on the chess moves to remind the fans, you can go over to chess.com slash events and cast your vote for the result. You should probably do so if you want to have a chance to win some chessable courses, some diamond memberships. Go over and do it. You can vote before move 10 as someone is standing in front of a camera. First cameraman blocking a camera of the day. Uh, Robert, you win the prop bet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that's bound to happen in every single chess event. But look at this. If I My eyes do not deceive me, and I have four of them. In the top left, we have a Queen's Gambit accepted from Gukesh against Hikaru Nakamura's first move, D4. And then we see in the bottom right, Fabiano Caruana, he also trots out a D4 opening against Jan Napomnesi. So no matter where we look, D4 is on the board. They started with the Queen's Pawn game. I think they're shaking things up here in the final round. John, this kind of aligns with what you said and that the variations in the very, you know, you, you called out the Italian specifically. Obviously, the Spanish Lopez also have some very, very deeply well-prepared lines that everyone knows. We won't even mention Berlin's. I guess it kind of makes sense that we're seeing D4 on the board in games where we, we want even even more early on theoretical flexibility than we normally have. Absolutely. And Hikaru is playing a variation in line with the strategy of just getting a position. It doesn't have to be non-theoretical, right? Anybody who expected him to play one B3 or, you know, one G3, uh, that would go too far to the other side, Danny. You don't want to get a worse position, but the Queen's Gambit accepted. It's just a position. It's a position where you can outplay your opponent. And for Gukesh, his first move was predictable. He did play d5 against Pragnananda in the second round, but uh, after c4, he played e6. So in Gukesh's laboratory yesterday, the possibility of a queen's gamut must have been discussed. And so Gukesh mm -hmm. playing a line that has a little bit of a surprise value. Hikaru definitely, as a top priority, had to have prepared for the queen's gamut decline. So very interesting metagame taking place in the opening, but in line with something that I expected. Robert, Danya mentioned Gukesh must have had this at least at least in mind in some way. Is that because he played D takes C4 so quickly? You think that maybe he he kind of guessed that uh, Hikaru might go for something like this? I don't think he's surprised, but sorry, my attention is briefly on the top right of our screen. I know mm -hmm. we're not going to be looking at Vidit Gujarati. I, I didn't want to give it attention. It's like when your kid is <laughs> tantruming, Robert, you don't give them attention. When a Berlin draw is happening, you don't acknowledge it. Well, the reason I am is because we talk a lot about Hikaru Nakamura and his preparation, and he's played some quick draws, and especially online, and that's about to happen in that top right, so we don't really need to talk about it much more. But for Gukesh, you have to expect the unexpected, and Jan Napomshi sort of said as much when he faced off against Hikaru Nakamura. And to play the Queen's Gambit accepted, you often are saying, I will accept a position that may be ever so slightly worse and I'm going to try and hold on. So Gukesh is not just going all out playing for a win because he can ice the tournament. He is trying to play stable chess. And if my memory serves me correctly, the way Ding Li Ren became world champion by getting second place in the candidates, it was in a Queen's Gambit accepted type of position against Hikaru Nakamura. So, I mean, Hikaru has experience with both colors, even if that game did not go his way. Yeah. Well, by the way, I don't know if the game is actually over yet or not, um, but clearly the players are uh, are looking for the Arbiter to come over and Danya's favorite game to commentate on. Danya, I've never seen anyone get more excited about a Berlin than you do. I mean, how exciting is that when you see those those half numbers appear on the board? I mean, I'm, I might be te te tearing up Danny. I, I can't get the words out. Uh, this is a, a momentous occasion, really a first in chess history for a game in the final round to be decided by... Yeah. A Berlin draw, of course, I've never done that. Just kidding, I most certainly have. Um, that's how I drew Wesley in the last round of a US championship. Listen, uh, it's a 14 round event. These games are not going to impact uh, place number one, which is the only place that we care about. Let me just be straightforward here. Uh, the players deserve a major, major round of applause. Each and every player, particularly, you know, Nijata Basov, the lowest rated player in the field for the way that he fought each and every round a couple of incredibly significant draws, uh, a black draw against Yana Pomnishi, and Ali Reza Faruja, Vidit, who just drew in that Berlin. Okay, they'll get a little bit more rest. I get it. We take their hats off to them. Vidit, he had a pretty incredible event, his first showing in the candidates. So at this point, I just show respect to the players. This gives us one less game to look at. 
and Gukesh, in the meantime, played a very rare move, which did get Hikaru thinking a little bit, but I don't want to jump the gun mm -hmm. here because we also have a really interesting battle on the right side of our screen with Fabi and Yana Pamnishi. Yeah, I think we're going to be spoiled for choice here between these two games because uh, the hype is not just hype this time. This is must-win chess. Uh, are you... Are you surprised to see how aggressively Yonda Pomnishi is already expanding on the king side here, Robert? I mean, the, the theory here, I think, is still is still kind of known, but how Fabi handles this most aggressive way Black can play in these Rogozins is uh, is going to be interesting to see. Well, I'm more accustomed to seeing Fabiano Caruana with that position from the black side. He has played this yeah. before. It's a fascinating choice. You see black storming the pawns up the board because that dark square bishop on g3 on the right-hand side of our screen, it's about to be trapped. That's black's mid will not allow this. But I think for Jan, he is showing his ambition straight from the opening, and I can't blame him. He needs to win. Otherwise, his chances at a third straight Ken's victory and a third straight world championship match they go out the window, but this could be good news for Fabiano and his many fans, yeah. especially looking at the other board, Danny. And I, I know that's difficult because uh, we're juggling at the moment. But for Fabiano Caruana fans, looking at what Gukesh has decided in the opening, it looks like a position where, all right, you know, if Gukesh is going to win, Hikaru is going to have to just throw everything at him and kind of force his own loss. Yeah, it's again, I know we we went through the pregame here and of course everyone's talking about it. I do want to talk a little bit more about the dynamic of chess does have a draw as a possible result. In fact, at a high level, at the high levels of chess, a draw is often the most likely result. So to truly be in a situation where you have to win is black and you play this move H5, you just commented on it, Robert. It might be playing exactly into what Fabiano Caruana wants, right? Because... Now at least I have I have all the openings possible against uh, against a black king in the center and some aggressive chess. So Danya, what do you think about that? I mean, how do you keep yourself calm? What is the psychological approach to tackling your opponent playing h5 and making you go into the sharpest lines possible? Well, again, you don't want to jump the gun if you're Jan Pomnichi and and play you know the modern Benoni or a dubious opening like the Dutch against someone who's armed to the teeth. Uh, that's not the approach you want to take. Right? You're not going to win a game by getting a plus over minus position out of the opening. The best way to maximize your chances is to just get an unbalanced position. And listen, if both players play for a win, they play a perfect game, and it ends in a draw, you shake hands, you congratulate the winner of the tournament, and you go home. Sometimes there's nothing that you can do, and we've seen tons of combative draws in this event. I like this middle ground taken by Jan. He's played a very sharp um, I don't know what to call this opening. This started out as a potential Carlsbad Queen's Gambit declined, uh, Danny. And we should definitely, you know, take a look at this concrete position yep. uh, because it continues to transform as Jan grabs the bishop, but quickly changes into more of a Rogozin type structure. Jan takes over the bishop pair. I briefly looked this position up in the database. I, I know very little about it. And it's definitely on the player's radar. I mean, there's still over 50 games in the database. It's not uh, a very theoretically current position, but I'm seeing Dubov games. I'm seeing uh, a lot of Grandmasters get this position. And Queen E7 uh, after Knight takes G3 seems to be the main move. But yeah, uh, F3 was not forced. In this position, Queen E7 is most popular, but we do see a slight deviation with Bishop E6. Only two games that I see, only a couple of games in the database, including... Uh, Anish Giri versus Domaraju Gukash uh, from never, the English Premier League. Who are these guys? Sorry for mentioning an obscure player. game. Yeah, but okay, Robert. So the uh, the bishop pair has been won by Black, and now we see the the idea of bishop to e6 instead of queen e7. Give us a little set the table here for everyone. What's what's uh, going to be dynamic? Obviously, Black has the bishop here, but probably not even looking to exchange. Maybe keep the bishop on the board and poke at the king side. But what do you anticipate here as far as how Black keeps maximum tension? Well, Black is definitely going to keep the bishop here because that is the quote unquote advantage in the position. But you look at where the pawns are pushed. Both sides have compromised structure on the king side. The white king is just about ready to cast along, and the black king will do the same because there's no universe where black is castling short and walking straight into an attack. You get mated immediately. So what this position really is about is can white expand in the center? E3 to E4 is coming after white castles 
to the queen side. And how is black going to deal with that? The pawn structure is not symmetrical. Sure, white has these double G pawns, but that's not that's all it's about. It's about pawn mobility. White can push the E pawn. Black can push the C pawn at the right moment, especially if the white king is heading in that direction. So this is a fun game. This is a true clash. It's not just this peaceful affair. And this position really needs a deep dive because there are many ideas and many possible move orders. Danya, teach this lowly international master why, based on basic chess principles as I understand them, the bishop pair is a phenomenal thing. Double pawns are not great. And the king is going to be open no matter where it sits. Why, why isn't the long-term chances in this position just clearly favorable for Black? Well, that's a great question, and they might turn out to be. Uh, for newer players, I want to point out that Queen A4 check does not win the bishop uh, as much as uh, we might like to see something like that. Uh, knight to C6 is a very important tool to have in your toolbox, covering the check and blocking uh, and, and defending the bishop. Now, I want to briefly shout out our very own Casa Corley, um, he was the first to play Bishop E6 all the way back in 2014 in the Danish Championship. That Giri Gukesh game was from 2022, and White has many different approaches. Uh, Anish Giri, very principled guy. We love him. He castled queenside in this very position. And there's two important things to understand uh, that kind of counterbalance the Bishop pair. From Black's perspective, Robert mentioned the C pawn. The C pawn can move up two squares or it can move up one square. And one thing that black can do is kind of keep white guessing, right? Play a move like knight to d7 and threaten to open up the c file. But also, for instance, if white pushes e4, uh, as one commentator said, you know, the side that controls the pawn breaks controls the destiny of the game. Here, of course, black will play c6 and white's central mobility, white's uh, improved king safety, at least in this position, white's ability to quickly bring the minor pieces out, Danny, bishop d3, knight e2, that I think compensates for the bishop pair and maybe even overcompensates for it. I think Fabi is maybe objectively better according to the engine, but who cares about that? Look at how unbalanced this position is. It's all about who spent, who did their due diligence and looked at this position more deeply. And yeah. well, it must have been Yanne Pomnishi, although let's not forget, one d4 from Fabi is perhaps not the move that he expected the most. Yeah, it's fair. And obviously you're you're making the comment that it must have been Yana Pomishi based on the fact that we see Fabiano Caruana sitting at the board and where is Jan? So I'm assuming that's what you're implying, that it looks early on that perhaps Bishop E6 being the less common move compared to Queen E7, as you pointed out. Again, shout out to uh, to our man Casa and then some player no one's heard of, Anish Giri. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and um, although Gukesh, we've heard of him now. Um, but uh but okay, I think Robert, uh, Danya makes the best point of all that regardless of what happens early on in these games, and I think people don't need to stress too much about whether the eval bar is a little bit higher for white or a little bit higher for black, because the real thing that matters is that this is going to be a three result game. It's what the people wanted. It's what both players needed, full of dynamic chances for both sides. Well, it's funny because I'm going to call it a two results game where one of them wins because that, <laughs> thir that third result the draw is not good for either player. So it's the exact type of position that you know you have to go for. And there are these subtleties, these nuances that, for example, white can push g3 to g4 at some moment because the pawn on h5, it's both a target and it's pinned. But that does allow the black pawn to push forward. And then we have a static pawn structure. And I don't think that white wants to commit that just yet because it's not going anywhere. But it is an important lesson because when there is a pin piece, we're taught to pile up pressure on it. But sometimes it's actually better to leave it where it sits, especially because the best situation for black often is to push that g5 pawn back to g6. Like, let's protect our pawns, create a chain. But the black pawns are loose on that flank. So these are difficult positions. Every move is difficult. I'm looking at Jan right now. I mean, he he's on the clock. He's kind of side-eyeing the board a little bit here. And he's probably recalling preparation because, as Danya said, in some positions, you quietly play pawn to c6. In others, you need to be in a hurry and play c5. So trying to remember which line requires which move is not easy. And as I say that, Jan has played the quieter variation. I think it's the right start to this game. But both players, Danny, I think they have to be happy because we have a brawl on our hands. I love it. And if you're one of the already more than 100,000 people watching across YouTube or Twitch, 
Robert suggesting that the pawn moves back to g6 is actually not legal. That was a that was a joke. You cannot move pawns backwards, but that's the point is that you recognize if you're in a position where the best move might be to undo something you've already done, you know you're in for some for some fireworks. I really like the g4 idea, Robert, not just because it's a it's a pin and uh an important tactic to point out, but it reinforces a control over this f5 square and one of the other things about these pawns being advanced is not just that they might be vulnerable but that the fact that they've left this square behind if g4 happens and somehow this knight gets going you may end up seeing this square become a topic of conversation as this game goes on and we often say that if someone has two bishops what the knights need is good central squares to compensate for that so all right i think we've talked a lot to kind of set the tone about this on this one i think you guys are probably with me maybe we should back out head over to the other the other must-win game that we haven't talked about really at all yet, that is Hikari Nakamura playing the white pieces versus candidate's leader, 17-year-old Gukesh Damaraju. I say we go full screen and dive into that one. Well, let's do that. But, Danya, I think the first thing that I would like to point out and ask you about is Hikari's time management thus far. He is playing at a very, let's call it a methodical pace. Do you think that while he's the one who played D4, he's caught by surprise by Gukesh's response. He is caught by surprise, perhaps not by the Queen's Gambit uh, accepted. And uh, I haven't done my deep research yet. I, I haven't uh, looked up if Gukesh has played uh, the QGA. Definitely wasn't at the top of Hikaru's list. But the move that uh, I think really uh, caught him and me by surprise is this little developing move, Bishop to E7 on the fifth move. Now, we have to understand that these Queen's Gambit accepted positions are incredibly difficult to study, uh, much like Italian positions, in large part because of the just amount of different move orders. Black and play a6 and c5, black and play a6, b5 and c5, black and play c5 without a6. And Gukesh chooses a move order that's very uncommon. c5 and a6 is sort of a sine qua non uh, of most of Black's modern setups, but Gukesh plays bishop to e7, keeping his options open. That triggered a small thing by Hikaru. He develops the knight to c3, and only now does he play the move c5. I'm not going to pretend to even scratch the surface here. I wonder what stands behind this choice. Gukesh might be trying to quickly tuck his king away and maybe play this line without trying to expand on the queen side with a6 and d5. Uh, Robert, Danny, I'll need your help here. Mm. Also, we see a3 from Hikaru. This is some very, very deep chess. When I think 2750 plus chess, I think... Bishop e7, knight c3, c5, and a3. This sequence of moves really epitomizes <laughs> why uh, why top-level chess can be so opaque. But maybe we can uh, work together to uh, to really investigate this. When you're asking for more translation of 2700 chess, I'll toss it over to Robert first to uh, to keep keep the pecking order on this show correct. So the hierarchy, <laughs> Robert, I, I will. A3 is a bit of a high class waiting move to me in some ways, just to kind of keep an eye on ta on this square and and maybe if the tension breaks, you have B4 later on. But your thoughts on the flexibility Hikaru is trying to keep here? It's a really I would say kind of quiet approach to the position, perhaps tepid. I mean, A3, in some positions, you are going to take on C5 and push B4. I mean, that actually was what happened in the game between Ding Li Ren and Hikaru. We, we transposed to a position similar to this. The Queens came off the board. Ding played a beautiful game. So A3 gets you ready for that. Also, if the Black Knight is coming out to C6 at any point, you're taking away the B4 square. Uh, but I think it is just, as you said, a high-class waiting move. Is it the move that the engine will recommend? Probably not first, but it's not a bad move. It's a, just an, a move. But I do think that Black can go forward with the typical plan. Play a6, short castling uh, kingside. That looks like a normal move. But the whole idea here is a6 and b5, because that light square bishop for Black, it needs to find a useful diagonal. And the b7 square is fantastic. It has the long scope across the board's longest diagonal. So I think a6 is still the correct continuation. And so Danny, you know, you asked, and Danny asked the question of well, what is Hikaru's plan? I think he's winging it. Mm -hmm. A little bit of, a little bit of winging it, a little bit of, of flexibility in that, in that move a3. I, I guess one of the questions I have, is there some other reason to, to play a3 this early on? Is he preparing to keep the bishop on this diagonal in a way where he wants maybe more aggressive attentions in the center. But I, when I think about a lot of these Queen's Gambit lines, I think that the moment the pawns start getting traded or pushed, a lot of simplification can happen. And if the Queens come off the board, is that really in Hikaru's 
favor? Is that what he wants in this game, Danya? Potentially. I mean, an end game isn't inherently more or less rush. People have to understand that, you know, a lot of these Queen's Gambit accepted end games uh, can be actually really dynamic tactically. You can outplay uh, someone in that position and it can get slightly uncomfortable for black you also of course could get a queen uh, an isolated queen's pawn if black trades on d4 but i have an interesting comment that maybe we'll just add to the confusion uh danny and robert so please forgive me but maybe there is a small uh possibility that hikaru is aware of this if black castles in this position the current life position and white castles okay uh when i looked this up in the database um suddenly the game list went from like 10 to 50 plus what does that tells me it tells me that this position can be reached through a different move order okay that's nothing to write home about until i clicked on one of the games it actually can arise with a completely different opening watch this can we go back to the first move yep let's do it d4 nimzo indian not d5 but oh. knight f6 watch this c4 and i find these transpositions to be fascinating knight c3 bishop b4 now the rubenstein variation e3 Okay, people can see where this is going. Short castle. We're following, for example, Serana versus Deach from the title Tuesday. Bishop to d3, d5. Now in this position, knight f3 is the main move, but a3 uh, is pretty popular these days instead of knight f3. D takes c4, uh, first, actually intermediate yeah. move. Bishop takes c4, bishop e7, knight f3, c5, castles kingside, and a6. And we get exactly the position which is currently on the board because both players have just castled. So maybe Hikaru is aware of this position, but through a different move order that he studied, it's really hard to say, but he is adhering on a general level to his strategy of just getting a non-theoretical middle game with a lot of pieces on the board and chances for one side to outplay the other. Love it. I think awareness of those types of transpositions are are uh, advanced for a lot of players, but it also shows that in a game like this where he knows he has to keep winning chances alive, more important than ever to have sort of full full array. What is the full repertoire you can keep at your disposal to avoid any type of simplification or forcing forcing lines in the Queen's Gambit? So that's fascinating. Good stuff. Do we expect Gukesh to oblige and play a6 and complete the transposition here? He can play a6, he can play knight c6, but that is such a good point by Danya, and it actually does go to show why Hikaru sat for a think. When Gukesh caught him with a peculiar move order, you have to think, well, what is Gukesh aiming for? Can I get back into familiar territory that I've studied? And this is a moment for Gukesh where I think the engines, they see like three different moves. They all lead to the same idea, a6, knight c6. You're going to play for yep. this b5 pawn push. And they say it's approximately the same value, but you need to figure out which direction and when it's acceptable. Because actually, Danny, you made this point with the pawn up in a3. There are some positions where white will think about playing pawn to d5 because the bishop can always slide safely on the diagonal. And just to show like knight c6, is d5 available? It might not be the most testing move, but because knight a5 in some positions kicks that bishop away, here the bishop can slide back safely to a2, and we just have a game. So I, I just wanted to yep. point out that this little a3 move, it did have a purpose. It prepares b4, it gives the bishop room on the diagonal, and it allows for a variety of options. Yeah. Okay, I love it. High-level footwork going on here. Hikaru has to keep his winning chances alive. Remember, everybody, if you've been under a rock somewhere, somehow, uh, it is must-win chess here for pretty much everybody going into the last round. And Hikaru, mm -hmm. a win, would secure at least a tie, uh, if not if not a direct ticket to the next World Championship match. So trying to keep it flexible. Let's back up and take a look at the other game and make sure that we keep an eye on both both of these battles. There are four players headed into the last round who have a chance to win first in the candidates for the first time in a very, very long time. That is the case. Danya, your thoughts on, on the progress we've seen over there on Carwana versus Nippon Mishi? Listen, this is great. And, and I wanted to make a general clarification, which is applicable maybe to both boards. Uh, when I use the words non-theoretical, um, people might think that I'm referring to a position which has never been reached. And then in the same breath, I say this position has been reached 50 times. Am I contradicting myself? I wanted to clarify what it means when a line is non-theoretical. It doesn't mean there are no games in the database. It doesn't even mean that it hasn't occurred in top-level practice. It just means it's not a mainstream variation 
which is kind of actively being contested in all the top tournaments. So, you know, the, the Queen's Gambit accepted that Hikaru and Gukesh has. Maybe it's even on the player's general radar, but it's not the kind of position that they spent hours and hours preparing for before the tournament. It's the kind of position where the price of a move is not necessarily that high. Both sides might have quite a few alternatives uh, that keep the general uh, evaluation on the right side. It's a non-theoretical position in the purest sense of the term. I think we're virtually in unexplored territory, and uh, we can see that from the amount of time that Fabi is spending. I would be pretty scared here to have the white pieces. Black's got that bishop pair. Just because Jan put his pawn on c6 initially doesn't mean that he can't switch gears and push that pawn one square further. Black's king, though. I can't take my eyes away from the black king. Where is it going to go? Is it going to stay in the center uh, in these positions? The king actually darts to g7 sometimes, and white doesn't mm. necessarily have to play e4. White could play f4 and go after that bishop on e6. It's such a rich position, and uh, people better keep their seatbelts fastened because this middle game is going to be pretty epic. We talked about the time management of all four players, though. Fabiano Caruana seems to be uh, needing most uh, 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 time. And now he's almost 20 minutes down against Yana Pomnishi. The position is still early on, though. I don't think it's a, a sign that Fabi thinks he's worse or anything. More just really trying to choose the right path at this kind of critical juncture, Robert. It's such a weird dynamic that I am still trying to wrap my head around. Where Yana Pomnishi played the last two world championships. Before that was Fabiano Caruana. They both really want to get there and play against Ding Liren. And so who is more afraid of the draw? Like, who is going to be more devastated by not being there? That's one side of uh, the question. And I just don't know how to answer it because when I look at this position on the right-hand side of our screen, and maybe we can dive in a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, if somebody threatens the other with a potential liquidation, who's less likely to go for it? And I just yeah. don't have the answer. I don't think the players even know. But Donia made a really good observation in this game between Fabiano and Jan that the reason why Fabi's spending so much time is because he has his choice of pawn moves. And that may sound like a luxury that you can pick and choose and all of them seem good, but they have completely different ideas behind them. So you know, if we can maybe bring up the board fully, we can show that in this position, as Donnie mentioned, E4 is the standard idea playing in the center, or you could play pawn to F4, which threatens to trap the bishop on e6 in the light squares. It also frees up the f3 square for your knight to help develop it, but then it takes away some of the juice behind playing e4 because you want to recapture on e4 with a pawn and create a massive pawn center. So it's a committal decision if Fabiano plays f4. It's also a combative one, but as we're discussing, there are repercussions with every single pawn push. Danny, you mentioned from the black side, g5 and h5 leave some squares behind. Playing a move like f4, may leave the g4 and e4 squares behind, and that black knight on d7 may not sit there for long. Eventually, it can hop on over to a square like f6. Can't go to g6. That was a, a slip of the mouse as I'm translating our grandmaster commentary. We Loving it. I, I love what you said. e4, f4, even g4. I know we mentioned it earlier because the pawn is pinned. There's There's got to be lines with, with g4. How does black actually handle this direct threat? Is it is it h4 and is there a way to continue to try to use the pin to try to expand here because at some point the idea of getting all of these pawns rolling for white has to be dangerous but your thoughts on how mm -hmm. black will directly respond to g4 Danya? yeah i mean the instinctual move is h4 uh that's the automatic reaction but uh then definitely i mean g3 uh f3 f4 under certain conditions can now be very strong of course here it gives up the g4 pawn uh, not suggesting that the line ends there. You could sacrifice a pawn in order to accelerate your development. Mm -hmm. um, from Black's perspective, uh, nothing is forced either. Like You can also try to sack a pawn and play a move like queen a5. So instead of h4, I don't think it really works uh, in this position, but you can try queen a5 and set up the, I want to call this positional threat of bishop takes c3. Again, uh, in this mm -hmm. position, I think it's premature, but just to the point about your king staying in the center, we should not assume that Jan will castle queenside um, yeah. As a top priority, he might try to use the queen side and punish white for castling there too early. Um, so, so there's a lot of very committal, committal decisions to be made by both players. But right now, the ball is definitely in Fabi's court, and he understands yeah. the weight 
of this decision. The pawn break that he chooses is going to dictate the game, and maybe he doesn't choose any pawn break and completes his development with knight g to e2. How do you handle the psychology of knowing that right now, Robert, just as much as the objective, what do I think is the best move to play, the players have to already be thinking about the fact that probably no matter what they play with both sides playing their best moves, things are going to be okay. So you're already got to be thinking about what is the move that gives me the best fighting chances long term, right? How much is that already creeping in to the way that Fabiano is calculating the variations here? But it's what I was saying earlier, is the best path to victory trying to complicate matters and outplay your opponent dynamically, or is the best path to victory making it equal and then forcing your opponent to hit the self-destruct button? I really don't know. I truly don't believe the players know because this is a situation that's impossible to predict. You try going into the candidates to work on every opening, uh, every dynamic, rook and bishop versus rook end games. You practice all of that. There is no way to replicate this. This is like a yeah. once in a lifetime seeming experiment. And for the players, they're here now, they're thrown right in the mix. And then they have to figure out, do I go all in and thus risk losing on the board? Or do I keep it calm and then make my opponent try to take that risk? So in this position, all right, if we talk about white's moves, I like knight g to e2. It doesn't commit to anything at the moment. Pawn to a3, it challenges that bishop on b4. It's so either you take my knight or you back up out of here. But anytime you push a pawn where your king is, you may need to think about it as being a hook. Danya made a good observation that the black mm -hmm. king doesn't necessarily have to castle. So just if we could put move a3 on the board, and let's say black does not capture the knight and plays bishop back somewhere. I don't know, d6 looks like a reasonable square. Okay. And... We could see a future where Black plays b5 and knight b6 and b4 and things of that nature and goes after the white king that has already committed itself over to the queen side. These are big decisions, not mm -hmm. necessarily justified from the black side, but ones that Fabiano has to be ready for. And you see the way he's spending his time here, Danya. I mean, is yeah. he ready for this decision? I'm a little bit concerned about f4 specifically in this position, just very quickly. Um, it threatens f5, and we talked about knight f6 here opening up a path for the bishop, but I'm trying to calculate in my head what would scare Jan the most, knight f6, knight f3. Oh, wow. And as I say that, he plays the move. Um, I promise, I, I did not coordinate this with Fabi, but why <laughs> does this appeal to me specifically after knight f6? If we can put this on the board very quickly, knight f3, it looks like white is weakening these light squares in the center, but now the g-pawn is hanging, you have to react to that, g4, for example. White sticks the knight on e5. I'm old school. I like knights on the in the center. Uh, this is called, I think, a Pillsbury knight. Uh, not named after the Pillsbury Doughboy, but after Harry Nelson Pillsbury, uh, one of the top players of the early 20th century, who really liked uh, to play like this. He would put a knight on e5, put a pawn on d4, put a pawn on f4, and just enjoy his life. Bishop f5 uh, is a positional thought here. And I think that Jan has to tread more carefully. That's the way that I would kind of hedge my bets. I don't think he's necessarily objectively worse, but I really like this decision from Fabi. A very principled, very Caruana style right there with F4. Okay. Uh, Robert, go ahead. Give us, give us your quick line you want to show. And then uh, we're going to head to a break before a very special guest joins us. Oh, well, I just wanted to point out that the, the king for black may stay in the center if black takes on f4. I do think that white will take back with the e pawn, trying to trap that mm. bishop. And if the bishop comes to g4, we could see a rook e1 check and the black king staying in the center of the board on f8. White has a hurt pawn structure, double pawns on the king side, isolated in the center. But this is the type of dynamic that blo both players would probably enjoy. I love that. Obviously, right as Danya said, Fabi's move that would scare Jan the most is F4. And uh, because they coordinate all of their big dramatic moments, Fabiano and Danya, Fabi plays F4. What will Jan de Pomnishi do? You're going to have to find out after the break because we have a super special guest joining us, someone who doesn't really need an introduction, so I'm not going to give it and let you wonder. We'll be right back as the final round from the 2024 candidates continues.
I'm joined by Gukesh Tamaraju. You might know him as Gukesh D, or you might know him as Gukesh. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. You don't play online at all. Like, you don't play in these, like, events that much. Yeah, and very rare. Why? I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to do it, yeah. but I'm sort of fascinated you don't do it almost at all. I guess I don't have the same feeling as I play with the board. Um, not saying it's bad or anything, I mean, I... I'm sure a lot of people like it and it's perfectly fine, but for me personally, it's uh, it's just not as enjoyable and not as intense as yeah. board the board chess. Is it kind of interesting for you that it's when you play the team events and you're sort of coming up together, it's like the squad, but all these events are individual events ultimately. The most important events are individuals. Is it a little bit hard to strike that balance or for you it's just your friends off the board and when you play it's... I wouldn't say we are like really close friends off the board, but Okay, we have good relations, pretty yeah. much everyone, and um, apart from the time we play chess, we, you know, we sometimes even hang out and we, uh, we have a very normal relationship, but, uh, but yeah, when it comes to chess, it's, um, it's uh, fully competitive, there is no, uh, there is no friendship on the board, so. At the elite tennis level, the top 20 are all the same level in tennis. Mm -hmm. They can all beat each other. Yeah. It's all mental. Yeah. And do you feel like chess is the same? I'm sure mentality plays a huge role, uh, but I wouldn't say it's all mentality. I mean, I guess there are different styles and also it depends on, you know, certain styles match, like suit uh, better against certain opponents and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But but surely yeah, mentality plays a, plays a huge role. I really focus on physical fitness. I, I do something, uh, either sports or some workout, yoga every day. But what is something that you do in your life that you love but you're very bad at? I love tennis. Okay. But I, I would say I'm quite, quite bad at it. Okay. Me too. <laughs> The 2024 FIDE candidates final round continues. You could be anywhere in the world right now. Thanks for tuning in on this weekend. It's Championship Sunday. Who will challenge for the next World Championship match? We're going to find out at the end of this day. Alongside me right now is Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. Robert has took a quick break because we're joined right now, Danya, by a guy who doesn't really need any introductions. He is the highest rated player in the history of the game, uh, the GOAT, whatever you want to call it. I'm wearing some shoes right now, some Magnus Pumas. Magnus, I put on the shoes, you heard the bat call, and you're here joining us for commentary. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here, man. How have you enjoyed the event so far? And uh, any any big surprises, takeaways for, for you? Yeah, I think like a lot of people, I've been surprised by how well Kukesh has done um maybe I shouldn't have been um uh, but it's been it's been really fun to to see um but it, yeah it, generally it's been it's been a fun tournament um some some ups and downs uh but I mean you cannot be in a better, better situation than than now of course uh being in the um, final round um and uh, four players having a chance to win and facing each other 
I do have to say, I don't know if it's been mentioned on the show before. I do have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed in the last few moves um, of Nakamura against Gukash. Um, I thought it would have been a lot more fun if Gukash had done something like Knight C6 instead of A6 and then DC5, trade Queens, Bishop C5, and so on. Um, the thing is... <laughs> would have turned out to be very, very similar to the game between Ding and Nakamura from the last <laughs> round of the last candidates. <laughs> would have been fun to see Kari sort of take the exact same approach as, as Ding did. But now, of course, he went for Queen E2, um, which frankly, to me, looks like a bad move, but what do I know? Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, and to play with the um, you know with the queens on the board instead. Magnus, it's first of all uh, an honor to have you uh, on the show to offer your thoughts. Uh, whose opening choice s surprises you more? And and generally, uh, how do you think that decision uh, went with Hikaru deciding to play d4? Uh, how much preparation do you do in the final round? And how much emphasis is just put on let's play d4 and c4 and uh, let the game decide itself. Uh, to what degree was Hikaru expecting a position like this? In your no, opinion, no. I've seen I've seen Gukesh play this line with an early bishop e seven in the in the queen's gambit. Like I don't know what the point is, but I'm I'm sure there's. I mean, he studied this this stuff, and I know that uh Gavsky is really good at finding these lines so I, I i know that he knows what he's he's doing um and but the thing is he's played it before so i'm sure hikaru expected it uh apart from that you know playing one d4 um yeah it's, it's a little bit surprising to me since he switched up from from e4 like d4 is honestly like hard to make work these days <laughs> like there are so many so many good lines for for black and the um, and the queen's gambit which is the reason why we've seen a lot of e4 in this in in this tournament so but i'm sure like he had little ideas everywhere against the stuff grukesh plays and um yeah just his last move queen e2 i wasn't necessarily convinced by it seems now that if black gets gets b5 and um an easy development like he's not gonna have any problems whatsoever and most of all like he's gonna have an objectively good position and have a very easy position to play as well so the onus is really on nikar to do something special in the, in the next few next few moves now um but yeah interesting choice of good cash like he clearly has studied this line. Uh, even if I don't get it, he he certainly he certainly does, and I I think it's it's worked out excellently for him so far. He's played b five, as you said he would. I want to go back to your comment about being surprised that Hikaru played d four, Magnus. What what are your thoughts on whatever the the meta psychological thoughts would be coming into a situation like this? Obviously, it's a must win for Hikaru chooses d4 instead of e4 is there some world where maybe you can outthink yourself in that spot or try to come up with something a little too creative just knowing knowing that the the position the players are in given the standings off the board what would be your thoughts on that if you were in the preparation room i don't know really i'm not great in this situation personally when i have to win a classical game on demand it's it's really easy as you say to overthink things when it comes to yeah. openings also um during the game it's easy to become more focused on the results than the than the process so i'm I'm not sure i can give too good good advice when it comes to the opening like there are different approaches um one is to to prepare something very specific go for a quick kill otherwise it's just going to be a draw probably or you play something where you try where you try and play you know some uh some little idea maybe get a maybe get a game for two results which can be can be really unpleasant as well as long as there's like a little bit of pressure 
um in sort of a must not lose situation it cannot uh you know it's, it's not it's not always that easy or you can do something completely different which is just you know uh play some ready or london type of opening even though like both those openings are analyzed very heavily these days uh, but sort of in a way try and get a quiet position mm -hmm. and, and play it from there and which which um approach is best you know depends on opponent mood and so on uh, i don't know well to your point one c4 has not been played a single time uh this tournament one night f3 was played twice both times by ali reza perhaps to get something resembling a fresh position speaking of french uh fresh positions uh in nakamura gukesh there's something like 10 games in the database uh nothing uh, overly exciting in terms of the players who've reached this position but the other board uh is where the explosion is happening magnus could we get your general thoughts uh we just have a move by jan he's decided to meet f4 uh by attacking the rooks and now another decision for fabi uh, between knight f3 and rookie one your thoughts on the current position and the arc of this game so i would say that um the situation we have in nakamura gukesh is really it's really common the white player has to win black player must not lose like gukesh like i i think at this point he'll take um he'll take a uh playoff at plus four like you certainly would that in in this situation so that it's it's uh it's of course an exciting situation but it's a common one and it's it's not difficult to sort of see the um how it works out psychologically the other game is much more interesting psychologically because it's it's a quite rare situation to have at the top level where both players desperately need to win and not only that but they are about equally strong um and in that sense i think they've done a marvelous job so far of getting a position that is at least somewhat unbalanced even if probably about equal um objectively speaking uh so um so so yeah it's going to be very very interesting to see the battle in what follows what if somebody uh one of the players has a slightly better position but um the best country continuation leads to like just a slightly better end game that is going to be very hard to win will he take more chances to keep a game the game afloat that maybe will give more chances to the other player player like personally this is probably the game i'm i'm most interested in um, yep. of these two what do you what do you anticipate Bobby, to do here you just talked about the the psychological moment of you know you're better but maybe the best way to play it doesn't quite have enough winning chances for you to want to choose that line if you're sitting in fabiano's chair here what are you thinking about are you considering bishop e2 something that offers the trade knight of three like take us through a little bit of what you'd be trying to set up with that kind of not just the current position but the broader strategy of keeping all the winning chances on the board that you can well i'm not really sure it matters at this exact point uh i think these uh decisions will probably come later in the game like okay. in this situation for instance like knight of three looks the most natural to me but i don't i don't know um how that really works out of course bishop e2 is a move as well but i hadn't actually I hadn't thought about, mm, I hadn't thought about that uh, at all, uh, really. Um, but um, no, as I said, like it's interesting to see whether, whether how much people will speculate on that, be be because of this exact thing that you know you have to win, but you also know that your opponent has to win. So, um, a lot of people in these situations they will pl just play solidly as yes. black but then if white kind of calls your bluff and and is extremely solid as well then what you do then you're both then you're both losing you know so <laughs> right. i think like the right thing for them both is to play really really hard for a win but it is 
it's hard to do because you're not really, mm. you're not used to do that. Knight of three blade. That's by also the way. what makes it so interesting. Well, it looks like knight of three was played. Apparently, the computer did like bishop e two a little better. But uh, as you said, Magnus, knight of three, the most natural move, and probably what matters right now is that everybody still has a lot of chances. What, what do you do in that situation? I mean, I guess you, you commented earlier that you don't know that you've necessarily been that great in must win situations in classical, although you've you know beaten more people in classical chess than maybe anyone in history. But what, what are your thoughts on on avoiding that moment where someone can call your bluff? You said both players should just play as aggressively as they can, but you know, but how crazy is that then? How how, how aggressive can you really be? Well, it's not necessarily that they'll play aggressively, but they will have to play for for a win. Sometimes, I mean, most. The moves aren't going to be too different, generally, of course. Uh, it's maybe going to be only like a couple of instances where you might change your choices. And I don't think um, that's that's happened so that's happened so far. Um, I mean, clearly the opening choice um, reveals that both players wants to, to play for a win. Um, for instance, like, White has um, more risk-free options, like on move seven, you can take an F6 um, to get a really um, uh, a really uh, boring position there with uh, Queen B3 to uh, to follow. Um, yeah, but um yeah but of course jan will know that fabi will not want to do that so yeah i think they've as i said they've both done done well in that sense and the position we have i mean it's not the most exciting position but what can you really expect uh maybe fabi should just have played the maybe he should have just played e4 and kind of know that jan cannot play the petrov Right, but then he on also, one. but then he also knows that Jan knows, you know, it's right. It's 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 yeah, but it becomes a really fun game. Like if they could have just, if this was a uh, with if this was a theme tournament and they agreed that they would just play a night earth, they would obviously both be be tr be thrilled. But that's not that's not how it works. So. Um, yeah. I, I'm worried about the position that they that they have that with good play, you know, um, there aren't going to be going to be that many chances. But there there is some imbalance. Like you can see that Black has some, definitely has some um, long term positional, uh, you know, uh, potential here. So yeah, who knows if. If we could dive into this specific move, knight f3, obviously um, we see the eval bar, the chat sees the eval bar. Um, in a position like this, uh, the computer is going to vacillate, um, and these small changes are largely meaningless. But this bishop e2 move uh, was preferred, at least initially. And all that I really know about these structures is that from a positional standpoint, um, a, a trade of light squared bishops sometimes favors white because you get this f5 square. Um, and I was partial to this position initially, maybe queen e7 uh, is something that Fabi didn't want to allow. Um, this might lead to some fireworks. Magnus, if you had to decide between bishop e2 and knight f3, um, knight f3 does seem like the natural move, which will likely trigger an exchange on f4. Um, what do you make of the resulting position? And uh, is bishop e2, was that on his radar? And why do you think it might have been rejected? Honestly, I think it may be nerves. Um, because Fabi is re usually quite good at, or really good at uh, dealing with this these positions very concretely. And if he had realized, I mean, knowing the computer evaluation, which I obviously didn't at first when I, I stupidly vouched for um, Knight of Three, um knowing the commuter evaluation you understand that it's a it's a concrete position and that one move is going to be a bit better than the other 
and then you re realize um bishop e2 and i don't think it's about the f5 square or that the trade of light square bishops is good for white i think it's all about time hmm. um and what you need here is uh let's say there's a trade queen e7 which is um like normal very natural play for for black i assume the idea is you go e4 d d5 and that this is good for white Mm. Um, and it's I'm sure Fabi gave this some consideration or actually I'm not sure maybe mm. Mm, yeah I don't know what he, he, he was he was thinking there but I, I think if he if he saw this position he'd probably like it for for white I would say maybe he disliked something else Concretely, like it's really easy to sit and criticize the players, but even even when commentating as as a strong player, you still have less insight into the position than the, the players at the board. So, with Fabi, there's usually some concrete reason why he didn't do something uh, when it looks like like he's made a poor positional move or, or something but there's usually something concrete but i i would not rule out the possibility that he was just a bit nervous and thus he um yep. just made a less than optimal decision i'd have three queen e7 played danny yeah on the board we have it apparently queen e7 also not the computer's favorite g takes f4 but whether whether fabiano appreciates that this e4 idea is back on the table and i think clearly it's it's it, not because of e4 and terrifying. d5 anymore it obviously not there's but but once you take e4 the position is opening up quickly here and this uh this might get us all the all the fireworks we want so uh yeah maybe Fabi will have a second chance at e4 now and, and find it the second time around yeah i didn't really i didn't really get why not to take on I, i'm I would guess he didn't want to take on f4 because of ef that's yeah. the like that's the only logical explanation i would say but very often in this in these lines like the black king is very comfortable on d8 not yeah. very comfortable but reasonably comfortable so if you trade on trade on f3 uh and then make some some room with queen f6 check rookie uh king d8 this should be completely fine for black and of course like as i talked about for before long-term strategic potential like i mean black is just going to be much much better um if nothing bad happens so it's it's slightly surprising um because if you include um gf gf then then you get rid of one problem for black that the pawn on g5 is hanging and now you can think about other moves like i don't know maybe there's a reason why queen e7 works now it at least seems logical for black to to include it like you could also consider moves like um Queen a5 or even just bishop c3 if you want to play play it simple. So this is yeah, this is a bit surprising and it's been a really long tournament and they're a bit nervy. Also uh, uh, speaking of nervy, uh Gukesh just made a move which I absolutely hate. But again, maybe there are some concrete um there are some concrete things that are going on but this makes me f a bit a bit nervous for him i would say uh this is exactly what white was hoping for with this setup and you you usually don't want to take on d4 there and open up for for the bishop like if there's not something concrete with dc5 and then e4 which works out for white then you don't you never want to take take on d4 in this these situations um because because now ed is going to come and some quick d5 could be really dangerous 
Okay, so uh, C takes D4 was the move Gukesh just played that Magnus was commenting on everyone. And so back to this position, you're saying in general, maintaining the tension here, natural moves like knight BD7 or whatever you're supposed to do here. This is this is normally the thing you're trying to avoid is your, is your analysis because of opening the bishop here. I mean, also that that's a bit too general, but very often, yes. Um, yeah. And again, there are concrete reasons for his decision. Like it's not about it's not about that, but it, it's a bit surprising. Mm -hmm. So this position, if White plays, he takes d4. Um, still kind of on the radar. You get this classic. IQP setup, which can be very dangerous if White pushes d5, first occurred in 1949 uh, in the game Pauli versus Gollumbeck, two strong uh, classic masters, Venice 1949. Um, and after bishop b7, uh, Magnus, I think this is the, the natural continuation. Are you putting White's bishop on g5, kind of playing rook d1, trying to get d5 in? Um, and I guess I'm jumping the gun. Is e takes d4 sort of essentially forced, or is rook d1? Danny pointed out, or even knight takes d4, that would be shocking to me. Is that maybe on the radar? I don't see the point. I think um, knight d4 as... Um, yeah, I actually don't think you're particularly close to equality as it's white after, <laughs> after this move. Because the knight on c3 <laughs> is, really, is really bad um, in this situation. Like... I mean, the only plan for white here is to go, um, if is to go for for e four and then set up with f three and so on. But these structures are are um, are, are fine for black. Uh, amongst others, Sadler writes about these structures in his um, one of his books on com on like modern computer chess, and it's it's quite in, it's quite instructive how both humans and and computers play there so like yeah no knight d4 is not an issue and rook d1 i think has to be followed with ed4 so no i don't think so okay so what gukesh's concrete line is whether it's prep still or not what do you think the chances are of that just given how the players have managed their clock what do you think they're they're pooling on in terms of the type of position they thought they might get when they when they came to the board I cannot imagine that this is prep. Um, yeah, I, I would be, I would be shocked if this is prep. Like, obviously, he's, uh, he's aware of the different, different types of positions and and so on. So, um, this is certainly. I mean, he knows that he has to go CD for, for in some lines. But um, I doubt that this is prep. I don't. I don't think so. Ooh, yeah. Big, big moment, by the way, in the other game uh, with with Jan playing the move Bishop takes C three, which might lead to a complete explosion in the center. Um, yeah. Is it okay if we take a bit of a closer look, Magnus, with your with your permission here? Um, the eval bar shoots up. Obviously, I don't want to see it, but I do. And after Queen takes C three, um, we should. Just quickly show to everybody that after d takes e4, white doesn't lose a piece. Bishop takes e4 would terrify me because now if you castle queenside, there's e file pressure. There are some sacks on c6 in the air. The g5 pawn. Wait, castles king queenside. There's rook d to e1 with simply a double attack, uh, other rook maybe even, so that so that huh. the knight is unpinned and black is in some trouble. Yeah, this is why you should have traded on f4. <laughs> yeah there you go that answers the reason why i guess like jan has not used a lot of time and he's made he's made two impulsive moves in a row and yeah yeah so but we need seven and bishop takes e3 um yeah, because imagine queen c3, you simply don't have time to take an f4 because white goes ed5 and you open up the position, which <laughs> um, which is not ideal um, because white is much better developed. So 
Yeah, I, I don't get it. Like, I, I think he must have thought GF, that EF was the issue, but hmm. yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I know that this is, this is the end of a, an incredibly grueling tournament. And I, I mean, yeah. personally, I was terrible the last three rounds, so I shouldn't be one to say anything, but um this particular sequence i'm i'm not impressed with magnus yeah. i was wondering earlier for for those who maybe just joined us magnus was analyzing the line where g takes up four was was both magnus's suggestion and the best computer move and we thought that maybe black was afraid of ef because after takes takes the e file becomes open but magnus pointed out that this is a fine position for black but what i wanted to ask was is there any any credence to the theory that the opposite colored bishops was part of it like is there, is there something about yawn getting in trouble because he was also trying to avoid simplification even if this was objectively the way black should have played knowing that he was playing for a win is it possible that maybe he got himself in trouble trying to avoid that i'm just trying to figure out what yawn might have thought when he didn't take f4 and and, and played the bad move so your thoughts on that theory uh yeah i i just think um that there are so many imbalances in that position that the the thought of it being Croish probably didn't even uh enter Jan's yeah no mm -hmm. I don't think so um, I don't. uh huh I mean you're probably gonna have honestly you're probably gonna have four against two on the queen side and that's <laughs> usually enough to win even with opposite color bishops uh so no I don't think that's an issue at all Okay. Mm -hmm. But it, Danny, I want to let you let you make a point just to just to clarify the, the situation on the board. I mean, maybe I'm I'm panicking on Jan's behalf too much, but I'm just keep looking through that line. Bishop to c three, queen takes c three. Yeah. Uh, D takes c four. Bishop takes c four, and it's an amazing situation because I thought maybe Jan can cancel kingside. Uh, that's even worse. I mean, that's completely out of the question. Uh, at the very least, rook d to e1. I just wanted to show how elegant it is, how rook d1 works in both cases. Castle queen side, you threaten bishop takes c6. Castle king side, you threaten bishop h7. Um, how bad would this be, Magnus, if this position occurs on the board and you're in Yana Pomnishi shoes? Do you just give up the g5 pawn? Are you even thinking about keeping winning chances alive? Or is your priority at this point, I need to survive like five more moves? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea to be to be honest. Um, I think he's probably not very happy at this point. Like on the other hand, he's saved a lot of bad positions in in this tournament. So maybe he feels like this is child's play. But yeah, <laughs> I don't think he's thinking about keeping winning chances alive and so on at the moment. Yeah, I don't know what he's thinking, to be honest. Um, if well, I, if I was the... him, if I was him, I would just curse myself that I didn't trade on f4, which there is no reason for whatsoever to uh, to not do. Um, like it, it's just it it's like it has to be nerves. It's it's just a an omission that doesn't make any sense. Well, you mentioned you mentioned nerves. Obviously, it's a grueling event. The players are exhausted, so nothing we say is meant with with any disrespect or, or judgment to how difficult the task is. But you also commented, Magnus, earlier that that both Queen e seven and Bishop takes e three were were kind of played quickly by Jan. I I don't want to lean too much into that, but there's obviously everybody gets nervous in big moments and some players handle it differently. Do you feel like maybe there's a little bit to that? That was Jan just being, being rash and not, not patient enough given, given what was about to happen. Do you think he needs to slow down in that moment now that he's got a bunch of time on the clock, but might be about to get in a really bad position. I honestly don't think he's capable of it. I think this is the way, the way that he plays and, to be fair, like his time management gives him an edge in a lot of lot of games, but I don't think he has it in him to really 
you know, cool, cool down and calculate in, in this situation. It's like, it's the, um, it's the way he plays and it's made him a really good player. Uh, like yeah. an amazing player. So I wouldn't judge him too hard. By the way, I love what Kukesh, um, I was done. Like, I didn't even think about before. Um, I don't know if it works, but it's a very nice idea. And while I don't think this exact position was prep, I'm sure this must have been an idea that he's seen in, in other lines. And it is like very, very concrete, but nice idea. And I don't think I've seen it before. Um, but this could potentially solve all his problems and give him a fairly easy position to um, to play. So I I like the I like the idea. I still I still feel a bit iffy about. Uh, about CD, but um, yeah, maybe he was right all along. Mm. And what? it's not a novelty, actually. One game, Sadler versus Ivan Sokolov, one of the sort of patriarchs of, of the, this younger generation, the coach of the Uzbek Olympiad team that won gold. Um, very powerful positional player from the year 2000. Um, A takes before knight C6, led to a quick draw in that game, Agnes. Oh, Sadler was white? Sadler, sadly, was white, and Sokolov played AB, knight c6 with black, bishop c4, knight takes b4, and unless I'm getting the wrong read on this position, Hikaru can't, you know, waltz into a situation where Gukash has this control over the d5 square. I mean, this is ultimately the point of b4. You want to get a knight on b4 and get uh, this, this clamp on the d5 square. Yeah, this looks like uh, completely acceptable rqp type of position for um for black like it's it's not like white is worse you know uh you'll put uh the bishop on g5 rook on d1 not an e5 then if there are trades on uh on d uh, like knight d5 you could potentially uh take an e7 go knight a4 use the um use the c5 square so like you have you have ideas, but you know when you when you play the queen's gambit accepted, you don't mind these positions. So I think, uh, yeah, lovely idea from Gukesh. I'm sure he knew it from somewhere. If you found it over the board, I'm really really impressed. Uh, but um, I like it. Was this this uh, this moment? If you're Hikaru, was there anything besides a takes before? If we're looking at a line, whether Hikaru is aware of Sadler Sokolov or not, probably most likely not. If he calculates this and sees this is the opposite kind of position he wants for winning chances, is there any other approach here for White that that keeps the tension? Can you can you consider ninety four? What what other options would you be thinking of if you had to maintain winning chances here, Magnus? Yeah, I guess you'd be thinking of ninety four, and then you'd be calculating lines like Bishop B seven. Um, then I I I would guess Knight F six, Bishop F six, A before Knight C six is still very good for Black. Or it's a much better version, actually. Yeah. Um, so you'd have to go knight c5 instead of um, uh, instead of this, and I'm sure this is something that he would um, he would consider. Um, I mean, there's bishop there's bishop d5 here. I don't know if that's any good. Probably is a bit too too much. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I'm sure he'll consider knight e4, 100. percent because as you said, Danny, I, I'm quite certain that he doesn't love the look of AB Knight C6. Yep. Okay. Wow. Well, if uh, if Gukesh somehow brought some kind of deep idea here and 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 knows this Sadler Sokolov game, or at least you know something about the structure as being good for Black, that would be that would be tough for Hikaru, who, who right now doesn't quite know how to deal with B4. And I, I don't know which game to go to. You guys want to keep analyzing this? You want to go back to the, the craziness that's about to be Karwan and Apomnishi? Your call. Someone Giannis, someone else take the wheel. Giannis thinking, by the way, I was just checking the, the current position. Giannis thinking after Queen C3, which yeah. you know you can't read into that at all. Um, it, it might mean he's double checking, but it also could mean uh, he's encountered an unanticipated obstacle. In that game, 
He also could take White's Knight. I mean, something I forgot to mention, which creates a host of other problems. But Magnus, uh, you're, you're the man. Uh, you've got the decision. Any thoughts on this game? Or do you, do you want a little change of scenery? Yeah, I mean, we can talk about the event in, <laughs> in general, uh, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, for now, the situation is, is simple in the sense that Fabi has a very clear initiative. Uh, he probably has a significant advantage, um, not a decisive advantage, of course, but uh, I think a fairly significant one. And we can try and um, we could try and let Jan find ideas, which I mean, he's very resourceful. Um, as you can see from the fact that he's saving a lot of bad positions, so he, like he will, um, he will find ideas. He will find something that keeps him afloat at the very least. Um, but yeah, we could also talk about the tournament in general. Um, I don't know. Yeah, what let are your him, thoughts about him? him. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll let we'll let Jan. I, I don't want to say suffer at all, but Jan obviously knows. I, I, I will read into it a little bit that I think he may be, he might be recognizing that at least this is a critical moment. He's going to think for a minute. So what are your thoughts yeah, about this? We haven't had an event where four players could win the candidates in the final round in quite some time. Um, I don't remember what the stat was, but maybe almost ever. And does it, as a competitor, we know how you, you've, you've, uh, you felt in general about classical chess, about maybe the formats, perhaps needing a rethink you've, uh, You've been public about that with your actions, of course, no longer competing in the cycle. But when you see the type of excitement that's happening in the last round here, Magnus, just purely as a competitor, does that make you want to jump back in at all? Or what are your thoughts just about how the format has has delivered here, at least in terms of having an exciting last round? No, but the candidates is always good. Yeah, And the thing about the candidates is that, I mean, it's been like talked about before, but only first place matters um and so people have to people sort of have to go crazy um yeah and play play for the win all, all the time in other events people may think more about their rating not take so many chances and it often leads to more boring games i'm still like shocked at uh the amount of decisive games and um some of that is creativity in in the in the opening um some of that is fighting spirit and some of it, some of it is um some of it is amazing Mother. skill by great players but some of it is also just mm -hmm. you know people collapsing um and uh, unnecessarily um but 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 still yeah uh the candidates has never has never really been the the problem in that sense like the candidates are always like it's grueling for the players but it's it's great for the fans mm -hmm. and it's been great for the commentators magnus i had sort of a couple of topics and i'll i'll, I'll narrow it down to two you can you know, take it in either direction. My first question was just about sort of general trends that you notice. Uh, first of all, in terms of openings, and uh, you just broached that topic, uh, but also in terms of playing style, time management, uh, interesting things you saw in the candidates that maybe in this year's candidates, uh, when compared, for example, to last year's candidates or the last couple of years, any changes that you see And the second related topic was uh, in terms of the younger generation, uh, these very exciting Indian players, we can put Noterbeck, uh in that category, maybe Faruja. Uh, so not just the players who participated in the candidates, what do they need to do to move on to the next level? Do you see any clearly defined sort of areas that they could work on uh, or directions, ways that they could take their game to the next level? It's already on the next level, but closer to 2,800. Yeah, I think um, Gukesh is probably a bit stronger than um, both myself and others um, realized. I think the thing about Gukesh is that he's still very young and he can look really vulnerable 
at times then he's also not very good at speed chess which is sort of it can con confuse and it's not as high profile as, as some other youngsters which is confusing but i mean he's proven this in this tournament that he's very strong um in terms of trends in in openings it's been surprising to see um how much life there's been like of course it's it's a problem that you cannot play the best openings anymore um and you sort of have to to search everywhere to to look for for something the thing is also people will not play the best openings as black which helps you quite a lot as um uh, as white and people will not play them because they are not only trying to block like they would in in a world championship match or frankly a lot of um round robin top level events so that does make for um for exciting games and honestly the level of creativity in the openings um from most of the players uh with a, with a couple of notable exceptions has been has been remarkable so i'm really impressed with um with that and in terms of the young players i, I don't know i think they're they're on they're on the right track um i don't think that any of them are quite ready to um to be like a clear number one in the world anytime anytime soon but um you know there are, there aren't many players who are ever going ever going to be like 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 that so um i don't know i don't want to give them give, give them um advice or any anything <laughs> like gukesh actually asked me in in germany and vice now after a tournament that what he should like what he should do in the candidates and i said well i don't have any any good advice i don't i don't know um i only <laughs> said that he should he should not go crazy and he should just look for his chances because other people will go crazy and i don't know i just i don't think that had, advice was helpful at all i just think he's played he's played very well these are fascinating thoughts, Magnus. I, I I wonder about the comment you made that Gukesh and the young players are probably not the best players in the world yet, if I'm reading into that correctly. Do you feel like that's inherently a problem if, if you end up in a situation where a tournament can create a match between two people who are objectively maybe not the best two players in the world at the time? Like, it's both exciting that the candidates is delivering, but do you what would you say about that? If Gukesh is really not maybe ready for a world championship match, is there something that should be addressed in that? Or, or is that just part of the fun? You, you can't have everything in, yep. in chess. Like I've long argued that the world championship system we have is not a good way to find out who the best chess player is. Uh, like there are way to, few games it's too random but it's also it's also a sporting event but you have a situation where like if you if you assume assume for instance that corona is the best the best player in the field uh which judging by the last um last 10 12 years seems uh i mean it seems reasonable to um to assume that even so he's probably only going to win this tournament one out of four times right and then you know um so like it, this is it, the best players are not necessarily yeah it's just the way it is the best players are not necessarily going to play in the world in the world champion and that's why we sort of have to take it for what it is like it is the world champion is not a competition necessarily for who is going to be the best player in the world like i was classical for world uh i was classical world champion for um for a few years but that was not the reason why in itself why i was the best player in the world it was because i had the highest rating and i was winning a lot of tournaments like it was just one of the things um so again it just depends on it depends on what you want if you want to 
make sure that um, the best player is going to win, you probably need to have shorter time controls and a lot more games. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that would significantly increase the likelihood that uh, best chess player wins. If you want to increase um, the, you know, um, the sporting intrigue and so on, then the way the system we have is it's not a it's not a bad way. We should we should just not conflate the two. Okay, fascinating stuff. Good stuff, Magnus. Last question before we head to a break, whether we let you go or not. Um, although we did just have a move here from Yonda Palmashi, if we want to. Let's quickly do some chess while we have you, Magnus. Got to get your thoughts on Bishop takes f3 before the last general question. Yeah, um, I think it depends on concrete calculation now. Obviously, Fabio's going gonna, gonna to take back. Um, I mean, ED5 doesn't obviously lose on the spot, but it looks, it looks crazy. Uh, so it's going to take back. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah, it all depends on concrete calculation here, whether you go um, D, then like FE is not good for black uh, positionally, but you could argue that black has some uh, some counterplay with the H pawn and he will probably be safe. So there's also bishop takes E4. I don't, I, honestly, ED I don't is know. Interesting. <laughs> ED actually by the way, maybe G takes just F3. a bullet brawl. <laughs> G, G takes F3 has been played. Um, but it <laughs> is funny. I will mention E takes D because Magnus, Magnus, and I wasn't even considering it until you said it, Magnus, but it turns out it actually it actually yeah, is it's possible. Terrible. Can, yeah, it's kind of crazy. And at Bishop D5, apparently you have this sort of like maybe. Probably maybe with the other rook. Sort of crazy... Okay, but maybe yeah, the other rook. rook. But Black Castles yeah. and then like it's kind of out of, out of the woods. Mm -hmm. And why? Yeah. GF white is just solidly better. It's the practical choice, right? GF, DE, Bishop E4, you keep the status quo. Although yeah. Jan did that yesterday and eventually let Hikaru um, out of his grasp. So so Fabi will have to find the moment to step on the gas pedal. Um, but maybe Jan's coming to him. Yeah, DE on the board. And D5 is a move yeah. here too. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, D5 maybe met with Queen C5. Mm-hmm concretely um get the queens off the board yeah I, I mean jan would love to see that even though he's still under a little bit of pressure there yeah mm, yeah so i i assume bishop e4 is the most critical um is you want to play with um with energy here go for for d5 or a rookie one next um I don't know if GF is possible. Is that crazy? No. The idea is... Queen E3, yeah? Oh, I was thinking Bishop E C6, Lone Castle. <laughs> or Rook C8 actually wins. Oh, uh, Rook C8. Oh, my God. Uh, Rook wow. C8 actually works. What a move. Okay, Rook C8. Okay, Castles actually does work, but Rook C8 is even better. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, I, so instead of Bishop C6, then Rook E1, Castles, Bishop C6... Queen anywhere would actually be probably be acceptable for black. <laughs> wow. No. Wow. Clear discovery. Amazing. Magnus casually casually throwing out top engine lines here. Um, wow. But, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh but but I, I, I would guess that White has something with connect, connected with D five that's a bit more energetic. Like probably D five here and then because the white bishop hits C six uh queen c5 dc6 comes with a, a lot more power yeah uh, what am i saying yeah. even here long castles is a move takes bishop c6 yeah queen c3 bc3 bc6 bishop c6 long castles like it's okay <laughs> i mean fabi has to calculate this stuff too fabi can't assume the moves like d5 are right anywhere close to a knockout if he sees this idea so you have to Maybe yeah, but this is interesting. To... This is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, what is his What is his idea here? Hmm. 
I currently have no clue. Yeah, this this detail that bishop c6 is not as strong as it appears when black castles is is critical. So rook e1 castles is the critical move. Um, gf just seems too vanilla. g4, I thought black just plays h4. Apparently that is the top move, Danny. I think we can we can reveal g4 is the top engine move. But what after h4? Why is this a, a net positive for white, Magnus? Or is uh, this? Because because the pawn is not threatened anymore. Fair it's enough. as simple as yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, that gives him some um, some potential. I'm just curious as to what um, the engine said about f4 instead of. Um, yeah, uh, of f 4 instead of bishop 4 if white is actually a bit better there or not. It's crazy. Uh, Magnus, I have to ask a question from Robert Hess, who's in chat, because he'll be rejoining us when you're gone. I feel like uh, I feel like it's only fair to give him the mic. He said, if you were in Hikaru's shoes, would you go all in no matter what? Even even if it's possible that the best thing could be a draw, and you see your countryman hey, Fabiano maybe going to get a win against Yana Pomnishi, what would you do in that position? I mean, are you just you got to do what you're supposed to do, or do or do you think a little bit about the fact that well, I'm definitely going to lose if I play for a win. Maybe I let it be a draw and give Fabiano his best chances. What what would you do in that spot? I don't know. Is this a team event? It's not a team event. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess it's only an interesting question not i think you're right i mean and you're obviously pointing out that it's not a i mean it, do what's best for you i i, I think so, I, I think hikar and, and fabi are on okay terms but i don't think they'd they'd probably not sacrifice a lot for each other <laughs> i don't think so yeah. Well, it's interesting because Hikaru said coming in that if, if not him, of course, he would love Fabiano to win. But as you pointed out, it's not a team event. I guess I, I think the question is most interesting only through the lens of you literally know you're going to lose if you're Hikaru. Let's say you're in a spot where it's either lose or draw. Would you would you still just do everything you can to create fighting chances or would you kind of say, all right, I'm going to I'm going to let this be what it is? I don't know. I don't. I mean, there is also some money difference between shared second and fourth. Yep. Maybe that matters. I don't know. Um, but I think he's gonna like push it as far as he as he can. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Fair and by the way, to mention something more, uh, Gukesh, he's. Very, he's a very clever boy. He's actually learned from um, from Jan on the other board. And he saw that if he played bishop b7, which is a very natural move, then knight c5 could come. And who knows? Maybe it's a problem that the pawn on b4 is hanging. So he's played b a3 first. And then he intends to play bishop b7. And the pawn will not be hanging and he will not have the problems that uh, that Jan had so very yeah. good very key inner 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 between move there couldn't get the words out but yeah b takes <laughs> a3 there zug intermezzo <laughs> intermezzo swish and zug i don't know in between zug. something but well all right we uh we were planning on maybe taking a break here magnus the last question i wanted to ask for you just in general because it is something that uh, more rare for the event. You haven't had both the men and the women's candidates in the same physical location uh, in a, in a in quite some time. What are your thoughts on the importance of that for the game? Just speaking generally about attention for women's chess, the 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 tournaments being side by side with live fans. Do you think that's something that these top events should do more often versus a, a segregated men and women's candidates happening at different times in different places? Oh, I think it really, it really depends on on what you what do you intend to do in the in the future. Whether you want to have men's and women's events, or you intend to continue to have 
open and yeah. women's events. Like the importance of the w women's event is going to depend a lot on what decisions you make in the future. Like right now, uh, I mean, it would, if, if there are no open events, obviously the uh, prestige of the, um, of women's tournaments will, will increase quite a bit. Um, so like at the moment, um, I don't know. I think it's like, it's obviously up to, um, to, to organizers, but, um, I mean, I think there are, there are definitely overlapping audiences, some audiences that only likes one, not, not the other, the way, the way it is um but um yeah sure. personally i like um i like to to watch women's chess uh to see more decisive games because there are generally more decisive games in top women's events um even compared to um to open events with with similar level but now you know we've seen so many decisive games in the open events <laughs> that um, they've sort of felt felt similar in that sense. More decisive chess in this candidates than we've had in a long time. Agreed with that. Well, Magnus, thanks for being here, man. Uh, do you want to stay with us on the other side of the break? I, I was planning on letting you get back to your afternoon there, unless you want to stick around. Your your call. Yeah, it's it's evening where I am now, but uh, I'll um, I think I'll uh, leave you guys to it. Okay. Well, Magnus, it's an honor. Really appreciate Thank you coming it's on. It's been an honor, a pleasure, and uh, thanks for helping set the tone. And we're going to be right back, everybody. Don't go anywhere. Robert Hess rejoins us. Thank you to Magnus Carlson. It's our coverage of the final round. The 2024 FIDE candidates is still heating up. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Here with Grandmaster Jan Nipomnici, two-time World Chess Champion Challenger, currently world number seven, and top ten in every format. Jan, thank you so much for joining me. What, what's the experience like of winning two candidates? I mean, somehow it's anyway. There's like it's technically two horse race, so two guys were, were on plus two, and the rest of the field was on fifty percent. Yeah, somehow I managed to keep it to, till the end. Yeah. And then uh, the Dubai match was uh, uh, didn't end according to the plan, of course. And um, then it was sort of like a question uh, if it was like a very random thing that I managed to, you know, qualify for candidates and win the candidates. So it's sort of like the, re the result of some, uh, some big job for that, that was done. And somehow maybe it was more pleasing for me to think like this. Yeah, but I thought, okay, well, all right, then maybe maybe this is like the second. Yes, yeah, so, okay, maybe I'm not as bad. You know, I think it's like sort of a world, re a world record, yeah, like losing uh, two uh, consequential matches in a row. I mean, the two, 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 two world championship matches in a row, playing against different opponents. Okay, the Dubai match, uh, Magnus did just great, yeah, so... And let's say the Ding match was... Uh, all right, I have the experience, so, you know, uh, just I tried to not repeat my mistakes from previous match, but of course there are a lot of mistakes which I'm waiting you like every time. So I came up with something new. So, for example, um, whatever it may sound, but uh, um, 
you know, especially after first couple of games, I felt for him so much. So of course, like first like couple of days were insanely painful uh, back then. But then, uh, I mean, uh, I'd say from Dubai match I recovered quite quickly. I mean, it's just a part of the game. Yeah, of course, some losses are more painful, some are less. Is there anything in your life you uh, love to do but are very bad at? Everything else, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if we played a classical chess game, how many beers would you need to drink for me to win? Uh, maybe just uh, well, I don't think I I'll get to to waste it from 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 beers. Maybe you should ask for something stronger. More, stronger, you like? Okay. What's what's the conversion system? Okay, what some cocktails? Uh, <laughs> okay, some tequila perhaps. Yeah, like ten shots. Well, ten probably would be enough. <laughs> oh, uh, once we should uh, we should try. Uh, if you were to chess box somebody, mm -hmm. not gonna ask for the opponent unless you already have one in mind, uh, what would be your price? In some cases it would be completely completely free. Oh, yeah? just, uh, just for my, you know, uh, because it would, you know, uh, be very pleasing to kick someone. All right, well, we are back here with the final round of the candidates. We just how we just had Magnus Carlsen. It was awesome. Uh, that's no lie. And I got up to some lie detector chess with Levy Rosman a little bit ago. We decided that it was enough fun for the fans. Might as well have some other people jump in to that process. And uh, here's a quick preview of who's coming up next on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. You're going to see these two gentlemen engage in some lie detector chess. Do you regret choosing chess as a career? Something that he said there was a lie. Do you ever regret walking away from the classical world championship? That's also a lie. Do you think I'm the best chess player of all time? Have you ever played a competitive game while drunk? Oh! <laughs> don't ask the question if you would, don't like the answer. It's the truth, but it's a very sensitive question for him. Well, I feel bad now. All right, I can't wait to see what Magnus and David get into, but I also can't wait to get back to the game. So rejoining us is Grandmaster Robert Hess. Robert, hope you enjoyed the break, the snack, whatever you did. I know you were just sitting there watching us like everyone else because Magnus was on. But are you ready to jump back in with me and Danya? Well, there couldn't be bigger shoes to attempt to fill. It's awesome to hear Magnus' thoughts on the games. You know, how he said that these players, some of them are going to be nervous. Other times they make decisions that may seem you know, not the best, but it's so difficult when you're in that chair, all those calculations swirling through your head. So, yeah, without further ado, I do think we should go back to the games, and I'm pumped to see how this event concludes. Danya, I think obviously we've been we've been really focused on the fireworks happening to, to Caruana and Nipponmashi. Looks like Gukesh did play Bishop B7 after Hikaru recaptured the pawn. So I'm going to assume you would like to head back to the game between Karwana and Nipponmashi. But let me know if you uh, if you want to say anything else about Hikaru's position before we jump in. I mean, both games are exciting in their own way, is, is the way that I would put it. Objectively, there's more fireworks uh, on Fabiano's board, and Jan is already walking on hot coals. Um, on the other hand, Gukesh with some really amazing decisions yet again uh, in the early middle game, the B4 idea. And then Hikaru responded with the very enterprising 94. Gukesh senses the moment he takes on A3, which I thought was very important, and uh, has completely equalized, which does not mean the game is going to end in a draw. There's plenty of chess to play, but maybe we can check into Fabi versus Nepo and, and, and see if we can at least figure out a roadmap uh, for Jan to emerge out of this opening in one piece it might be too late uh but i'm really concerned robert uh, you know you were watching this unfold 
how concerned are you for Jan's position? How, how bad is this? Well, can I first just say that Castle's queenside line that Magnus came up with was amazing. Yeah. And like, just to even think about these ideas, it's, it goes to show one of the many reasons why he's the number one rated player in the world. But, you know, as it pertains to this game, Jan might have to come up with some wild resources because his king is still in the center. No matter which direction that King Castles to, it's going to be in a line of fire. And as we talked about earlier, there's some loose pawns that Black needs to deal with. I mean, now there's already this G5, F4 tension. At some point, yep. there's this D5 move. You know, even if Black Castles queenside, D5 will be on the horizon. So, Danny, in this position it looks very scary for Jan. He does have plenty of time. And as we've seen in the past, he has become better at using that clock instead of making hasty decisions. It was interesting, too, because as Magnus commented, uh, perhaps it was a couple of hasty decisions by Jan earlier that got him in the sticky spot. But sometimes someone's strength is also their weakness. You can't really judge a player as great as Jan de Palmashi, um, because he is so resourceful and he does know how to use his time when it matters most. It's probably why he's thinking here. Will he need to come up with that line that Magnus did, Robert? That's the question. Uh, just to show everybody, the key idea was that Black can take F4 because as, as scary as this is, apparently you can go for some crazy lines where in the end black has castles long in a lot of in a lot of spots and it just gets out of everything so obviously that's just one variation that magnus showed i, I don't know what else he might be thinking about here unless you guys want to suggest other candidate moves besides g takes f4 what else what else can black go for hmm. yeah gf G, g4 was an important subtlety that yeah, we as mentioned and Magnus, you know, the idea is just establish the pawn in a defended square. Robert, after h4, my question was, okay, so bishop takes e6, still loses. Uh, but do you now play rook e1? I mean, that is a move I would find very difficult to resist. But d5 also has to be considered. Um, which of those moves does your intuition point to? Well, in general, even in the live position, a lot of the plans for white that you were talking about, they failed to gain a decisive advantage because black traded off the queens. I think that is the essential uh, issue in some of those variations. So at some point, white yep. should probably throw in a king b1. I don't know if in this position or after rook e1 or something like that. But just because d5 is white's idea and queen c5 is the follow-up, then I think having the king on b1 takes away all of those resources from the black side. I like that move. It's funny. We didn't consider that at all when Magnus was here. Of course, we didn't have a time have time to get into every forcing variation. But a really simple move that I think also points out, Danya, that you know, sometimes you get caught up in the moment as a commentator. You're looking for the most forcing knockout. But actually, mm -hmm. if you just play King B1, you kind of point out that maybe you've gotten everything you could have asked for if you're Fabi. You have winning chances. The position is going to be full of crazy tactics for many moves to come. I really like this subtle King B1 making mm -hmm. D5 and Rook E1 probably stronger in the future. Exactly. And it's kind of the irony, one of the most difficult things in chess. When do you, I use the term, you know, step on the gas pedal. When do you try to cash in and go for the kill? Yesterday uh, in Jan's game against Hikaru, uh, he did it too slowly. He played Bishop C2, tried to build up the advantage and miss the moment. Here, it might be the exact opposite. You don't want to cash in immediately. You want to cross your T's, dot your I's and set yourself up for the queenside attack. Now, black will likely castle queenside here. And um, my next question is, so Robert, d5 now uh, with no forced queen trade, uh, queen c5 no longer pins the white king to the queen. That's the genius of the move king b1. Oh, and look at this line, d5, queen c5. Really quickly, we have a move on the board. dc, bc, rook takes d7. And here there's a oh, different what? intermediate move. No, not here, not here. Here there's Wait, cd. I was going to say, what? No, no, no. Okay. Here there's, no, pawn takes knight. Pawn takes knight check. Yeah, yeah. Where's and then the bc. But if black plays bc, um, then Jan will be oh. sent back to uh, the Middle Ages to the, with rook takes d7. I wanted to make some bc pawn, but I'm going to spare, spare the crowd. Mm -hmm. Queen takes queen, and now rook takes rook check. This is kind of a classic theme. And, yeah. man, Robert, king b1. That is such an important move. That is well, the sort of unsung hero of the position. Well, Danya, this is, you know, in our team battles, I just come up with a prophylaxis. You find all the tactics. I was not looking at mm. any of this rook takes d7 stuff. I really was just trying to say, even in that position, if there weren't rook takes knight on d7, 
the Black King yeah. is in worse shape. So I'm just trying to avoid all of these queen trades. That's my number one goal as white. And how do you evaluate that your, yourself? If you're at home trying to assess when do I trade pieces, when do I keep more peace on the board, even though the White King is missing a C-pawn, so it doesn't look the safest it could possibly be, the Black King is the one that's under the direct assault. So that is why I want to stick my King on B1. I for sure didn't look at uh, this rook takes d7 move if i'm being honest but even if i didn't have rook takes d7 just keeping the queens on the board is favorable for white and i think that fabiano in a must win situation well this is actually a pretty nice position and he would prefer to keep the queens on the board speaking of nice positions we do have action in the live on the live board g takes f4 has been played by nippon mishi so will fabi find g4 that's the move that got us into the variation we were just looking at. Or will he come up with wow. something else? We back up. We back up to our look at both boards. Still, uh, actually, no, not still on the clock. Knight to C3 retreating move from Hikaru. It's looking better and better for Gukesh over there. Yeah. Wow. This is a big moment, uh, of course, on, on the right side. Uh, G4 is not, I would argue, not an intuitive move because your hand is reaching for that rook on H1. That rook is calling Fabiano, put me on E1, but uh, it ain't going to be that easy to find G4. Definitely on the other board, some big positional decisions are being made. It's easy to just dismiss that game. It's, ah, that's just dead equal, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So uh, I'll give you the say, Danny, Robert. Um, where do we go from here? Do we try to wait uh, for Fabi's move? Definitely some stuff to discuss on the other board too. I'm good with either one. I, I was setting us up to to peek back in on Nakamura because we have him for a while, but I think this one yeah. has some more fireworks, so we can, we can stay here if you want. I mean, uh, you guys are the grandmasters, so that means you get to tell me what to do. I'm just here to draw colors and occasionally make an awkward joke to get chat mad at me. So you're on your call. <laughs> what I'll say is that Fabiano versus Jan, the result doesn't matter if Gukesh somehow wins. So I think we should uh, maybe just check in on how that game is going, not suggesting that yeah. Gukesh is winning. But as we look at that board, it was actually the premise of my question to Magnus. It wasn't about, you know, will Hikaru play Kingmaker? Will he pick favorites? It's more about like for the competitive integrity, if you want to call it that. I mean, Hikaru wants to win. There's no doubt about that. But as we go back to our, you know, our other game here, looking at this position, how in the world does Hikaru play for a win? He might have to sacrifice something, and then he's material down, hoping that Gukesh goes astray. I'm looking at the clock. Gukesh is ahead. I'm looking at the position. Look at how solid this is for Black, because when your opponent yep. has an IQP, an isolated queen pawn, you want to control the square in front of it. And if you look at Black's position, a pawn on e6, a knight on f6, a bishop on b7, and a queen on d8, it's clear that Black controls that square, even though he has not developed that queenside knight. It's not really relevant just yet. He has firm control of that blockading square. So I think that Gukesh did everything right, including his clock management. Yeah, I, I want to say I thought it was a, I thought it was a great question, and it was fun to hear Magnus's answer. I think it is it is we don't get to talk about this type of stuff very often. This is truly must win territory for four players and the dynamics within that. I. I I think there, it'd be crazy to think those types of thoughts aren't crossing through their head at some point. But in the end, Hikaru's main job is just to try to keep tension on the board right now. So I do applaud Knight C3 on that. He's like, look, I'm not I'm not trying to simplify this. Even if I'm giving uh, black control, I have to try to keep the tension alive. Will he go for Knight mm -hmm. A4? I Will mean, he? Yeah, he has this to, is, almost. Knight D5 is a take. I, mean, I am just f amazed at how Gukesh, how elegantly he's handling this position and he's very close. I thought Bishop D2 was maybe a panicked reaction by Hikaru. Queen E4 deserved more careful investigation there as an attempt to mix things up because Bishop D2 seems like the kind of move, you know, just an automatic move you play. What if Kukesh just trades on C3 and either puts the Bishop on D5 or tries to get the other Knight over to D5? Time is running out here for Hikaru to produce something because he's yeah. just going to end up in a, a worse position. And I had some some general uh, words of praise for Gukesh uh, that I wanted to share. But first, I want to throw it back to you, uh, Danny and Robert, to, to, to figure out your take. Bishop D2, what are you seeing here? I just want to say the reason I was a little surprised is, again, I suggested Knight A4. You said Queen E4. Both the moves had the purpose of keeping some pieces on the board. The pin would kind of do that. So I was also a little surprised at this. But Robert, you go, you go next. What do you think Hikaru is seeing 
he's allowing a minor piece trade. We know that that's probably not ideal if you want to keep fighting chances alive. But what what are your thoughts on where Hikaru is trying to drive this? He, he's got no advantage whatsoever. And I think he's a bit fortunate not to be worse here. Not that he's done anything egregiously wrong. It's just you, you look at the position. Black has that blockading square. You can just initiate some trades. And the key to going after an opponent's isolated pawn is when pieces start getting traded. And that means you have to use your valuable resources that remain to defend what is a measly pawn. So I mean, you could take on C3 here and just develop your knight on b8 to d7 bring that knight to f6 play in that manner you could also instead of playing knight to d7 establish the bishop on d5 and that bishop on c3 what's it really doing there it is a tall pawn protecting this d4 pawn and there's just no way that black is worse here that gukesh would sweat it because white has no initiative no attack and perhaps bishop b1 is the only idea to yeah. go after yeah. the black king but it feels like wishful thinking I'm glad you said it so I didn't have to be the one to point out the obvious idea of trying to keep some sort of checkmating attack alive because, as we saw, the computer doesn't like it. At this point, small advantages are irrelevant. You have to think about the bigger picture of White has no choice but to keep keep playing for a win. So I think Bishop B1 had to be a move that is on, you know, on Hikaru's mind. But is it enough? I mean, objectively, Black is doing great here and has completely surrounded the IQP. So mm -hmm. what creative way is Hikaru going to keep the tension alive with yeah that, that's the huge question here and 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 listen uh if we get into a situation where hikaru you know he goes for he burns his bridges and gukesh ends up uh in a dilemma he can essentially force a draw force liquidation that might happen even if hikaru brings his best efforts to mix things up gukesh might yeah. go for it if he feels that listen i'm up on time i'm not risking a lot He'll look over at the other board, and we might see some very interesting decision-making going on. But we're not there yet. We're not even close to there yet. Let's not forget Hikaru's game against Fabi, um, that he won very abruptly. It looked like a dead equal position. Kind of things were heading in the direction of a draw. And then, boom, we know how good Hikaru is at stirring up complications. The problem here is that you can't really compare the two positions. Uh, there's a clear roadmap here for how Black just sits on the position, puts a piece on D5, and... You know, Hikaru is, is a wizard, but his pieces move in exactly the same way as everyone else's. There's only so much that you can do, uh, Robert. Would you would you echo that sentiment? For sure. I mean, Hikaru knows he's not better. He probably thinks that he would rather have this position from the black side. And we would be talking about Hikaru potentially grinding down Gukesh, who has an isolated pawn here. So things have not gone the way that Hikaru wants. But on the flip side mm -hmm. of perhaps some of that disappointment is the player we see on our screen, Gukesh. The way he has played, he lost that game to Faruja. But if we remember that loss, it came from a position of strength. He was up a pawn for seemingly yep. minimal compensation before things went off the wall. So I've been just so impressed with the way Gukesh has played. From the start of the event, I thought that his variance could be a strength for him because he could string together some wins. I just didn't know that he could be this solid and get those wins. And it just feels like we are watching history unfold. It's not over. He still has a lot of work in front of him, especially if he does draw this game and one of the others win, there would be a tie break. But I just love what we're seeing from Gukesh. And you heard it from Magnus, right? Nobody really expected Gukesh to be this strong this early in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it truly is a golden age uh, of chess. And uh, to a large degree, uh, really all of the talented Indian juniors uh, are both easy to root for uh, and demonstrate remarkable composure. Uh, but, you know, Prague and Vidit, this wasn't their year to shine. They've got a lot to work on for Gukesh, really from the earliest rounds. Um, I was floored with the composure. We talk about the maturity that he demonstrates on the board, but really off the board as well. That loss... Uh, that he suffered to Ali Reza in the time scramble. People talked about it, but once he put his head in his hands, it was hard not to not to feel tears in your eyes. But after that, he set up the pieces. He's remarkably courteous, even after the most painful results. And at that age, um, it demonstrates incredible composure. And to echo that, as he takes on C3, he's been a GM for four years, almost exactly four years, which is crazy. He's been over 2,700 for a year and a half, even as the youngest player in the candidates. And I found an article from 2020, actually exactly four years ago, where uh, he credits his parents and his family to uh, the development of this composure. His uh, mother is a microbiologist. And quoting from that article, 
Gukesh, this is at age 13, says she has always been calm and collected, but these are tough times. And to see her composed even now is a big lesson for me. Um, and just the maturity that he's demonstrated for so many years, uh, the inspiration that he's taken from his family, which is completely invested and uh, from the chess culture in the country, uh, which just allows uh, these prodigies to flourish and feel confident is amazing to see if you're a fan of chess. So hats off to Gukesh, but Hikaru, he's not taking his hat off that quick. He will most certainly try to find a way to tighten the screws and make his journey to the first place very difficult. Well said, man, on the Gukesh, the Gukesh story. I had no idea that's, uh, that's, Definitely seems a little bit uh, prophetic in terms of looking at the crystal ball of his own future there, being uh, being impressed by his mom's composure in a tough time. And uh, Gukesh, again, there's no denying it. He's been mature beyond his years and and held his nerves together and right now seems to be on pace to, well, he's going to make it hard for Hikaru to do what you just said. It's going to be hard for Hikaru to keep, to keep the magic going. As you said, he may be a wizard, but even wizards need, I don't know what they need. They need they need spells or something or flu powder. I don't know. We're going to move on. Let's go back to the to the view of both boards. Uh, I saw some some random uh, I isolated minority in chat asking about the games we have not been looking at at all and don't plan to. One of them is already a draw early on between Perugia and Vita Gujarati. And you can go to chess.com slash events if you really do want to follow uh, the other game that we're not looking at. But Fabiano has played G4, Robert. This was the idea that Magnus suggested. It was the best move, according to the computer, so he's, uh, I don't know, Fabi, maybe Fabi's feeling fresh right now. Is he feeling it? Does he feel that there's a chance to pounce here? He definitely is feeling it because you look at the position, Black's king remains in the center on the right-hand side of our screen. Without those rooks connected, you don't feel like you have everything under control. But even if you do castle, and when you do castle, you know you're walking into a line of fire. So uh, Fabi has played this very well. I think looking at the other game, and I said this at the start, if you're Fabiano, you need to win your game and then hope that Gukesh doesn't beat Hikaru. Looking at that other game, it does seem to be going Fabiano's way. He has a lot of work in front of him. He is not winning, but you just have to feel like you can do it and that it's not meaningless because a win here would feel meaningless if Gukesh were to also win. So I just, you know, I think the psychology, I really do feel like that weighs on players, but Fabiano, so mature. Uh, he has played for a world championship. He knows what to focus on. Same with Jan Nepomsky, who's played in two world championships. But I, I just think that, you know, when you have to look at your own game and still keep a side eye to see that it's relevant, it makes it more nerve-wracking for both Jan and Fabi. Agreed. I want to give a quick shout out, break the break the fourth wall here and just thank Chess on Earth. Just because the the whatever the gifted subs are going on has been all day and we haven't shouted out any of the other ones. So again, thank you for the support from everyone, all fans and everyone who's watched this event for the entire month of April. Uh, I haven't even been here, but this has been amazing as a fan. And so just thank you to everyone for the support. All right. We're going to jump in. Thank you, Chess on Earth, as you continue to do whatever it is you're doing today. Again, once again. So thank you for the support. All right. All uh, right. I still vote we dive back into the lines of Karwan and Nippon Rashid, not because Nakamura uh, and Damara Gukesh Damaraju's game doesn't have as just as much to go and just as many things at stake. But if we get those lines we talked about, if King to be one is on the board, the move that Robert suggested, we might be looking at a game that is starting to get uh, get out of hand for Yon Nippon Rashid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and as I said with, with Magnus on the show, I think it's important to emphasize right now, Jan isn't thinking about winning this game. I don't think that that's how your mindset has to work in the situation. Um, you can worry about that later and you can let your opponent worry about that. At the start, I mentioned one of the players will have to take a bigger risk. So if Jan can at least get into a playable position, it might end up being Fabi who burns too many bridges uh, and over presses. So right now, Jan is focused on the, on the next three or four moves. So am I. And the reason he's not moving is because there's a dilemma. H4 wastes a very important tempo that might allow White to play this very important King B1 move. Um, I'm saying very important uh, too many very important times, but it is very important to emphasize these details. Um, but Danny, it's also very important to show the Black and Castle immediately and give up the H5 pawn. Not because you want to, but maybe because your King safety is more important. What, what do you think about this idea? And Maybe White doesn't grab the pawn 
straight away the eval bar doesn't say, like I it. I wonder if taking with the pawn is the wrong idea. Maybe you should take with the rook. I don't know, but I wonder why the computer doesn't like that. Is it just something natural like knight f6? Yeah, that that's definitely the issue because the white's biggest advantage, well, there are several of them in the live board, is that that knight is not active. The king is in the center, but you see on the analysis board that you just uh, played out, the king yep. was able to get to safety and the knight was able to secure a better location for itself. So that is not what white wants. You see the pawn structure uh, is seemingly healthier because black has these double isolated F pawns, but white has weaknesses of his own in that variation, D4, F3, and H5 all being isolated pawns. So the mm -hmm. pawn structure is a mess. I do think that, Donna, you were kind of indicating this. D5, instead of capturing on H5, does feel like it's in the spirit of the position uh, because the queen trade may be offered with queen to C5, but mm -hmm. in these continuations, the h5 pawn is not an h4. So after, say, pawn takes c6, forcing the queen trade here, that after black takes back, now I take on h5. And we're in an end game where all of black's pawns are terrible and white has an outside passer. I see the bar went down, so maybe that was the wrong capture. It's funny how uh, all these moves look quite natural and that you have to exercise that pinpoint precision. But even there, it does feel like white should have the better chance. Maybe rook takes mm -hmm. h5. Uh, and bishop f5 so also better. possible, by the way, Robert. Sorry to yep. cut you off. But I, I agree, yep. rook h5 is the most accurate. Bishop f5 might allow h4, so rook h5, try to get a pair of rooks off the board, which increases the significance of this outside pass. We're well spotted, Robert, to keep the possibility of gh alive until the queens are off the board. That's that's really deep stuff. And a line like this would just show that now with the rooks off the board, okay, a move like knight f6 earlier was working, not even close here. White can check, trade rooks, and the h-pawn is simply running up the board. So, okay, this is not the kind of variation we expect Jan to go for, but it is important to to point out. G4 is on the board. Jan is still thinking. And if he goes, I guess the other move we already looked at, if you're just joining us, everyone, was to keep the pawn with H4. But then the really simple move like King B1 avoids any queen trades. And so many moves are dangerous here for black. D5 is dangerous. The rook is coming to E1. We keep talking about bishop F5 at some point, maybe being on the agenda. So... These are these are the types of things that Jan Nepomnishi is thinking about as he takes a sip of his tea there. We know he loves himself a nice cup of tea when he when he plays chess. If you didn't know that, now you do. It's a fun fact about Jan. So yeah, what else? What else can Black go for here? Well, you know, we don't like to read too much into body language, but I just saw Jan there. Uh, the way he's been studying this board, uh, he is trying to find something that looks dynamically playable for himself because he needs to win. Right? So just holding Fabi off already isn't that much of an accomplishment because a draw and a loss are more or less equivalent results. You need to win to have a chance to play for the world championship. So this is like the worst scenario for Jan at this stage because I think, Don, you were indicating this. He needs to really just try to survive. That's the first step. And then hope that once he survives, Fabi goes all in in a way that gives Jan some chances. But here... I think the position looks terrible for Black. You see d5, you see the h5 pawn hanging. Can you waste that turn with pawn to h4? It looks very risky. So I think from a practical standpoint, if you gave this to the players in a blitz game, they would think that White is just cruising here. And that's why it's important that Jan uses his clock wisely. He has more time and tries to find that way out. But Danya, it does look like a position that Black is going to struggle finding accurate move after accurate move. Your point is well taken. The chances that Black wins this game at, at this point are are very, very low, objectively. And, and Jan understands this, and that's weighing on him, even though, you know, the top priority, yeah, he has to survive uh, one more move. But but he also knows what the reality of the situation is and how close he is to, you know, to winning a third candidate in a row. Um, maybe not as close as he would have liked to be going into the last round. And we talk about this fascinating stat, I think the first time in three candidates that he is not tied for or in clear first, which is crazy when you think about it. This has been amazingly done by Fabi, maybe spending a little bit longer than he would in a less significant game, but still finding the money move G4. This, this is going to require some wizardry by Jan. He's displayed it throughout the tournament. He needs a lot more where that came from. You pointed out it's been good to be Yonda Pomashi in the last few candidates tournaments, which have stretched out over many years because, of course, the, the initial 2020-2021 broken up by the pandemic candidates. And then in Madrid 2022, you have a Yonda Pomashi who has been dominant, to say the least, 
but uh, but he still has a chance here. And as one of the featured chat comments pointed out, if Fabiano beats Jan, he will be the only person to have done it. Jan has not lost any games so far in Toronto, and so we should not give up on the idea that he that he comes up with some magic and gets out of this. But Ooh. we're we're go ahead. No, I'm just looking at the other board as well. Hikaru in trouble, I think maybe in a little Hikaru, bit of trouble. But he did play Bishop to B1 as well. The idea that we were we were talking about as far as perhaps the only one that uh, you're trying to create some magic here if you're Hikaru. You put the Bishop on that long diagonal pointing at Black's king, but uh, you know, pointing at the king and actually having something concrete as far as a checkmate attack goes are two very different things. And Gukesh can play natural moves here and likely just maintain his very, very sol solid grip on the position. The, I mean, this is just hope chess in a way, because for Hikaru, it, it kind of is a situation that you could steal from the wire. If you come for the king, you best not miss, because uh, that's the only way he is going to win, is if he finds a checkmating attack against the black king. But with, with what army? Right There is a bishop on b1 on the left-hand side of our screen. The bishop on c3 for white is not out in the open. It just feels like there isn't much here, but Hikar is doing the right thing, at least in terms of optimizing or attempting to optimize his winning chances. I mean, Gukesh is super solid as a human, as a player, and in this position. He Look across the board. His pawn structure is quite nice, better than White's. His piece coordination, all those pieces are on uh, quite natural squares. His rooks will be connected if the queen ever moves out the way, and the d4 pawn for White is the biggest weakness on the board. So, Danny, I feel like Gukesh, you look at him right here. He should be confident. He should be confident. He's taking his time to make sure he chooses the right plan. Note that he's also confident on the clock. Always have to observe those types of things when facing Hikaru Nakamura, who usually enjoys a time advantage. But yeah, Gukesh can just play natural moves here, Danya. Knight f6. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a better move that just brings the knight into the center, guards the king side, continues to reinforce pressure here. But he doesn't have to. There's There are other moves. I mean, rook to c8 is a natural move. There's probably probably a million moves I, I could come up with. But the point is, not really a lot for Gukesh to worry about here. I don't want to turn our back on Hikaru, though, who tends to create mm -hmm. something out of nothing on a regular basis. Hikaru will fight. Um, he will fight to the last drop of blood. You know, for him, at this point, you keep pieces on the board, uh, you, you try to extend the game and, and, you know, maybe hope that Gukesh commits an inaccuracy, you know, gives him that tiny glimmer of hope. But uh, Gukesh's time management as well makes things difficult from Hikaru. Good call. Uh, Danny, Rook C8 uh, is is the move that, that he starts with hitting the bishop. And I think he will follow up with Knight F6. And just to illustrate how uh, much of a weight the fact that Hikaru has to win puts on him, if he was playing this very same game in round one. Let's say that their colors were reversed um, and Hikaru had the white game first. Instead of bishop b1, he could have played the move d5, which I think would have essentially forced complete liquidation. Maybe we can show this very quickly. I, I don't want to take us yeah. away from the game, just to give people an understanding of how uh, the decision-making works here. So, um, yeah, so instead of bishop b1, if we could, could, could we put, yeah, d5 in this position, uh, bishop yep. takes d5, uh, bishop takes d5, ed, rook a d1, and Gukesh wouldn't be really be able, I think, to keep this d5 pawn alive. Knight f6, queen a2, and pre-move bishop takes f6, rook takes d5, sign the score sheets, go home. That's out of the question. That would just hand Gukesh the draw on a, on a golden platter. But as we go to the live board, people also shouldn't expect Ikaru to just deliberately self-destruct in order just to claim that he was playing for a win. There's rating on the line, there's money on the line, and uh, that should not be the expectation that he just hangs all his pieces and says, oh, look, I sacked a piece. Uh, Gukesh was not born yesterday, and ultimately Hikaru's allegiance is to play uh, the move he thinks keeps chances alive. But if he runs out of opportunities to do that, then you know it's better to take a draw than to do something insane. But it could be coming up, not necessarily yet, to the point of no return. Because at some point, yep. Gukesh is going to look at this position and say, I know I can make a draw, and Hikaru uh, at this stage objectively might be happy to, but why should I? Look at this position. Black has all of his pieces on healthy squares. If that bishop on c3 moves back to b2, let's say, the queen can even jump out to a5, a knight to f6. You, you have 
full board control from the black side. And look at white's pieces. The bishop on b2, staring into its own pawn. The bishop on b1, not allowing the rooks to connect with one another. So black's pieces are just on better squares. And I, I do sympathize for Hikaru because mm -hmm. this onus on his, him having to win from the first move, you don't get to play kind of natural chess. You have to sidestep these simplifications. You have to go for a win when a draw may be what you do, as you said, if this were the first half of the tournament. So I really do feel for any player in a must-win situation because you don't win by just hoping that you'll win against an elite grandmaster. You, you have to just be able to play the position as if you were in the first round. But this is the last round, and Ikaru may see his chances at the World Championship match dwindle if he can't come up with that magic. And we know it matters to him too. I think he, uh, Hikaru has has had an incredible journey to get here. But let's not pretend that he is uh, his opportunity to compete for the world championship would mean the world to him, and uh, means the world to us that you're with us. We're going to take a very quick break right now so we can pay that off and be here as these games get down to the wire. So it is the 2024 FIDE candidates. Our coverage is going to be taking you through all the drama. Don't go anywhere. Looks like Fabiano just played Bishop takes E4. Nope, that was a moment ago. Love our camera footage. We will be right back. What's up, y'all? This is Chito Bear. I was here, otherwise known as Cheeto, here with big brothers and big sisters and chess.com at St. Boniface School. We're here to play some chess, have some fun, give out some lessons, and just have a great day here. So we really appreciate all the people that's involved in this. We're gonna have a great day. So, you know, the NFL and Big Brothers Big Sisters organizations collaborating, I think means a lot. Um, whether we choose to or not, as football players or as entertainers, you know, we become somebody's role model. I mean, we don't have to make that choice, but that choice is made for us because we're doing something that a lot of kids want to do. So we have a responsibility as well to kind of live a good life so that they can see that. And, you know, Big Brothers Big Sisters collaborating with the NFL gives us a chance to impact these kids directly. You know, come to their schools, come to their houses, help in the community so that they can see what it looks like to get to where they want to go. And also just a grown man who maybe you watched on TV come and it humanizes them. And now they're saying the same things that your parents or your teachers or your community leaders are saying, you know, it, it kind of hits home a little bit harder. So I really appreciate the NFL and Big Brothers Big Sisters collaborating.
It's the final round of the 2024 FIDE candidates. Thanks for being with us. Where have you been? Damaraju Gukesh is leading the event. He is a half a point up on the field. All he needs is a draw at least. Hikaru Nakamura, he must win in order to keep his chances alive to compete for the next world championship. Fabiano Caruana, he must win in order to keep his chances alive. His opponent who is not there right now, Yanda Pomishi is facing an uphill battle as black on that board. He also must get a win. We take a look at both of these games, guys. It's uh, It's been crazy and it's getting crazier. As we said, every player has to win, not named Gukesh Damaraju, but it looks like he might have the best winning chances of all. When we went to the break, it was different, Robert. And now Gukesh has grabbed a pawn on D4 as Hikaru is all in right now, and it might be getting away from him. Sometimes greed is good, and Gukesh gave up a pride and joy of his position, his light square bishop on the left-hand side of our screen. It was given up for a knight, but what did he get in return? A central pawn, and look at that. His queen skirts on over to A4, where it protects a loose pawn. So on the left-hand side of our board, it is Gukesh, a pawn ahead, Defending his pieces, still no weakness in his position. Danya, you couldn't ask for more if you're a fan of Gukesh. No, this is incredible precision. Gukesh, Bishop takes F3, you know, in my old school understanding, is a hard move uh, to play. Just because that Bishop is so nice, it's so easy just to sit on the D5 square. But I mentioned that if Gukesh sees a clear path where he can play for a win without risking too much, of course, he's risking a little bit. He's giving the Bishop pair. Um, maybe a little bit of an initiative, but this Queen A4 move, his entire play is predicated on some very deep calculation. I think there's a crucial variation that he's just calculated, which tells us that essentially in a normal broadcast, on a normal day, I would say this is almost a two-result game, uh, this time uh, between a win and a draw. But of course, today there's the pressure and there's Hikaru Nakamura who will just uh, scrape the bottom of the barrel trying to find some way to keep intrigue alive. Jan has castled queenside. Danny, uh, can we jump quickly into that game? Uh, and could I quickly show the line that I think Gukesh has calculated? Uh, which yeah, let's do it. I, I just on in, his I entire quickly, play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Please. I wanted to quickly set that we left with bishop to d2, saying just natural moves for Gukesh would be enough. And I just wanted to show what happened because a lot of moves did in the few minutes we were gone. After knight f6, Hikaru gave up the pawn. He resets the problem of development, the bishop disconnecting the rooks, but at the risk of bishop takes f3 and queen takes d4. So mm -hmm. catching up to the live board, Danya, now take it away. What is the line you think that Gukesh has calculated that makes him confident that he could steal this pawn mm -hmm. and be happy to get away with it? Queen b7 is the critical move, in my opinion. And uh, Hikaru intended the sacrifice. You know, For people watching, he wanted to get at least some sort of an imbalance. This is what you have to do. But after bishop to c5, uh, you get some fascinating complications. Likely, white will play queen takes a6. This is the move I was looking at. Uh, and now, there's a big, big dilemma. You see the eval bar dropping. If you want to make a draw, you grab the queen and shift the rook to a8, and that's it. You have no losing chances. Black might even win the pawn on a3, but because of white's bishop pair, Hikaru would not lose that position. But the queen from a4 swings over to h4. I think this is the money move. And look at this. White has to play g3. Otherwise, knight to g4. Now, here there is a fascinating moment where bishop f2 is tempting, but I think black should start with queen h3. Setting up the threat of knight g4, inducing bishop f1. Queen b7 is on the board, by the way. And now bishop takes f2 is essentially decisive. Queen takes h2, bishop g2. Wow. And choose your pick if knight e4 should win. And if king f3 instead, then I think black can bring all hands on deck e5 and e4. And you don't have to calculate any further. This is game over. I am barely sitting in my chair right now. Again, I'm sensitive about not overdoing and not overstating the case, but this could literally happen. And bishop to c5 is very likely going to be Gukesh's response. Of course, Hikaru doesn't have to take on a6. That's important to note. To note. And queen a4, queen b7, bishop c5, he could backpedal, but I don't see how, Robert. Yeah, this is a critical variation. The attack against the white king happens so fast because if you just look at the current board, I mean, with the bishop coming to c5, white doesn't have defenders over there. All of the pieces are either on the d-file or about to be on the a-file. So the king is left alone, and a king doesn't usually survive when a queen, bishop, and knight line up against this. That's actually a really important variation. And for Hikaru, if bishop c5 is played, 
Maybe he has to make a move like Bishop to B4, but this is not the move you play yeah. in a must-win game. You're just allowing trades if Black wants it, and it's not even threatening anything because there's already a defense of the Bishop on C5. So Black mm-hmm. could even throw the A-pawn forward to force White mm-hmm. to take on C5 in these positions. Black's in no danger, and I think that it's Hikaru who is in danger. Danny, it's the question I've been asking all along. Does Hikaru yeah. go all in at the risk of losing and ending all hopes for the players on the other board? Uh, I don't know how to answer it, right? Magnus said it's not a team sport <laughs> or not a team event, right? At the same time, I, I kind of, uh, you, you heard me, I, I assume you were listening in. I kind of asked your question a second time because it's most interesting if you truly are staring down the barrel of of a of a kamikaze decision, you know, truly, truly knowing you're going to lose versus versus just surrendering that your best line is a draw. I, I don't know. I've never been in that spot, right? I think Hikaru... Hikaru wants to go all in, and he should objectively do everything he can to make sure that he keeps winning chances alive. But if Bishop C5 is played by Gukesh, and you get any sort of sniff that you might just be losing if you take A6, Donya, you played it out incredibly well, this whole line that you showed where the bishop eventually takes F2 and the Mm -hmm. house of cards collapses. I don't know what to do there. What else can you do if you're Hikaru to keep the tension alive should Gukesh find this move Bishop to C5? Yeah, and, and this is the scenario I was talking about. Maybe people d- didn't react to this positively or reacted with surprise. I said that if Hikaru gets into a situation where um, you know, he is fighting for a draw, he's not going to make a move that he knows loses to like a basic tactic, right? Because at that point, uh, it's, it's absurd. There's no way in my mind that Gukesh is going to miss an elementary sequence of 53 minutes. In addition, Queen takes a six. Um, a win is not on Hikaru's mind here because, like I said, queen takes queen is basically a forced draw. But in light of Jan's position, I would be shocked if Gukesh doesn't play queen h4. This You don't lead the candidates um, at age 17 if you're not confident in your ability to win a winning position. And we saw Gukesh yesterday with just seconds on his clock showing filigree precision. Now, Hikaru, one of the greatest defenders of all time, a player who is just able to keep surviving and keep fighting. But I don't think he would be able to, to do that for much longer in these circumstances. G3, Queen, H3, Danny, I should point out, Bishop F1, uh, Bishop takes F2, King, H1, keeps some chances alive. But the position after Queen, F5, it's not like you're going all in and you're getting a double-edged position. This is a, a yeah. single-edged position. Black is a pawn up with a horribly weak white king. This is not really called playing for a win, and this is kind of what I was talking about. I don't think Hikaru will go for a position like this and say, well, I'm I'm going all in. He would rather take a position uh, with the queens off the board, which gives him more chances to survive. At the same time, if you do get this position and you're not getting checkmated by taking the risk you did, I guess there is this just, you know, yeah. outside idea of the oh. A-pawn and the bishop here. Objectively, I'm aware, black is totally winning. But I think, you know, you're playing through scenarios of how Hikaru is going to handle it. Of course, we don't know whether bishop c5 will be played yet but we assume Gukesh is going to find it. But I'm going to assume you guys are both tired of hearing me talk about this because we were both chatting here on the side. Fabiano Caruana has just find, has just found D5. We got to back up here to our uh, bird's eye view where we've got a look at both games because Caruana has played the best move after the best move here, guys. And now Jan is really going to be feeling the heat. It's a great move. I mean, it's just so far his plan is working to perfection is Fabiano Caro on the right-hand side of our screen. The opening was one where from the get-go, it was going to require from both sides some serious accuracy. And if we actually dive into this game, we'll see that the move D5 was given an exclamation point. And that means that it was the only move that kept the advantage in White's favor. And some of these variations, White gets it outside pass pawn, especially with the, if the Queens get traded off the board, Black could be in some serious trouble. So Jan Napomshi, head in hand right now, Danny. He's won two candidates in a row. His last loss in the candidates was the final round of the 2020 slash 2021 candidates. I don't even count because he'd already wrapped up the tournament. He lost to Dingley Ren when it didn't matter. So his yeah. loss to Maxime vacher le in the seventh round of that 2020 slash 2021 candidates, that's the only loss he really has in all of his candidates. And if he's getting a loss here, Fabiano Caruana could not be any more thrilled. 
You guys say you don't like to comment on body language. I do like to comment on body language, especially if it matters. Uh, in this situation, that's not a pretend head in hand by Jan. I mean, he feels the moment, as you said, Robert. He's never, uh, well, he hasn't been leading the candidates in, in, a, in a very long time. And so he has to be feeling this one is getting away from him, Danya. There's no way that this isn't a, uh-oh, have I bitten off more than I can chew here? I may have been resourceful all event. <laughs> But Fabiano Caruana is as accurate as they come, especially in these types of positions that require real concrete technique and calculation to put someone away. Very true. I mean, I think we can safely say Jan is disappointed. At the same time, Fabi will not be having any kind of fun after Queen to C5, which is seems to be a crazy thing to say. But remember, if you get into an end game, which is normally a two result game, it, it's normally the kind of position, cemento, you're enjoying your life, with nothing to lose. But imagine the pressure that that then puts on Fabi to have to convert, let's say, a plus one or plus 1.5 endgame uh, against a Yana Pomnishi who's saved countless positions throughout this tournament. The pro game might be on people's mind. Let's not forget against Gukesh, uh, Jan was, had his back against the wall in an endgame, saved it very confidently. Uh, so he's been slippery as an eel, and the least he can do is make uh, Fabi's journey as difficult as possible. You never know. Uh, Fabi could overpress. So Queen C5 is the tempting move. We showcased uh, the liquidation after DC. The Queen's traded. Queen takes C3, BC, 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 and Rook takes H5. Um, and we see, or shall I say, BC, the black is a very bad position here. But perhaps with a move like, I don't know, is this the way to garner the best chances? Or Robert, is this just out of the question? Because Jan essentially relinquishes any even miracle hopes of winning the game here what do you think yeah i think that's the biggest problem is objectively yep. it's bad for black but in a must-win game this is a non-starter you can't win this position from the black side it's even material but black's pawns are all in trouble they're all isolated some of them are double isolated the bishop is better than knight so if we go back to the live board a question that's been in my head because i don't have the answer to it is of course there's an issue for the black king can somehow Black give up the C and the B pawns in some position, use that as an umbrella, and hope to create some tactics? I'm not really seeing anything that looks that appealing to my eyes, but I'm wondering if Black can start with a move like King to B8 just to get out of the line of fire, or maybe even a Knight, oh, a knight C5 actually would have lost in the spot, so that's a bad blunder to avoid. But this type of position, is there anything here where that I can't imagine taking on C6 is good, but is there anything else here that allows Black mm -hmm. to at least force Fabi to find some moves. Mm. By the way, Gukesh finding Bishop C5, just pointing that out. Uh, Danny, you have an idea. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like even just listening to you guys just explains the tension so well because you guys are, you know, without directly debating each other, you're kind of debating how you would handle this position because if you're Jan, as you're saying, uh, Danya, Queen C5 is probably the best thing to do, Ooh. but it's a borderline non-starter. I did Sorry. have an idea just now. King B8, DC. Okay, go ahead. Oh, God. Here I go again with my DCs and ACs. AC, DC, DC. Knight E5. Knight E5. Knight E5? Maybe E5. E5. Never mind. Uh, well, no. I just wanted to point out before before people, I, what is my idea? Knight E5, CB. I had this crazy thought to go Rook C8, which I think is a really uh -huh. cool idea, even if it doesn't work. Um, okay. It's not all about giving the best move. I understand it's dead lost. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the line. Go ahead. Yeah, but just cool that Rook C8 actually picks up the White Queen. Of course, here White just plays GH, and it's very instructive that um, you should never stop calculating just when you lose the Queen because you might be giving too much stuff in return for the Queen. Uh, so yeah. that's way too much hope chess. Not enough good moves. Maybe the Knight can go elsewhere. Knight C5, Knight F6, also on the horizon. And I think knight c5 might yeah. be the key to the kingdom here for black. Well, this is kind of the idea Robert was looking for, right? Just to say that it's hard to find, but I, intuitively, I think Robert, you're onto something because back to complete what I was saying, you guys were borderline debating the psychological approach. Queen c5 might be the best move for black, but you're only drawing it best. And for Jan, that is literally a loss. That is your candidate's chances. So I agree with Robert on that, Danya. I don't think he can go for that. And so this idea Ooh. of at least keeping the pieces on the board, this is actually very interesting, right? If you if you take B7, can I take E4? I I, I think yeah. so. Or is there Rook D7 um, maybe? <laughs> oh, I, what Rook D7 here? Rook? Oh my gosh, because the because H8. And if you take you, oh my gosh, 
Oh king my a8, gosh. That is, queen c6, that, that is not the move. King a8, you can probably go rook takes h5. I, I'm just going to show Dodge's though. line because for kicks and giggles, you it's have to do it. Queen Forget c5, you, but... Eval Bar. Go bleep <laughs> yourself, Eval Bar. I'm showing a checkmate. That's the point. Look at that. Um, but, oh, I love that. Rook takes h5 here. Does that work or not? What is the what is the win, folks? I don't know. Yes, it Rook is. takes h5. What a brilliant double attack. The point is you're double attacking not just the two rooks, everybody. You're double attacking the threat of c8 as well. Uh, what a wild idea this would be. I'm going yeah. back to the live position because I feel like I'm having too much fun as a commentator. And whenever that happens, I should probably back up. Um, but Robert, you want to say anything about it? Well, I think some of these variations with rook to d7, not the easiest move to spot from a distance. Of course, Fabiano Caruana, one of the best calculators in chess history, he can find those lines. But that appeals to me more. If I'm trying to get into Jan's shoes and think, what would I do if I was in a must-win situation and a draw is the equivalent to a loss, something like that at least looks spicier. But yep. then you, yep. you play moves like rook d7, and I'm just like, okay, that's just too beautiful. Uh, that scares me. And I, I'm guessing that even if not for rook to d7, you could probably make a bunch of simpler moves that leave white with the advantage. I, I just do believe, to sort of tie a bow on this, that the other variation with the queens off the board is a risk-free position for Fabiano. And that's what's not yep. appealing. Uh, that's what's yep. not appealing to me is because if Fabi can play for a win by risking zero and having no losing chances, then... That makes it easy for him. He doesn't have to like throw you an opportunity. I I agree with you, and again, it's why I I just I don't think we'll see Queen C five from Jan. It would be essentially surrendering his candidate's chances, regardless of whether Fabi can convert the win. So again, we're playing a meta a meta game here, along with Ooh. trying to play the best objective move. <laughs> um, I saw he reach for a piece, but no move. Okay, yet. we're, we're uh, no, it is it is a move now. So let's back this thing up. In fact. To the two bird, two bird, two board view we go. Hikaru sees the idea of queen to h4 and plays the prophylaxis bishop to e1. Not a fun move to play, but but at least he's uh, he's avoiding the most concrete disasters. I think it's a good move. I, I really yep. believe that bishop e1 is smart. It covers that pawn on f2, and importantly, in the position on the left hand side of our screen here, white has two bishops. So you want to have play on both sides of the board. If we remove the A pawns, those pawns all the way to the left of the board over there on the left-hand side of our screen, then we would be talking about a position that the knight doing perfectly fine because all the action is happening on one flank. But with the presence of the A pawns, I do feel like that gives Hikaru some chances, something to think about. And for Gukesh, not that he's actually worried, it just means that he needs to be a bit careful where in the other variations, it was more uh, straightforward for him to continue. Hmm. I think it's a great point. Let's let's go ahead and dive in. Obviously, Gukesh is now on the clock and uh, and sitting up, sitting up at the board, super focused. I, just to Robert's point, as long as there's an A pawn on the board, there's a chance. That's kind of what you're saying. Yes, probably Black has plenty of ways to keep the position simple, but if this pawn disappears and we get any type of race, that's where Hikaru's winning chances are there. If you remove them, as Robert said, remove the pawns on the far side of the board, it doesn't matter what happens. There's no world where Hikaru is winning that if everything becomes about just the king side. So, so Danya, your thoughts. What is Gukesh going to do here now that your favorite mm -hmm. idea of queen h4 has, has been stopped, at least for now? Yeah, I mean, a5 is the instinct move. However, from Gukesh's perspective, there's another question. If he wants to ensure a draw, shut this game down, which I don't think he's going to do because he's playing for a win now, knight to d5 uh, would serve that purpose quite nicely, I think. Uh, bait white into taking on a6, queen takes a6, um, trade everything, go rook a8. This just shuts the game down. Bishop b7, rook takes a3, and we have complete and total mutual liquidation. Um, and, you know, you can try to play this one for a win, but it ain't a title Tuesday game. Uh, it isn't a bullet brawl. This is the candidates. We will see a draw in this case. So imagine, you know, the onus of that on, on, on Gukesh. Uh, to play a move like a5 when you have these options, there might be other ways to... Uh, force this even more compellingly, maybe rook b8. But a5 keeps the extra pawn. We might still see the queen swinging to the king side. Queen f4, queen h4 is still a very scary move because, as Robert pointed out, uh, white's king still isn't feeling very comfortable. That said, I really like bishop b1. 
I think that was great composure by Hikaru, um, who is down now to almost half an hour on his clock. But if you want a miracle, how do these miracles happen? Well, you just have to keep pieces on the board. You have to avoid going into a forced line. Give Gukesh some sort of a decision to make, because that might be your only hope of inducing, eventually, some sort of a mistake. Agreed, Town. Population us. I want to go back to your knight d5 and ask Robert. So you pointed out that knight d5, obviously a great move, activate and centralize the knight and kind of call Sikaro's bluff. Do you, are, are you ready to end your candidate's chances and give me a draw? But is there anything else Sikaro can play here, Robert, that does keep the bishop here on the board? Are there tricks tricks for white? Um, silly Hikaru tricks are for kids, but maybe not? The maybe not is definitely not. And that's the problem uh, with the simplicity of this position is that if you keep playing on, at some point, black is just making natural improving moves and white is doing everything yep. he can to play a bit of dodgeball. And we're not playing that sport. So uh, in all seriousness, yep. I mean, this is a situation where Gukesh can dangle that carrot, the draw in front of Hikaru and see if he takes it. And Gukesh is better here. Both players know it. Uh, before knight to d5, uh, it's not a necessary move. And in fact, he played a5. He played Gukesh a5. The... He, he does. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, Go for Danny... it. He wants more. He doesn't even want just knight d5. He's he's uh, he's playing a5, as, as Don just suggested, the best move in the position for black. Because if Hikaru wants to play on, he continues to risk losing the game. I think this is a smart play from both sides. And here we see queen b5 now. He wants to go after that a-pawn without the queens on the board. And I think the queen trade... It's not forced, but if you do play queen h4 now, you are dropping that a5 pawn, and the bishop on e1 defends f2 in many of these positions. So there's mm -hmm. a lot more to calculate if you're going queen h4, whereas queen takes b5, that eliminates the risk, Danya. You were kept talking about black not risking things, being in the driver's seat. I think queen takes b5 would be the prudent decision. If I'm Gukesh, I am taking that queen, and the game doesn't end there. I mean, it's slightly more unbalanced. Um... But with the a5 pawn hanging, I would try at least to keep that extra pawn. I wouldn't just give it away easily. I mean, maybe a move like rook to a, maybe rook to b8 is a good compromise. Just hit the bishop, see where it goes. Um, and black really isn't risking. But uh, I don't think Hikaru is going to lose this position. Uh, what Hikaru is maybe trying to do is, is dangle a different carrot in front of Gukesh. Queen to f4, queen to h4 are very tempting alternatives. And in a different set of circumstances, I would consider these moves more carefully, but just um, statistically, queen takes b5 is such a safe option. Um, just mitigating your risk, I, I I would find this move just too tempting. But you know, Gukesh is is there for a reason. This is going to be a really really interesting decision. Likelihood, I think, is high that he takes the queen though, and it might even be the best objective move as well. I agree, although I, I, the more I'm thinking about this and just sort of replaying how we got here, the difficult uphill battle Hikaru has now had really for several moves since he got on the bad side of that isolated queen pawn position. I have to say that at the very least, this end game, and if there's some world where Gukesh gets passive, whether nerves get into his head or not, you could solve the problem of your A pawn being exchanged. And if you do find some way that you can, in a long-term sense, keep chances alive, at the very least, the bishop pair will create some, I guess, some some tension for Black to figure out here. This is going to be a game that, that Black still has to show technique, and White is going to try to get some tricks. So, all right, speaking of, of the game that we're playing out right now, we're seeing play out between Nakamura and Gukesh. They faced each other earlier in the event. Let's take a look back at what happened when they were across the board from each other in round six. David, I would like to ask you, did you ever see in this position? Because I highlighted that I like to react with the move C3 against G6, but this position feels quite new to me. And it's clear it's preparation from Hikaru Nakamura. He spent less than two minutes to get to this point. A5, A3, Gukesh responding with a kind of automatic A3, but that invites uh, some uh, major tension clearing trades, going for the most consecutive captures in a row world record. and. Peter, are we just seeing a game that's increasingly looking like it's about to fizzle out? Hikaru checking, which move is it? When can we go home? Any moment now. King G7, King G7. draw for. We have a, another result. It is a draw.
Perhaps we should have known as early as round six that Gukesh's nerves would not fail in this tournament. We saw eventually Hikaru uh, offering the draw, which Gukesh Damarajo gladly accepted. And here, here I wonder if he would do the same at this point if he was offered a draw. Maybe he wants more. But either way, the young man is uh, is in charge right now, getting distracted but a little bit by what's going on over there. You know what he's doing? He's looking at Fabiano he's, Caruana's he's board. The board. Yeah. Yes, he is. He is saying, okay, if Fabiano is winning, he's essentially calculating on Fabiano's behalf. He's not helping him, of course, but he's looking at that game and saying, all right, if this happens on the right-hand side of our screen, will Fabiano be winning? If that's the case, maybe I should play on a little bit just because I have some chances here. This is not an easy decision. And Danny, we're talking about a 17-year-old. He's also 2760-plus yep. rated, one of the top players in the world. But he's 17. He just doesn't have the experience. So he's feeling this out for the first time. How do you make the call here if you are Gukesh? I was just saying, I mean, maybe maybe it'll be a mistake that he's looking at the board. You commented that he was looking over at the position between Karwana and Napomnishi, trying to calculate a little bit of what he expects. Is that a good thing, Danya? I mean, look, Gukesh is in control of his own fate. But Man. would you really risk going for a win because you don't want to play a tie break if that was an objectively bad thing to do? I would think no. I don't think that's a good idea. But is it a good thing that Gukesh is clearly thinking a little bit about what's going on over there? I mean, it just shows a tremendous level of situational awareness um, and, and the weight that's on his shoulders that how much rides on this on this move, on this one move. Um, you know, you can compare it to different situations in sports. You know, the, the field goal that potentially uh, wins the game. You know, the buzzer beating shot. What play do you run? And ultimately, you do what you're comfortable with. You make the move you think is best. I'm still expecting a queen trade, but Jan uh might have sunk deeper into the hole that he dug himself in. At the very least, he's chosen a line uh, kind of in the spirit of Robert's suggestion, which maintains intrigue, forces Karawana to calculate as the clocks from both players continue to dwindle. But yeah. I'm looking at Fabi's position. My mouth is starting to water at these tactical possibilities. I'm also seeing a blue arrow. Um, we know what uh, that means and who drew that arrow, pointing in the direction of bishop to f5 check on Fabi's board. Shall we take a closer look um, at those complications? How bad is this getting for Mr. Nepo? <laughs> I say yes. We don't all know who drew the the blue arrow, maybe for those tuning in. That means the computer drew the blue arrow because it's suggesting that this is a move that keeps a serious advantage. But Robert, go ahead and take it away. We went to the other game right as Jan was playing the move castles. And after D5, he played H4, laughing in the face of danger here on D takes C6. Kind of your idea a little bit, Robert. He avoided the queen trade and is trying to keep some tension alive. But your thoughts on, on what we now have? Well, it's exactly the idea, just perhaps in a different order and maybe in a better situation. He is hoping that Fabiano takes on b7, and we see objectively it's not the best move. If white takes a free pawn on b7, that knight is pinned over here, the king will slide behind it, and that's what we call an umbrella or a shield pawn, because that pawn, it's actually helping keep black's king safe. If that pawn were off the board, then white would have a vicious attack. So what Jan is trying to do is then take this bishop on e4 or force that bishop to move out the way. And if that bishop moves, maybe the black queen will infiltrate or offer a queen trade on e3 with check. So uh, for Fabiano, we see in the live board that bishop f5 is required, apparently. But I, I don't really know what the follow-up should be because I think the temptation is to take a pawn that is under threat. So I don't believe this position is that easy to play for Fabiano, not one bit. Yeah. Well, let's look at bishop f5. If the computer says it's the best, we did look at c takes b7, and you highlighted it's an instructive, an instructive way for the black king to kind of hide behind the enemy lines. But what happens on bishop f5 check here, Danya? Let's say that the king just moves to b8. It's very easy to blunder here with white. Uh, bishop d7, super tempting move. Cut off uh, the queen, kind of along the lines of rook d7. Looks great. Nope. It allows queen e3 check. And the queen trade wasn't always bad for white, but here it's a disaster. The tables turn completely. And this is something that Jan is hoping for very, very much. Uh, he suddenly has two passers and a million threats. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very important for Fabi uh, to identify the, the threats, which can be hard to spot. Instead of bishop d7, uh, that leads me down the logical conclusion that queen e3 is a serious 
uh, let's call it a positional threat. How does he deal with it? Does he play rook e1? Does he uh, take a page out of Mr. Hess's book and play king b1? Always a good idea. What suits your fancy here, Robert? Uh, first of all, bishop f5, how hard is that move? And what do you do in this position? I like the king b1 move just because it reminded me of the earlier line where you just avoid the queen trade. You're the one with the safer king. You're the one on the attack. So keeping the queens on the board feels like it optimizes your winning chances. And objectively, we see here that it's a good decision. But how hard is bishop f5 check? It's one of these decisions where C takes B7 looks good for white. You can imagine Fabiano thinking, I'll take the pawn. And if we do a quick material count, white in this position has five pawns. Black has only four. And even if black wins that B7 pawn back, look at black's remaining pawns. There's an outside passer. That's a good thing on H4. But those double isolated F pawns, we could think that if a white rook gets active, they'll be in trouble. But the key is that the H4 pawn is passed and there's a rook behind it. You always want your rook behind past pawns to help at least threaten to push them forward. So this would be a better defensive setup for Jan. And so to answer your question, Danya, I feel like bishop f5 check, it makes a lot of sense. But the position is really complicated. So it's sensible, but difficult to play. Yeah. Uh, Fabiano now back on the clock. Of course, he did earn the time advantage that he's now using, given that he's had a better position. And Jan has uh, has been thinking for the most part here on the last few moves. So good time to slow down if you're Fabiano, whether he spots Bishop F5 check or not. If he does take B7, he better have a concrete follow-up because really nice to highlight just how strong H4 was from Jan, even if he goes on to lose this game. I think this was a brilliant practical decision, making threats of queen trades and all kinds of endgames way more dangerous for white knowing that also Jan has to win, right? A draw is not good enough. So H4 was really key in that regard. I, uh, I'm i nervous. I'm excited. I have no idea what to do with these emotions. Fabiano Caruana on the clock. And uh, biggest moment he's had in the candidates in quite some time. Wow. This is such an important moment. Even Gukesh. Um, it's like that story I shared about Mikhail Tall um, needing a GM Norman. His opponent thinking for 20 minutes in a dead-drawn position Tall coming to the conclusion that he sees something, but no, he's trying to figure out how to win the next day. Uh, Gukesh, he's thinking about whether to trade queens, and he just has. He's just taken on b5. That is crazy timing. Gukesh has decided to trade queens, which doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean he's taken the draw or anything of that regard of that nature. I think that's a completely understandable, good decision. Why shake the hornet's nest? And this game continues. Uh, in a normal game, he would not accept to draw here with the black pieces. But one other point I wanted to make about Fabi's game is that after bishop f5, king b8, we don't have to show this on the board, but uh, rook d7, my old suggestion, also fails to a very, very difficult tactical refutation. I did check that. And uh, so easy to be fooled by the eval bar and think it's all cut and dry. We are still in, I think, for some twists and turns in the Fabi game. Man, oh man, bishop b6 is Gukesh's follow-up. What do we make of this decision? Oh my gosh, Danny. Let's, let's, I'm, I'm, let's show my the heart that beating. you were mentioning here. I want, I want to go back to the rook to d7 because I think let's it was it. a critical tactic. And frankly, frankly, we're all chess fans here and that's an exciting thing to look at. So let's actually look at this bishop f5 check idea before we go to bishop b6 that Gukesh has just played and the queens being off the board against Nakamura. In, in other variations, rook to d7 was a key idea, everyone. The whole point being that the h8 rook is hanging in a lot of these lines. So it's a, it's a bit of a very, very confusing guerrilla warfare kind of tactic. But what is Black's response here, Donya, that you see? So the response here is knight takes d7. The point of rook d7 was to prepare c7, king a8. Now c takes d8, queen, Black has to recapture with the rook. And after queen to c7, it looks like Black is completely tied up. And this can be very tempting because if Black has to trade queens with queen c5, white just gets um, an end game with uh, great winning chances. But here there is this lovely move, queen back to e8. I just wanted to dis highlight this move. Such an easy move to miss from a distance. And that pawn, which Jan established on h4, is very important. And the threat of rook c8 allows the knight to unpin. So there are a lot of ways to, for Fabi to go wrong. It starts from this move. And uh, the clock could be playing a role as well with no increment in the first time control. It's only move 23. And both players now approaching half an hour on both boards, I should say, as Hikaru brings his rook to c1. And we can check into those developments as well. Yep. 
Okay, Fabi on the clock. Let now let's do that thing as you said. Head back to the Nakamura versus Gukesh game. It's uh, it's now an end game, where at least if you're Hikaru, you've kept the bishop pair. Maybe some outside chances that Gukesh blunders that a pawn, so you can corral yourself an outside passer. But it's uh, it's also as I bring up the board here, also getting more likely to a position that it is two results for the guy who actually would benefit from two results. Nobody else going into the last round benefits from two results uh, besides Gukesh Damaraju. Yanda Pamdashi, Fabiano Caruana, and Hikaru Nakamura all have to win in case you didn't get the memo. And it's getting closer to a position where all Gukesh needs is a draw. How, how, are, you, how are you keeping winning chances going here if you're Hikaru? Let's go to the board. He just played King F1. How are you keeping winning chances? That is a really difficult question. Because I mean, you have to we, ask. He has to win, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, and it's true because Hikaru, if he's honest with himself, and if we're honest with everybody, there's no way where that White is better here and playing for a win in an objective sense. But you have to try something. And yep. I actually am trying to, to do just that, and I'm failing. At some point, maybe White will try to take over the C file with a move like Bishop to A6. But even in these scenarios where the Rooks come off the board, the knight on d5 protecting the bishop on b6 is super useful because it will take white a lot of time to try to chase the defender of the a5 pawn. That's the key to white's winning chances is somehow winning the a5 pawn and keeping your own a pawn. But I just yep. don't see how it happens. And for Hikaru now, it's like, do I really throw a half point away trying to win? Because I the only way to play for a win must be some kind of odd sacrifice or something that I just don't possibly see done yet. But let me take the devil's advocate side. Um, how could I see this uh, going south for Gukesh? I really can. And, and to be completely clear, uh, just seeing the speed that he's making his moves in, he's got everything under control. But how? what could Hikaru be thinking here? He's like a pilot who's lost you know, control of all the hydraulics. You know, It's like those shows where somehow the plane has landed at, with just controlling the rudder. What he has to do is keep forcing Gukesh into making some sort of a decision. And that means keeping maximum tension, which is exactly what he's doing. Non-forcing moves. Um, try to force Gukesh into a single impulsive decision of some sort, such as giving him the C file. Hikaru plays A4. You can kind of see, I think, that he's playing in line with that idea. But what if knight B4? What if Gukesh just sticks a knight or plays king F8, which he just did? What? I mean, bishop B5 back to E2 came to my mind trying to get the rook to the B file. But let me be honest, all of this is complete, uh, completely unrealistic to, to expect uh, Gukesh to make a mistake. I, I don't even see a mistake here that Black could make. Uh, Danny, do you? <laughs> How does he I'm make pretty good at finding mistakes, in case you didn't know. Thank you for that cue. I appreciate the pass. I will try to find a blunder for Black. Um, since I'm an expert at it. No, I, I mean, jokes aside, I, I think the biggest key is you have the pawn on e6 guarding the knight. I mean, like, it's funny. If you take that pawn off the board, the bishop pair, the vulnerability of the knight in the center, the fact that it can't just hold on to the fence. White could poke at the defense of the knight. And if the bishop becomes loose, you start to imagine ideas where the rook can come in and there's, there's a gang up happening. But any sort of exchange on d5 just makes Gukesh's job easier. Of course, g3 is a good move. It guards f4 so that you can play king e2 without there being a check and a, and a massive trade of rooks. But as good as I am at finding blunders in chess, Danya, I can't see a clear one right now for Black. I actually don't know. Because yeah. jokes aside, like usually what you have to envision is like, what is a natural plan that could go wrong? Black can just sit tight here. Yeah. King e7, g5, and, h6. I mean, yeah. you make waiting moves. I make waiting moves. Let's dance together. Yeah, I agree. And Black gets to play waiting moves in, in the vein of, you know, moves that are kind of easy to play because you're up a pawn. As you said, King E7, maybe G5, maybe F6. Maybe you just sort of sit there and wait to see whether Caruana is actually going to beat a pawn machine or not. Um, you know, again, not going to take anything away from Hikaru and the fact that he has created something from nothing in the past. But as we joke, this is not a title Tuesday or Blitz. In fact, if anything, Gukesh Damarashu has more time on the clock than Nakamura. So I, I don't envision a time pressure problem leading to a blunder either um robert you look good by the way you're doing you look the gray black it's working for you go for it i, I appreciate that and, and you're forcing me to come up with some entertaining variation that somehow gets black <laughs> in trouble but this is actually what gukesh 
has done. This was intentional on his part. He wanted a position and he's been able to obtain it where he has zero risk of losing this game. And yeah. you know, sometimes we say, oh, it's completely this or it's completely that. In all honesty, I'm looking at this. I'm really trying to come up with some error from the black side. <laughs> and you know, you can make simple moves. As we say, king to e7, knight b4 is always going to be available now that white pushed the pawn because white doesn't want to take on before and give opposite color bishop so i just don't see an avenue a path forward for hikaru and if that's the case he just has zero winning chances absolutely no winning chances here because gukesh he's not somebody who's been blundering all event his mistakes they came when he had a few seconds on his clock and he got checkmated against Ali Reza Faruja. There were other tough situations for him, but by and large, he has shown tremendous skill to be patient, to come up with uh, concrete plans that work in his favor. And here there's just nothing that Hikar can drum up here. It's just completely even. If anything, black is slightly better. So as we look on the right-hand side, Ooh. wow, Fabi just played Bishop F5 check, the best move. He found it. He found the best move. Bishop f5 check. As difficult as it was, we had the luxury of the computer yelling that Bishop f5 was the best. Fabiano does not have that luxury. Jan has immediately responded. We got to dive there. Ooh. Let's do it. Bishop f5 check and king to b8. Does Fabi already have his next response in store? Yes. But it doesn't mean he'll play it instantly. But this is huge because King uh, Bishop d7 and Rook d7 are both mistakes. It. King b1 is the best move, and he has found it. He loves Robert Hess. Fabiano loves Robert Hess, and he loves Robert. Robert yes. If you're just tuning in, <laughs> no, but seriously, Robert came up came up with this key point right after he rejoined us. If you miss Magnus Carlson, shame on you. He was here, but. Robert pointed out that King B1 in some critical moment is going to eliminate all of Black's pro Black's chances. The Queen E3 check is gone. The fact that the King is on a C file, gone. Black is actually unable to do anything on a diagonal as long as this Bishop is here. So King B1 is just such a great move, very precise, and kind of puts the emphasis back on Jan to maybe make a mistake here. What do you do now? I don't know, because also Rook C1 is in the air, trying to move that Knight out of the way. And then you have a pawn on c6. Maybe you get to push that up the board one more square and get a little baby fork. So uh, you look at this position, Jan Pomdashi doesn't know what to do because he's trying to survive, but he also needs to win. And this has been a conundrum since the start. And I, I love moves like King to b1. I suggest it in a completely yep. different position. The whole point was that when you have a safer king, you typically want to keep the queens on the board unless there's a concrete reason to trade, like winning some material or gaining an, an upper hand. So keeping the queens on means that the black king is exposed. Already, the c6 pawn is dangerous to the black king. And you might want to trade pieces if you're black, but not only does that hurt your winning chances, that rook on h8 is loose. So if you try to trade off rooks on d1, afterwards, you have to take care of your rook first. <laughs> wow. BC, Queen Tanya, B4, you, walks into a pin. <laughs> I was going to say, point out the line you were looking at. The point is, I think, basic tactics. Mm -hmm. We should show them for everyone watching. If B takes C6, the idea is Queen to B4 check. Mm -hmm. King moves, and now Rook to C1 is a serious problem. Wow. The Knight is pinned to the Queen. There is no check. As pointed out, that if the King was on C1, there would be a Renegade discovered check, and Black would be winning. So shout out to Robert's safety I move yet again. So... And in that position, rook d5, bishop e4, just uh, pointing it out, sorry, sorry, Danny, is actually yeah. important uh, because Go you also it. deal with the problem with uh, the c6 pawn. So bishop e4, here Jan would walk into a, a pin, he would commit a sin because he wouldn't be able to win, so you'd have to call his next of kin. And uh, this would be bad news for Gukash. Wow. He's not going to do that, but <laughs> I don't see a move for him. And this, he's on the ropes right now. That is how it is. He's got to find some way to keep the fire burning and it will take every fiber of his being to survive this game, much less win it. I don't know how I get any flack anymore for making awkward jokes, Robert. <laughs> I, I don't even know how, how I get any flack anymore with Tanya. By the way, I respect that. That was freestyle, and I loved it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Danny. My, my heart can't take it. All right. Well, I also respect that we have to take one more break before the real drama and maybe final moments are going to be happening on the board in this game. And as we do so, remind everybody that uh, the Chess of Two team has returned for round two. 
I used the board myself here in the office, recorded a fun video, hate it or love it. It was a blast. And I actually do really love this board, have one at home uh, with my daughter, the feature that allows them to touch a piece, shows every move, super, super instructive and educational. You see it, you can use the command chess up, buy one now, get it in, get it, uh, get a link, do it chat. It really is an awesome board. And these games really are awesome. So we take our break. Is it the final one before we have clarity about who will be competing for the next World Chess Championship title? Don't go anywhere. Me, Danya, and Robert will be right back. Mom wore this to my wedding. Yeah. Yeah, she did. We'd each make one move every morning before starting our day. Never got to finish this one. You been practicing? Not since I was a kid. Why first? You gonna be all right, Dad? I'm gonna be good. Love you. Love you, too. Come to Angelina's party? I'll be there. All right. Hello? Ready to play? When did you do this? Don't worry about it. It's your move. Playing grandpa. Really? Yeah. It's kind of about to destroy me. He's pretty good. Nice one, Dad. Showdown. Going down. Hear about that? Yep. I believe you go first. Let's see if I can make this magic work again. Very off to a good start. Really? Are you sure about that? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll just see. All right, well. Hmm. Gotcha. Oh my. Oh. <laughs> Smart kid. What is she doing? That? That's oh, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> nice going. You
A huge moment right now for that man, Fabiano Caruana. Is he moments away? Is he a few moves away from getting a second chance at the ultimate crown in chess? Don't go anywhere, everybody. That's probably the final break we're taking until we have an answer to that question, or at least whether Fabiano can get a win to potentially force tie breaks. Of course, Nakamura versus Gukesh Damaraju still under still underway as well. But guys, oh, here he goes. He's about to move. <laughs> we're like kids in candy stores. What is oh the action? Yanda Pomna, she played B6 right as we went to the break. But there are several moves that are good here for White. Danya, you have the call. What move do you think Fabi is about to play? B7, too tempting, but well, it's not the it. most accurate move. But he did it. And it keeps it keeps a decisive advantage, I'm pretty sure. But Jan does have this trick of taking that rook with the rook, which is a move that looks completely unthinkable. And yet, because of this move, he's still in this game. Otherwise, he can simply resign. What an idea by Fabi. So let's just take a moment to appreciate uh, the beauty of his whole board awareness. Um, but I don't think that, I think it's way too early to call it. And I actually think there's still uh, a lot of landmines that Fabi has to avoid stepping on here. So we could dive in as we just take a second here. Mr. Pragnananda comes up behind him. What a moment, Danny, Robert. Rook to d7. Rook takes d7, in my understanding, is forced here. Well, before we do then, what was the best? I was excited. He did it. This was the tactic you called for earlier. So, Robert, maybe you know the answer. I hadn't calculated it at the break. What it, what was what was the best move here for White then, if not Rook D7? I guess process of elimination is Bishop D7, but it's less forcing. So that move cuts off all the circulation for Black's pieces. The Bishop on D7 shouldn't be captured by a Rook because you're dropping both Rooks at all at once. And if you take with the Knight on D7, I'm not capturing you back. I'm going to throw my pawn forward with check forking the king and the rook. So we see in the game that Fabi went rook d7, Jan took back with the rook, and Fabi just took back with his pawn. So the evaluation is heavily in White's favor. But the reason why this isn't game over and there's still plenty left that Fabi needs to prove is I think Jan, with his rook hanging on d8, has to slide, on h, excuse me, has to slide over to d8. But look at that h4 pawn. That's a thorn in White's side that if White just goes behind his past pawn, tries to use that and protect it, and then try to use it to become a queen, that H pawn at some point can sacrifice itself to distract White's pieces. So I don't think this is easy at all. And Jan, he's been resilient all event. He hasn't lost a game in the canon since 2021. And really, since 2020, I mean, will he lose this one if he plays this move Rook D8? I believe that's the only move, Danny. Well, it's interesting whether Young wanted to be in this spot or not. It looks like he did play the move you suggested. Mm -hmm. It's definitely out of the question. I think that Jan thinks he has a chance to win anymore. To me, the most, you know, the most glaring problem in Black's camp is actually the king still. Moves like queen to d4 come to my mind, whether it's the best or not, because I start looking at f4 hanging with check. And even if I traded d7 for the f-pawn, this king is in so much trouble on the diagonals. You have to feel like Jan knows Fabi is the one playing for two results here. So that's got to be a pretty a pretty frustrated Jan de Pomnichi. Yeah, but, you know, twenty less than 20 minutes for, for Fabi, there's an H bond. I mentioned landmines. People might be wondering, what are those landmines? First of all, instead of CD, just in five seconds, um, queen takes H8 was very instructive. Rook to D8, that was one trap. And if you try to come after the H4 pawn, you lose to Rook to D1 check. And uh, this is a classic, old, reliable deflection. King c2, queen e2 will be uh, checkmate in a couple of moves. Actually, a beautiful mate. King c2, queen e2. And look at this mate. Yep. King c3, rook d3. There's probably multiple checkmates. Takes, takes. King b4, a5. Mate. Skadish. And on the strength of this move, Fabi, of course, saw that. He plays c takes d7. And I think you made an amazing point, Danny. A move like queen to d4, or rook to d1 is exactly what the doctor ordered. But after knight takes d7, things get very concrete there. And the last point I want yeah. to make is that there are some situations where you can get total liquidation and the h pawn can slip through the cracks. If white just has a lone bishop, because of the pawn on f3, the white bishop has a hard time in some lines stopping that pawn. Fabi has to keep that in mind. And rook d1, king c7, it's on the cusp of being winning, but I don't see any forced win. And that is actually really maddening. For, for Caruana, queen of 95, but okay. But okay. Okay. Still feels like hanging by a thread here. 
looks scary. It looks really, really it looks scary. Looks super scary. I, yeah, I mean, in many of these variations, though, the point that you two collectively are making is that White wants to put all the pieces on the D file, and yet the H4 pawn is always going to be a nuisance that White needs to stop. So uh, in this position, we're looking at Fabiano. He also has 17 minutes remaining, and we're only on move 26. So he's making a move pretty much every minute at this stage. One quick move, one slip, that advantage can go from huge to not at all. And one quick move, one slip, you're one moment away from your chances of competing for the world mm-hmm. championship going going out the window here. Uh, Fabi obviously doesn't have the engine in front of him, but he does know that, that there must be something here. So the stakes are high. Remember, both Fabiano and Jan have to win in order to keep their chances alive, regardless, regardless of what happens between Nakamura and Gukesh. Mm-hmm. So Caruana is going to be super accurate here. He's about to move. I'm guessing we're going to see queen to d4, but we'll see if Fabi has some other some other way to approach it. Or rook d1 as Gukesh's game heading toward a draw. I mean, that now seems to be a very likely result. Yeah. So this game is on everyone's mind because Gukesh is trading rooks. Hikaru's winning chances uh, are down to zero. So uh, the other game would take a miracle. This game wouldn't really take a miracle. And um, I think Fabi needs Mr. Wrench on his side uh, because queen d4, you called it. And that's a hard move to make. Just calculated, composed, switch to the D file. And if you're Jan, there's a big case to be made for just grabbing that D7 pawn and trying to use White's clock as a weapon. Let's back up real quick if we can to the two board view, because as as you pointed out, the Gukesh game is liquidating. And if it is the last moments we see for the world's most viewed chess streamer, Hikaru Nakamura, and his chances to compete for a world championship title. We should probably at least take a look at the position, if not if not the full game. We see that a pair of rooks has been traded. It's just getting closer and closer to a spot where there's nothing left to play for if you're, if you're white. The other rooks are threatening to leave the board as we speak. Any thoughts on that position worthy of diving into, or do we just want to leave it at that and stick here in Fabi's game versus Jan? I'll just give Gukesh a, a quick turn of praise. The play he's had in this whole event has been awesome to watch. He was not worse for a second in this game. He was never in trouble. And Hikaru Nakamura is an amazing player. He's shown phenomenal preparation all throughout this Candace tournament. And yet Gukesh, with all the nerves, with so much at stake, he said, all right, what do you have for me? And he is the one who surprised Hikaru in the opening. And it was Hikaru who played D4 on the first turn. So well done to Gukesh. It's not over just yet, but I still don't see any hope for a card to win this game. So Gukesh, at minimum, will be in a tie for first place, and that means we might have tie breaks tomorrow. And if it ultimately proves out, it might ultimately prove that to your question, Robert, that you asked earlier when we had Magnus on, what do you do if you're Hikaru and uh, and you know that you don't have any more chances to win? Do you go crazy and lose? Or do you allow the game to peter out? Looks like he chose the logical path at this point because even if he wanted to go crazy and try to lose now, I'm not even sure he's going to have an opportunity. I mean, okay, I guess you always have an opportunity to lose. Yes, you could make a blunder. <laughs> but my point is, it just it looks like uh, maybe the things that Hikaru said at the start of the event will prove true. If it wasn't himself winning the candidates, he wanted it to be Fabiano. A draw here would actually give Caruana a chance. And don't think Hikaru doesn't know what's going on on that board, whether that's in his head or not. Yeah, I agree. Um, Robert, I know you, uh, you're you the endgame player I defer to, but we should point out that Hikaru is still down a pawn, but uh, Bishop takes knight there is an opposite colored bishop endgame that uh, would signify to us, that would be tantamount uh, to conceding that he, he thinks there's nothing left to play for. Uh, but yeah, he is the one actually who has to proceed with caution. Uh, still, Gukesh is in the driver's seat, still up a pawn. Uh, so if Hikaru were to conclude that, okay, it's time to... Uh, time to let things let things come to a natural end. The easiest way to do that is take the knight. Um, if he wants to try to keep this game going uh, in any way, Robert, rook b1, rook c1, maybe. Rook c1, I think. Maybe keep the rooks on the board. Or, or rook b1, followed by rook c1. But come on, that's that's not really a winning attempt. 
No, and it's a position that Gukesh would gladly play on. So that's why I think that Gukesh has been doing the right thing turn after turn. Yeah. He's saying, if you really want to win this game, I am taking no risks. I've been solid all along. And so I will just gladly uh, take use of the misplaced pieces or the uh, sort of one-off threats that you're going for and just continue to play on the best squares. And speaking of the best squares, I'm looking at the right-hand side of our screen here. That queen on D4, Danny, you called the move. That queen is on just a beautiful square. And I think the biggest issue for Jan Napomashi is not just that there's that pawn on the right-hand side of our screen. You're sitting one square away from promotions. If you take it, you're walking into eternal pins. And that's painful uh, because you, you need to get rid of it somehow. And yet I don't think that yep. Jan will successfully be able to. Well, I think we should dive back into that game. It is the one for all the marbles, so to speak, knowing that... Gukesh is in control of uh, of his own destiny over here against Hikaru. But if we dive back into the game, oh, and right on cue, good timing. Yonda Pomnishi knew we were coming back. He does take the pawn as Donny suggested. But I wanted to come here and go back to the line we talked about. I'm assuming rook to d1. So let's dive right into analysis. King to c7 is forced. Mm -hmm. And I know we didn't come up with the win before, Donya, on queen takes, queen takes f4. But now we have to look back a, a little closer because it's actually on the board. There has to be a win here for white. Queen f4 is a great way to start. Uh, it's such a practical move. Knight e5, just go rook e1. Um, you don't even have to look for anything too far. I mean, maybe that's not the best move. Did Bivalbar drop with that move? But nope. f6, g5. Just good. look at the f6, g5, rook e8. Uh, rook no, it's, e8. it's great for white. Ooh. Rook e8, I'm looking for that clincher in that position. Queen, Queen c1. c5 by Nepo. What a move yeah, by Nepo. Fabi's not, not going to bite. Fabi will take f4. He is not going to fall for it. Yeah, we have to go back. Queen to c5 played, not king to c7. We expect Fabi to take f4 with check. Uh, there's. We should show the trick here. There's uh, as uh, Danya already pointed out that the h-pawn is dangerous and this pawn on f3 is a nuisance to the bishop. So we just have to show a line that goes like this just to really highlight an impossible way for Fabi to lose, but it does exist. And suddenly the bishop despite being the only, minor, the only minor piece left on the board, is actually not enough to stop the H-pawn Black would win. So with that line having been shown, we don't expect Fabi to do that. He will take on F4 with check, we expect. Hmm. Go ahead. Either, either Grandmaster. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I guess uh, I'll take the first stab at a Queen takes F4 check. I mean, the problem is that there is what I call an eternal pin on this knight on D7. So uh, White can just continue to put his pieces in line with it. And with the F4 pawn gone, if we actually just go through the same variation, let's say Queen takes F4 check, Queen yep. C7, Queen back to D4, just to go Queen C5 again, just to repeat it. Can't I take this... At some positions, I'll be able to take your knight on c7, on d7, excuse me, because I'll get f4. Now, this is a trick that you have to watch out for because queen takes c5 yeah. here. It looks like your bishop will get back in time because after pawn takes c5, rook takes d7, rook takes d7, we trade everything off, we go pawn to h3. Here, if you uh, play f4, it but looks like king here you c7. Can play first. You, it's either so one will work because f4, okay. king c7 still wins for white even though it looks like it may be a problem because your bishop goes back to f5. And as long as your bishop gets this diagonal, you win the game. Wow. Okay. What a what a line, Robert. The elimination of the f1. But h3, I think, is Jan's idea after queen d4. Last chance to mix it up. h3, bishop takes d7, h2, and, and okay, you're not probably not risking, but see, now it's just a draw because rook takes d7 is unstoppable. So what's your move after h3? And queen f4, queen c7 on the board. It's on the board. Fabi's probably already calculated the answer to the question that Donya just asked. What is your move on queen d4, h3? If I had to guess, we're going to see queen to d4, we're going to see h3. So hold your breath, everybody, for three minutes if you can do it. Challenge at home. Hold your breath for three minutes and we'll, and we'll see the answer. That was a joke. Don't do that. <laughs> wow. And Hikaru has kept the rooks on the board, but... Uh, nothing actually changes there. We're heading toward liquidation. This is the game. This is the decisive decisive moment because um, I'm keeping an eye on the other game and uh, the evaluation isn't changing. Queen to d2, Robert, is also possible. Is there a difference? And is h3 a legitimate concern? 
H3 is concerning me, and I believe it's concerning Fabiano, who's down under 13 minutes. So you look at how many moves he has to make. There is no bonus time with each move played until they reach move 40, which means that the time that you see here is all that he gets, and he's at about one minute per turn. You make a quick decision that h pawn goes running up the board. We may see the game turn towards equality. But one thing that I've been noting this whole time is it's not just the pin on the knight. The black king is wide open, right? That light square diagonal in front of the king. So if this queen were to line up with the bishop, we could see a checkmate threat. And perhaps we can use that to our advantage because uh, what can black really do to stop these ideas? If the queen goes to d4, the bishop then slides to e4. Maybe there is something that Jan has up his sleeve, but I just think that we can change our mind. Instead of going for the pin, we go for the immediate checkmate. Yeah, I think this is actually super strong. I mean, does it force a move like queen to c5 now? Trying to trade queens? Mm -hmm. I mean, queen d5 is, is red rover. That's game over. Hmm. Yeah, queen c5, I think I agree. So if queen to c5 is forced, it's funny because we, we haven't, okay, and I'm sure there's something better, but I'm thinking now that we shouldn't dismiss the idea that at some point the tactics clear up enough that white can actually trade queens and just gobble up the h pawn. Not that that's your preferred win of choice, mm -hmm. right? You, you'd rather find something more concrete when you have a pin on the knight, but uh, Bobby will, will be looking for a precise way to put it away. We need to H3 on the board, and this is a huge moment. Um, this is where he needs to find the money move. I mean, F4 to stop H2, Bishop to E4, Robert's idea is lovely, but Robert, 10 moves to make for Fabian. He's, you know, he's, he's almost at 10 minutes. Uh, my heart is beating right now. That H pawn, which John has invested so much energy into, into advancing, that is the last glimmer of hope that Fabi needs to extinguish. And the first round of this event is one where Fabiano had the upper hand against Ikar Nakamura. Then he got into time trouble, and that advantage went out the window. They drew their game. And then Hikar beat him in the second half. And it looked like everything that could possibly go wrong for Fabi was going wrong. But here he's been on the rebound. He has strung together two wins. He also had a, a win a, preceding a draw before those two wins. So he's three and a half out of his last four. Once and four and a half out of five. And this is a critical moment because that H pawn is so annoying. It is just trying to use itself as a decoy, distract White's pieces. Maybe White wins that pawn, but with the knight getting free, there might not be enough material left for White to claim a true advantage. So here is a moment. I don't know if a bishop e4 still is the good move with the queen on d2. Uh, maybe there are some other ideas in this position, but bishop takes d7, it turns out, is the wrong decision. And with that, we have the knowledge. Fabi doesn't, so he needs to work this out fully, whereas we have the evaluation bar off to the side, rejecting certain moves and suggesting that others are winning. We have the knowledge, as you said. We also have more than... 175,000 people, 180,000 people now watching across YouTube, Twitch, wherever you are tuning in from. I suggest you stay put because history is being made on this day. And uh, we will likely, I don't want to dismiss Jan just yet. That would be a bad knock on wood. But we will likely have a different set of players competing for the World Championship match uh, come end of this year. At this point, Gukesh, Fabiano Caruana, what happens in these games? He is winning if he's Fabiano Caruana, but he has to find the right moves here. As you pointed out, Robert, time is taking now under 10 minutes. And Donna, it's a very sharp position. So it's not like uh, that White can just play this safely. It's sort of a now or never scenario. And I'm not seeing that, that hammer blow because H2 is threatened. If you play a pawn F4 to stop H2, I'm going to play H2 anyway, uh, give that pawn away and get my knight out of D7. And this is what, this is the enemy that Fabi is fighting. This is Jan's glimmer of hope that Fabi might reject a line he would normally go for uh, because he yeah. feels like it's not forcing enough if he lets that knight out of d7. Let's not forget the material is currently equal. So Fabi's advantage hinges entirely on uh, the pin knight on d7. I still really like bishop e4, but uh, the fact remains bishop e4, queen c5, and and... I am not seeing the forced win. I understand it's plus four, plus five. Who cares? Where is the win? Yeah, I, we, I love Bishop before. That was Robert's initial idea. 
I also keep coming back to G5. I highlighted it earlier when you guys were talking because I have the mouse and I'm highlighting, so I did it. But I, I was wondering if you were if you open up the threat of hitting the H pawn, I guess H2 would come anyway. But I wondered if we could then cut off the queen and just threaten to go gobble the pawn. But perhaps this is more forcing. Carwana does find bishop to E4. Uh, and mm. we have just found out that Tan Zhong Yi has officially won the women's candidates. She will challenge Zhu Wenjun for the world championships. So congratulations to Tan Zhong Yi. We're going to focus right here on who will who will be challenging uh, in the in the in the candidates that we're covering. But congratulations to Tan Zhong Yi. And uh, if you're any of the viewers who were watching that coverage, thank you for being with us now in the final moments as we cover what's happening here between Carwana and Nepomnishi. All right, Bishop E4. Robert, this was your idea. It's played. We see over on Hikaru Nakamura's board versus Gukesh Damaraju. Nothing really changing, getting closer to a position that only Gukesh could keep pushing for a win. So uh, so what do we say about Bishop E4? I, I'm so impressed with Fabiano because I only came up with it because Bishop takes D7 didn't work. We've tried it. The engine said, nope, not so fast. This H pawn is too powerful. So to play this over the board is so much different than to sit here, see the seesaw of the, you know, the evaluation bar off to the side. Because look at Fabiano's clock. He's down under eight minutes. That was a huge pin on the night on D7. There was a maximum pressure against it. And instead of keeping that pressure, he switches plans to go after the Black King. And he can't talk through his moves. You see them sitting there in silence, fully concentrated. So Danya, as you pointed out, we don't necessarily have a direct path to checkmate. So what is Fabi's exact winning idea? That's what I'm struggling. And Jan right now is thinking, deciding how to stop queen d5. He's got queen c5 and queen e5. And yes, he is lost. And by the way, yeah, Gukesh very likely there to trade his knight for Hikaru's bishop. And we will bring you updates when they arrive. But this is the money game. This is where the action is happening. Let's take a sample move like queen to c5. Um, it's, again, same problem. I'm not seeing that clincher. I was thinking maybe you can play queen d3 and try to get the queen to a6. And one thing to point out is that you can't afford to allow black's pawn to inch forward to h2. And you have this resource of pushing the pawn to f4, which buys you a lot of time because then the promotion square is controlled. It's terrifying. Uh, your heart is going to beat a lot faster. Uh, but at the end of the day, that pawn is under control. So I second your point, Robert. Bishop e4 demonstrates a tremendous self-control by Fabi. Uh, this is reminiscent of his conversion against Vidit. But Jan is going to prevent queen d5, and he will put up a fight. He needs something crazy to happen before the time control in the next nine moves. It's a great point. Great call out, because Fabiano only has... Well, about eight minutes for those nine moves. So if he can come up with anything here to throw Fabiano off uh, to make it murky, that's probably his best practical chance yet. And we shouldn't underestimate, again, we have the luxury of the Ebel bar. We have the luxury of a couple of grandmasters sitting next to you, if you're me. So it doesn't feel like anything can go wrong, but there's a lot that could go wrong here if you're white. And look at this move, A5. He's, he's actually allowing mm -hmm. queen to D5 and intends to protect the checkmate threat on A8 with the move king A7. And Fabi's like, well, I'm calling your bluff. Let's go. Queen D5 is on the board and king A7 is the only move. And the point of queen d5, I guess, wasn't just a threatened checkmate because king a7 stops that. But then the pawn on f7 is hanging. And then black's knight is pinned in multiple directions. It can't move because the queen is hanging now. Uh, it couldn't move earlier because the rook was behind it. So it feels like he is freezing Jan's pieces. And if I'm not mistaken, we did just see king a7 and yep. queen takes mm -hmm. f7. I saw Fabi's hand move diagonally. And that g5 idea, Danny, that you mentioned before, it feels a lot stronger without an f-pawn to stop its path. Yeah, and at this point, if black is completely frozen, this H-pawn might look really cute, but if you don't have any help to make a queen, the G-pawn has plenty of help. The queen is guarding it every square as it moves up the board, and black's pieces are frozen, Elsa. Danya, let it go. Last hope for Jan. You go H2. Um, I think Fabi might throw in the move F4, and for Caruana, still no forced win. You still have to play very patiently, um, in the sense of going f4, maybe just pushing your g-pawn. King to a6, I think, is the only move for Jan. Unpin your knight and sit there and pray. And your prayers might be answered. g5 in this position. I'm always thinking about the crazy blitz tricks. And this is a good example. Is knight c5 what Jan is praying for? Queen takes c7. 
Rook takes Rook and Knight takes Bishop and you can't stop the pawn. <laughs> you're going to have to give perpetual check. So I say these things and some people think, ah, you know, you're overhyping it. No, forget the eval bar. Put yourself in the shoes of the players. Jan did not play a5 because he missed queen takes f7. This is what he's going for. And Fabi might need one more prophylactic move after king a6. Robert, do you see what it is? What is the move that squashes these last hopes as we see in the other game? Gukesh yeah. giving back his extra pawn and getting an opposite card bishop position that will end in a draw. What is the move? Sorry, I was trying to I was trying to let you show the line that we were going for, but okay, well, where do you want to go? You want to hop back to the two board view real quick? Because obviously the other game could end in just moments. Let's do that. Yeah, why don't we just show everybody what's happening there. It's something we've predicted for a while on the left-hand side of our screen. You'll see that both sides have a rook, a bishop, and four pawns, but the bishops are opposite color. And in this particular position, that means that losing chances are almost nil because the uh, can't fight off the opponent's bishop, and it seems like the players will likely split this point, but Hikaru may still try. We'll see what happens there. But on the right-hand side of our screen, that's where all eyes are on Fabiano Caruana, whose clock is now ticking to 6 minutes, 20 seconds. And Donnie, you showed a variation where things got tricky. Fabiano made a move. It's about to come in here. I think he brought his, yeah, he brought his queen behind the pass pawn. Oh. The evaluation stays the same. Danny, it was a great find from Fabiano. He is still pinning uh, Yana Palms. She's knight left, right, and center. Yeah, a great move. And I, I guess in hindsight, kind of the human move in, in a really logical way, right? You put the queen behind the pawn, ensuring that we're defending promotion tactics. We were trying to do that in two ways with the bishop and rook. But the queen and rook say we can do that maybe a little better if we're Fabi. I really love this move. It also keeps the bishop protected. You're just sort of patiently reminding Black that he has nowhere to go, Danya. This is the problem. King a6. I mean, still, you have to try this if you're Jan. It still threatens knight c5. And Fabi might be just trying to round up the h pawn. King a6, rook h1. Uh, but at the very least, it allows your, your queen to move out of the way and get your knight free. So the huge question right here is... If Jan does play king a6, that's one landmine. And the second is, can Fabi just get to the time control, keep those two extra pawns? Because if he does, then it's over. Well, the well, funny part I about all this, just... Danny, sorry, I just want to ask you, you something quickly, Danny, is that Jan still needs to win, right? Like, we're, we keep talking about Jan surviving. And if this were round one of some other tournament, then yeah, Jan surviving this would be a big accomplishment. But he needs to win this game, Danny. <laughs> You're acting like it's my fault. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, it's, Danny, it, come he on. does. He needs to win the game. And no matter what, I think, as we've been discussing, at a certain point, you just have to play the best chess move because as it, it almost just impulses out of you as a chess player. I don't think Jan will do anything but try his best, even if the best result is a draw. But you're right. He has to win. So it makes Fabiano's chances even better. Okay, King B8, Danya, instead of King A6, I think... Maybe it's objectively a little safer from potential checks and things, but it doesn't really solve the problem. I loved your Rook H1 idea, Danya, because this just gets out of the way of any potential discover tactics that you were pointing out with Knight C5. If you move the Knight, I might just trade mm. Queens and take the h pawn and just win the endgame. But are you sure that endgame is winning? This is what Jan is aiming for. He doesn't go for the uh, the Naroditsky, uh bullet tricks. Um, this is a classical game. Uh, he reminds a certain commentator and plays king b8, which is a deeper trick. Rook h1, Danny, knight f6. That position, queen trade and rook h2, is exactly how you squander these positions. And Nepo needs to win, but Fabi also needs to win. Rook d1, king c2. I'm not convinced that this is an easy win. Rook g1, and Jan would be thrilled just to have this position um, because he is trying to play spoiler, right? He, he's not on good side. But to side. Point, is he? Is he though? Yeah. I mean, that's my point. Like, he is. is he? Is he thrilled to have this position? <laughs> and every player, but again, at this point, he's in survival mode. And and if he can survive this game, that's an achievement in and of itself. I understand it's not important, but but still, he's trying his best. And if not Rook H one, Robert, do you agree with me? Is that the trap uh, that Fabi needs to avoid? Maybe just G five now because the Black Queen will be overextended if the Knight moves out of d7. Yeah, we go back to the live board here. I mean, Rook h1 is a tempting move. g5 is that I'm playing for a win move. I'm not afraid. And as we're highlighting here, that if the Knight does move out the way, Rook takes Rook with check. Once the uh, Queen captures the Rook on d8, Queen takes h2 very importantly is a check. 
not just because the G5 pawn is hanging, but Queen D1 is a checkmate threat from the black side. So <laughs> it's not like white is uh, just going to ride off in the sunset. You still need to be worried about certain ideas, but getting rid of that pawn, and this makes white's task so much easier. You bring your queen behind the G pawn, go queen G1, for example, and you can just yep. push that pawn and that's the game. Really nice uh, instructive point about the king being on b8 with check. Of course, that is one of the drawbacks of the king having chosen to go to b8 instead of a6. Now this h2 pawn is hanging with check, not just in the line Robert showed, but in, in every line. And I think that makes it even more likely that Fabi will find g... Oh, he plays a3. Also a human move, I guess, to just ensure that there's no tactics. He wants the king to have some luft. Not as accurate as G5, but we have the luxury of saying that because, you know, we, we have a, a group discussion and some strong players and one weak guy with the mouse. And here we are. <laughs> uh, but now the rook can move potentially. And this is the benefit of that H2 pawn. If you move your rook, what you're trying to do is get into any kind of end game where you have a chance rook moves and then you're ready to move the knight. I don't think Nepo will play knight C5. That is just way too lost. Rook E8, rook C8, rook F8. Robert, do you see something like literally see something like that happening? Sorry, I could not. It's just low hanging fruit, man. <laughs> <laughs> you ha you have to try something like that to free up the rook. And I, I do want to give a quick praise to that move a three because it makes the white king feel safer. No back rank checkmate ideas, and nothing of the sort. But these rook h one ideas, they still seem to be strong for white. That you know, if you see nothing else. You can play in this fashion, and in this particular position, it's still really nice. What you said earlier, Danya, the black rook getting behind the white pawns. Let's say you do play knight f6 and try to get that bishop. We play queen takes h2. We you give up the bishop on e4, sure, but the rook is now on c8 rather than on d8, and that mm. means that once the queens are traded, you can't get behind the pawns where the rook would successfully harass both. That's a really key point. It kind of points out that as much as you hate the rook there because of the pin, the rook is actually best there if you are looking for these types of tricks we've been pointing out to maybe swindle swindle your way to a drawn endgame. Although it's hard to even get that sentence out because that's not really what Jan wants. So I love A3 as well, Robert. Just want to echo that. What a strong discipline move for Fabi, especially when you're low on the clock. You want to eliminate your chances to blunder, right, guys? We talk about how it's easy to say the engine's best move, I guess, but... Playing A3 in the practical scenario where you're about to get under time pressure, I think is huge and is going to avoid problems. And now Rook H1 is just screaming to be played, and it's it's a lot easier to find. This position, I mean, it does seem like Jan, he is trying to come up with his last idea. Danya, you know, mm -hmm. you talked about bullet chess. You're great at coming up with some sort of tactics. Do you see anything that Jan could do to be tricky in Fabi's somewhat of a time trouble situation? Well, the line you just pointed out is so important. The fact that White's Rook gets behind one of the passers, probably the G-Pawn, um, that is the deciding factor because in that Rook end game, Black can win one of those pawns. You can also try to find uh, a more savvy square for Black's Rook. Um, the other option is just to wait, uh, but you're almost in Zuguang, so A4 or B5 uh, is perhaps a move I would play in, in a bullet game um, because what else do you do? But Rook F8 maybe... But still, I don't see how that impacts. Ah, maybe Rook F8, because in the line that you showed, maybe Black's Rook can get ahead of its vis-a-vis -vis and try to get to G1. Because one other clarification, if Black can win the G pawn, even if White gets his Rook behind the E pawn, the E pawn is too close to Black's King. And then yeah. you're flying too close to the Sun. But Queen to E5, Jan mm -hmm. starts from the other end. He brings the Queen out of the, out of the pin. But unfortunately, now the Knight is pinned a different way. Just trying to force Fabi to make a move with three and a half minutes left. I think this is a move that points out maybe maybe what Robert's been saying is Jan also doesn't want to draw. Not to say there was anything wrong objectively with Rook F8 or Rook C8. Like those were, you know, maybe maybe the best practical way if Black is okay with the draw. But Queen E5 reminds the world that Jan de Pomnishi also is in a must-win game because all that really matters, it's winner go home, second place, and you're last in theory, at the candidates, right? So I, I like this move from Jan. I liked your idea A4 too, just because at some point, maybe you're creating some practical pressure. But objectively here, best moves are winning for Caruana. That's the truth. G5, and you see this? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, Danya, that black is completely frozen. The queen needs to stay from the black side on that diagonal, protecting 
the H2 pawn. And so G5 is saying, I have a pass pawn of my own. If you take it, you lose your best asset and your king is still in trouble. So Fabi, you, you see it here. He's looking at the clock. You just saw him glance at it. But G5 is an automatic move for somebody of his caliber, somebody who's been mm-hmm. on the stage before, not just on the stage. He's won this very tournament. And we see there's some feature chat here. Fabi deserves a shot at the title. I don't think it's because Nepo had other chances. That's not why. But the way Fabi was able to go from an even score to a plus score like this, Danny, I mean, what a turnaround in this event. Completely agree. We said don't turn your back on Fabiano, but don't oh. turn your back on the clock right now. Bobby, you, you saw some hesitation a couple times, a little bit of nerves there. I mean, he still has, what, five more moves to make with no increment. Remember that, everybody. For chess fans and, and non-chess fans, increment is bonus time added per move, but there is none of that, which means what you see is what you get. Bobby has to play five moves in two minutes. And queen h6, what is the idea there? He's hitting the b6 pawn, reminding the knight that it can't move for a new reason. Ah, Queen C6 is his threat. Look at the whole board awareness. Ah. G5 probably was the cleanest win. Also, Rook H8 uh, may seem like it turns the tables. Queen C6 and White is the first of the party and probably the first of the world championship match um, or the tiebreaker, rather, if, if Fabi can win. But how do you stop Queen C6? You have to drop your queen back to C7. And maybe finally at that point, you can play the move Rook to D2 and round up the H pawn. Um, I am just so, so impressed with the way Fabi's handling this time pressure stage. People might be freaking out with two minutes on the clock, but Fabi understood that if he finds one more accurate move, uh, the rest of the moves he can play almost instantly. Uh, this is incredible. I misspoke, by the way. I did not mean to imply uh, that Fabi will necessarily win the tiebreaker. I, I meant to say tiebreaker instead of world championship match. But look at this. Look at this awareness by Caruana. I don't think anyone's going to hold it against you. It's it's insane how Fabi can keep his nerves. Yes, he only has a couple minutes here to make all the necessary moves, but I agree. Queen to h6 is huge. Also, Jan doesn't have a ton of time either, and his position is you know a little harder to play. I think he's going to try to move quickly, though, because it's better to give, give his opponent a chance to blunder under time pressure than to use his time right now, and indeed he does it. He plays queen to c7. Will rook d2 be on the board, Robert? Danya's suggestion just corrals that pawn for free. It's a very strong move, rook to d2, because you got to keep the queens on the board, and that's important. In some of those positions, we saw the rook end games gave Black some chances to hold, and Fabiano could repeat. Look at the clock. He is in time trouble. He is down under two minutes without any increment, and he's about to make his 37th move. So queen h7 back, it might force Jan to play a different move than queen back to e5, because, again... A draw for him is kind of like a loss. So this is a weird psychological game going on. And Fabi, he doesn't want to play any games. He just wants to win here and now. And he pushes his pawn up to g5. Objectively a good decision because the knight cannot move lest you drop the h2 pawn. Your only uh, piece that's helping you stay in the game with check. I don't know. Rook d2, I think, basically mopped it up. Now Nepo has to move his rook. He has to keep pieces on the board. Rook g8 and knight c5 and pray that in these last three moves before the time control, something insane happens. I can't take this, Danny. This is, this is <laughs> I'm literally the butterflies drama. in How my chest the players are real. Feel? How are they even making I agree. moves about their hands shaking? They are shaking. Rook D, <laughs> Rook D2 was the move that, was, uh, that, that got all the chances gone. But I will say, I mean, G5, we don't have the computer lines in front of us, just the eval bar. Maybe G5 was even the best. I think we just kind of forgot about pushing the G-pawn because Fabi has mm-hmm. been so focused on these sort of accurate and corralling queen moves coming behind the pawn and keeping an eye on these queen side tactics. G5, I mean, G5 is also very good. And this is still very, very tough for Jan. But let's look at your line. You have Rook to G8 here. Is that what you're thinking he'll go for? Robert, what are your I'm thoughts? I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. I backed on you because that frees up the rook, then it frees up the knight, and that's exactly how you come back in a game like this. Look at five hours clock, one minute, 33 seconds. No bonus time with each move played. So, Danya, your rook g8 move, it's a very good point, and it looks like Jan has played it. So, what's Fabi's follow up, Danya? Oh, the problem is if you play rook d2 now, it's not as good because rook takes g5 as possible, knight c5. Uh, rook c1 is met with knight c5. Maybe you can go rook c1, knight c5 b4 but one minute on the clock for fabi uh he can't get himself to under you know 30 seconds because he's got to be able to deal with an yep. unexpected turn this might be an unexpected turn for caruana he's down to a minute on the clock 
Oh my he's lands. Rook H1 clock. is wrong. Do not play Rook H1 and allow Knight C5 because that might lead to some disaster before the time control is made. Uh, Rook to H1 uh -oh. played. Uh -oh. he, he and plays Rook H1. Okay, never. I, I meant to say Rook D2 is wrong. Uh, Rook H1 probably still wins, but Knight C5, Robert, what does he do after Knight C5? Knight c5, the knight is free. Danny, I mean, you could, I sense it on you. You see that Jan's pieces are coming to life, but perhaps Fabi's worked this out. Where knight c5, yes, it threatens to take the bishop. Can he not just move the bishop away? Like, I, I know the bishops look good on e4. Just slide it back to c2. Stay near your king. I was going to say there the same thing. No just calm and safely put the bishop out of danger on c2. H2 is falling. Again, I, I think maybe maybe Fabi missed the most accurate way to approach it, but I think unless you go into the rook ending that Danya was highlighting and maybe Black grabs one of the pawns or the mm -hmm. rook gets behind the pawns, Fabi is still in control even if he trades H for G. I'm not saying he wants that, but I think if knight C5 is played, which it is now, it's on the board. It is. 50 like, seconds. Oh, I missed bishop C2, I folks. I, I'm sorry. I thought Rook H1 was a blunder because of Knight C5. I forgot the bishop has the C2 square, but will he find it? He looked like he was about to move the bishop quickly, but he also knows he has enough time for two moves. Oh, he finds bishop Bishop H7. Whoa. What? Oh, and you, okay, the bar took a dip, but then it went back up. But that was a strange move. He just keeping his bishop and queen and then the G-pawn close together. And I think... It ends up that it is a pretty good move for yeah. White because you're attacking the Rook, and his next move is his 40th, 34 mm -hmm. seconds. If that Rook goes to h8, pinning the Bishop, well, that it becomes clear. Either you take the pawn on h2 or push your G-pawn. All things considered, Fabiano still has the upper hand, and his 40th move may actually be easier to make. Rook takes g5, though, Danny. Is that anything? Is that scary, or is that just dead winning? Because White's king could get caught in some sort of weird, obscure attack. I think if you're Yawn, you go for Rook takes G5 at this point. Unless there's some immediate win that I'm not seeing. Uh, we're not going to go to analysis. We want to stay here uh, with the big cams on the players. But if I was highlighting quickly Rook G5, Queen G5, the point, everybody, to Danya's idea is that the Queen takes H7 with check. That's the key. And the King doesn't even have a lot of safety because the Knight is hopping into some of these squares. I, I was spying Rook G5 the whole time, too. I'm like, wait. If... If you take g5, is there some other move Fabi has besides just allowing these tactics? Maybe they're just winning for white and he'll be happy, Robert, to just take the rook back because at least he gets time added to the clock. But I am nervous AF right now, which is as Fabi, for those who don't know the acronym. I am nervous AF. I completely missed rook takes g5, and I don't know if Fabi saw it because his king... That king on b1 does not have many defenders in front of it. And you see Jan, he is concentrated right now on that side of the board. His rook is threatened. Rook takes g5. Fabi's 40th move will be easy. But after that, it's not so easy because his king does not have true shelter. And then the black queen will go on over in the, the light squares. Keep checking it. The knight on c5 is perfectly positioned to jump in as well. Danya, you were right that this bishop h7 move, it, it looked mm -hmm. like a one-move threat, but it's also a loose piece, and loose pieces can drop off. And here Jan goes. Yep, he's done it. He, and he does it. But So is, is the best move to just take h2 then to avoid all no. of these tactics? No, no, no. You have to take the rook, whether it's good or bad. Queen h2 is too drawish. Jan would sell his soul for, to, to bring this back to move oh. 36, to give Fabi two more he's moves. He's got less than 20 Anything. seconds. He goes for it. He will get time, but will he regret the position he's now allowed as the players make their 40th moves? A small, uh, I guess, uh, sigh of relief. Jan gets up from the board and does just that with a deep breath. But, uh, but wow, we still have a lot of action ahead here. And the computer's suggesting King A2, but I'm looking at light square checks, and I am wondering what is about to happen here. Oh, my goodness. I mean, look at Fabiano. He has to win this all over again. And... What's concerning, I think, most of all, is that if those pawns on the right-hand side of our board, on the king side, if they disappear for both white and black, and then the queens come off the board, could we be in a position where black holds, despite being down a knight for a rook? And you can see Fabi, he's trying to work this out, but whew, the decisions, they are not getting easy because of his bishop h7 move. Perhaps that was a bit careless and oversight from him. He still has mm -hmm. the advantage, but I agree with that feature chatter most of all. Jan is resilient. Yeah. Wow. I, I, 
I wonder if you think Fabi missed Rook takes G5? Probably. I mean, no, no judgment, right? That he had very little time on the clock. I think if he had to choose a way to convert the advantage he had, Danya, I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna guess it wasn't this. So I'll go ahead and let you jump in to ask answer that question and add any other points you want. But do you think Fabi missed this? And what are your thoughts about what he's thinking now? He 100% missed this. I'm very scared for him. Robert mentioned this huge point, and there's a lot of perpetuals in the air. He's got to make a decision again. Uh, King A1, Queen C2 sets up this weird perpetual. Now, we'll have plenty of time to jump into this as Fabi ponders, but this is why I was so scared uh, about allowing Rook H1 on move 38. I don't care about what the engine says, but letting that knight out of D7, it causes so many freak tactics to appear on the board. That's what worried me, and now Fabi has to not start over he's probably still winning but his technical task is going to be much much harder than he expected it to be this is a really big development oh, oh wow i take a big breath as if as if i have stakes in the game i don't know what to say robert what do you what do you want to add here well i think that we see that hikaru nakamura still trying to find oh. a win will it appear not so fast but uh oh it looks like Fabi, he didn't, he didn't make the blue arrow move, but then again, there it goes. Oh no, he has lost his entire no, advantage. No, 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 no. I have a crazy point to make here though. King A1, okay, we're going to find out. We'll certainly be diving into why King A2 was the only move. I actually don't know why. Everyone who saw the blue arrow and who watches our shows know that, knows that the blue arrow was the engine suggestion. But... Okay, it's queen to c2, but I'm going to say, does Jan want a draw? Remember, if he's back in the in the spot, I mean, what is Jan going to do here? A draw doesn't help him either. Yeah, and I, I think he, he does want a draw. I mean, what what else can he do? He's down no. a lot of material. Okay, let's oh. let's point out the lines real quick. So, if queen to c2 is played, let's show one of the lines that maybe leads to a draw because the knight is coming in. We're going to have perpetual checks. Obviously, white can check, but we know white doesn't want to draw, so I'm not going to show those lines. In some variation where white goes after the pawn, the point is now the knight comes to b3, and we're going to have this perpetual, everyone, because, well, one, if you took, it's probably still a draw, but you even lose on queen takes h2. So this is the idea and why the computer is suggesting queen c2. Again, just analyzing it myself with no lines, but I think that checks out. My question, oh. Robert and Danya, whoever wants to go, is if you do this, I mean, you're you're killing both of your chances, right? That's it. It's a draw, and neither of you is competing for the world championship if you're young. Yes, but again, at this point, you have already long ago relinquished, realistically relinquished hopes of winning this game. And at this point, you're playing for the individual achievement of saving a position like this. And for Fabi, the fact that he blitzed out King A1, Feruja did this yesterday, that's an emotional reaction. To, that's the frustration of understanding that suddenly the path to winning this game, the path to the title potentially, is now seriously in question. And I'm stunned at this. We understand why you played King A1. It is the natural move um, if you're not an engine, Andy, because it puts the king on the ostensibly safer square. It's actually not the safer square, but the big point, Robert, is after queen to c2, after king A1, queen c2, um, is there a way... Okay, two questions. Does black have a threat... And if the answer is there is no direct threat, is the problem that white can't improve the position? Like, what if you play f4 here? I guess black just plays a4 and sets up these threats, and white will have to deliver perpetual? Is that the problem? f4 walks into it because the queen is covering c1. So I think no. that f4, knight b3 oh, check. no. King a2, knight c1. And the only way to get out of this, if we can uh, just show everybody this little... Uh, knight maneuver back and forth is to give up your rook from the corner and then unfortunately after that white is not going to be winning right you may even win the h2 pawn but the white king is too exposed so we see the evaluation in the middle so i think that fabi i mean if he's seen queen c2 which i'm not sure because there's so many nerves uh, and so much at stake that he will have to control that light square diagonal put his queen on g8 with check bring his uh king to a2 but then how does he make progress from there? There is a pawn on h2 that has kept white's rook cemented on h1, and he has to stay in front of that pawn, it would seem. So winning this from the white side, when Donna, your move a4 for black at any moment, uh, that seems to just lock up th that side of the board. Knight b3 ideas. Danny, 
that move 41 from Fabiano, I, I don't really blame just that move. It's bishop h7, then being rattled by rook takes g5. It seems that mistakes do come in pairs. I, I'm speechless right now. I, I actually want to show, because I feel like we keep mentioning that king a2 was the best move from the engine. I, I feel like we should show why, because I didn't know the answer. I mean, king a2, to me, looked like it put itself directly on a diagonal that opened checks, Robert. And obviously, Fabiano was also scared, or he would have played King A2, right? So let's at least understand what the win was. Why was King A2 better? Because, like, King of, Queen of Seven, you can move the king, maybe? No? What? Someone help me here. What? King why A1. was King A2 the best engine move? I don't understand. Robert, want to take it away? Donna, you go for it. Seems like uh, you uh, hit, said... <laughs> yeah, I, I think I you got this. I'm asking... Control. Look, Fabi, this is not a dumb question. Fabiano Caruana also didn't play King A2 for a reason. And what was the reason? I'm looking at this. It He was afraid of these checks. King A1. So what is the answer? I think I think we should yeah, turn but, on the computer and find out. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the I answer is... All right, Donna, you go ahead. We're all stepping yeah. on each other's toes. I will see the floor. Donna, go for it. I appreciate it. And, and you, uh, there's definitely, you can contribute. Queen F7, King A1. Fabi just assumed without calculating that it's counterproductive. Why would you allow the knight to go where it wants to go anyway? But here's the thing. Knight B3, King B1. The point is you don't want to play Knight B3 unless there is this clear follow-up of delivering a perpetual. Now the knight is misplaced. And if you play Queen H7, you go, well, this is the perpetual. No, King A2. And you don't have this resource, knight c1, right? Remember, the queen was already on c2. And if you play queen c2, if you play queen f7, um, probably I think just rook takes h2 and there's no discovery um, <laughs> is winning. And if you play queen c2, this is, I think, what people might be curious about. What does white do with that extra tempo? It's simple. He wins the knight, queen g8. Black is just not in time to make this very important cemento move a4. Robert, this is incredibly hard to see. And not just to see, to even understand that you have to look for this that king a1 is not the forced move no i mean even this goes way deeper because if we continue down the variation here uh, he made the wrong move we we understand that uh, and king a2 this this move makes sense but if we go to the game for a second to show how tricky these variations are that after king a1 queen c2 which is not the necessarily the most obvious move because knight b3 check is a check and we think in terms of checks captures and threats uh here we can go queen to g8 check the king steps up to the seventh rank and then white king goes to a2 and then you say okay a4 we're gonna get knight into b3 but there is an f pawn that remains on the board and at some point that pawn will try to go up and if the white white rook can somehow get free the black king is in big trouble like if that rook can somehow slide to e1 or something like that and go to e7 it's not like the black king is all the squares in the world so i actually understand that Fabiano might have looked at something like this and said, the black king's open. The one check against the white king is covered by the queen on g8. So let me go and try to deliver a checkmate. But it's not a one-sided game if black has enough time. Knight d3 comes to mind, going for a checkmate of your own. This is some complicated, tricky stuff, and it all will come down to a single tempo and many of these variations. I was going to say knight to b3 and the going knight to c1 is also still constantly on the agenda. But apparently this is equal for black. And hmm. uh, we might get a position just like this, right? The, as you pointed out, Fabiano would like to cover the diagonal. Makes sense. The rook at some point might get free. And that's, let's not forget, pass pawns must be pushed. I just, I think one thing that is being highlighted through the, the passion and the craziness we have is that this position is insanely complicated. The fact that the eval went from here to white to here doesn't change that I think both players are one move away from stepping on a landmine in any moment. We just saw Fabiano do it in a way that I, uh, in a very animated way, was demanding answers. Like, what? why was this the best? Because Fabi didn't find it either. And again, I want to highlight back to Donja's point, because I think we went too fast on it. One of the main points is that because you allowed check, the queen actually doesn't get to c2 anymore. So you don't get the threats of knight b3, knight c1, where the queen guards it. So as hard as it was to step into the face of danger, I guess, if you were Fabi, that was the right idea, mm -hmm. but wow, no wonder he missed it. What a difficult thing to do to invite these checks, and apparently that would have been the best, although we still have a lot of action left here. So we, the other game is also still going, by the way. Let's back this thing up, take a look at the two-board view, remind you that Hikaru Nakamura is still playing the white pieces versus Gukesh Damaraju. 
We're making our way closer and closer to what is likely an opposite code bishop draw. But it's not over yet, I guess. I mean, as long as there's chess moves being made, we have to we have to point out that bad things could happen. Um, by the way, Jan has played queen to c2, and this is looking even more even more difficult and heartbreaking if you're a Fabiana Caruana fan. If somehow Jan is about to once again snatch a draw from the from the from the jaws of defeat. Wow. I'm taking all of this in. Hikaru's board, I mean, they made time control a while ago. It is a dead draw, and nothing has actually substantively changed. Pawns have, have come off, um, and Hikaru looking, looking. The fact that he's managed to prolong this game uh, for as long as he has is pretty incredible, but there's nothing left to play for, and it's just a matter of when, not what the result is. I do have a, a very, uh, I think, important point in the other board. I just realized how how easy it is for Jan to screw up, and why the eval bar kept going up, I think, when we prematurely put the knight on b3. Robert, um, I want to give you the floor to summarize the proceedings as you see them. I just think that the black king is exposed. So we see some checks against the white king on the right-hand side of our screen, but the black king is not much safer. So if that white king could tuck itself away, avoid all the checks, maybe it is the black king who is less safe after all, and white does have a rook. Black has a knight, material advance for Fabiano, but as we see, the players, they are going to use their remaining time. They just earned an extra 30 minutes. Fabiano has to win this game once again, and that's going to frustrate him, no doubt. All right. Well, the players are going to use their extra time. We have reached the time control, which means we are going to use this time to take a very quick break. Don't go anywhere. We had more than 200,000 of you with us at the peak and dramatic moments, but... We have not reached the peak just yet because both games are still going and we still don't know who's going to be competing for the next World Chess Championship match and title. Hikaru Nakamura is still going. So is Fabiano Caruana, Yana Pomnishi, and that man leading the way, Gukesh Damaraju. Don't go anywhere. The last round of the 2020 Tour FIDE candidates continues. Students, did you know that you can get a discount on any Chess.com Premium membership? If you're enrolled in a college, university, or high school in a participating country, you can get 50% off any yearly or monthly premium plan, diamond, platinum, or gold. That's unlimited game review, unlimited puzzles, unlimited bots, unlimited lessons, and no ads. All at 50% off. Go to Chess.com students and get your discount today. I'm here with Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, the second highest rated player in the world at 2,803, and the owner of the third highest rating of all time as well at 2,851.3, I think. Fabi, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Fabi. Uh, how do we feel? We are about, let's say, one and a half days away from the start of the 2024 candidates. So what are the emotions like right now? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, every time I play, there's some different emotions. Uh, every time it does feel different. I can't say that I'm feeling huge pressure yet, but I know that will come. I think the main thing is that there was a lot of concern before about what could happen, because everything could go wrong. And you see all the worst scenarios, and also you imagine that your opponents will always play perfectly. Right. Uh, and then once you get to the board, you realize that nothing is clear, nothing's easy. And yeah. You're basically just in that mode where you play moves and you're trying to survive move by move. 
I, I think that there are some ways in which a world championship match is easier than the candidates, and, and also ways where it's more stressful because you're at the finish line, basically. The world is calling you the favorite in the tournament, right? Like, I, not to pour these thoughts into your head, but how do you go down and how did you reemerge? I, I wasn't too surprised that I lost my rating. I, I was sort of expecting it in 2021. Like okay. 2020, I stopped working after the candidates. I basically didn't look at chess. So okay, if you don't look at chess for uh, for almost a year, then and then in 2021, I started to realize that the people who I felt I had some edge over, uh, I no longer felt like I had any, any edge over them. So I wasn't surprised. And then 2022, I started to like really ramp up the preparation for candidates again. I somehow um, lucked my way in by getting second place in the Grand Swiss. After that, I started to like come back a little bit, at least I found my footing again. Like I wasn't collapsing psychologically anymore, uh, which is already a good start. But I think you're in a unique position where you had a legitimate claim, especially on certain days and periods, to being the best player in the world. I didn't think about this stuff at all. Like I was just playing. I, I, I really wasn't thinking about my place in the chess world or becoming world champion. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like some days I, I think, okay, I probably missed a, a huge chance. Like if I had taken this chance against Magnus or that chance. On the other hand, if I had won that match, then he would probably think, well, how could I not win game one? Is there anything in your life that you really love, but you're really bad at? <laughs> well, I, I love many things that I'm terrible at. Okay. I wish I were good at them. <laughs> like any, like I, I, I love tennis. Okay. I love watching tennis players play and I'm amazed at what they do. And it always looks easy when you look at them. Mm -hmm. And then you actually like hold a racket and you just everything is off, just everything is wrong. We are back after an exhilarating and thrilling time control that was reached, although wasn't reached in the best way possible for Fabiano Caruana, who was definitely pushing. We still have the two games that will ultimately decide who competes for the next World Championship match underway. If you're just tuning in, where have you been? We still have a lot of chess ahead, potentially. Danny Wrench alongside Daniel Naraditsky and Robert Hess. Guys, this has been amazing. The highest of stakes possible, a historic day in chess. This is going to be no matter what the results are. Danya, I know you want to jump right into the position with Fabiana Caruana, so I'm going to ask you to save your thoughts on how great of a time you're having, and instead, we're going to pull up the two-board view and show our viewers exactly where we sit before we dive in. Well, I'm having an amazing time. Thanks uh, to my co-commentators and everybody watching. It's been just insanely exhilarating this last round. Uh, the uh, just the ups and downs and mostly down now for Fabiano Caruana, but maybe some light at the end of the tunnel, um, which is what I kind of discovered analyzing during the break. Uh, I think that in these situations, it's so easy to spin the narrative. Fabi, uh, you know, blunders a completely winning position. Now it's a draw and it's easy to become the hold into the eval bar. But I actually think that Jan still has a lot more work to do. And if I would mean those words rhetorically earlier, I mean those words very literally. There are easy ways to mess up here, Danny. Let's do it. Let's dive right in. I think that mm -hmm. uh, the fans want to know. I mean, this is going to be one of those games, everyone should just know from here on out, that regardless of what the computer says, and I'll say it again, close to equal based on the best engine moves is one thing. A position where both sides could blunder it away in a moment is another, and that's what we have here. Uh Bobby is controlling the diagonal and played king a2. Why is this position equal if white has the the exchange and the queen right where she wants to be defending the king? Robert, do you want to take it away and show what's happening if black finds the best engine move? Oh. I I I think Robert might be muted or is that on my I, end? Yeah, I can't hear Robert either. I'm glad it wasn't just me. Uh, Robert? Oh. I muted myself, there but I was go. trying to. There you go. Okay, I was, that was awesome. I, I, I it was unintentional, but I was You're trying speechless. to throw it. To, 
Yeah, it, it's true. I was trying to throw it to Dunya because it sounded like he did hard work during the break. So okay. I want to see what he has in store. Okay, so well, go ahead, Dunya. A- you take it. So first of all, A4 is the only move. Um, and it's what is why is this a draw? In short, if I had to summarize it with no variations, is because white cannot make progress. But the reason white cannot make progress isn't as simple as people might think. Why can't white make progress? There are two problems. The first is that the H2 pawn cannot easily be picked up. And the second is that even if it is, if the white queen leaves the G8 A2 diagonal, then black has a host of different perpetuals, queen C4 and knight B3, and some combination of those moves, black has to make sure that he is in a position where those moves are available. Now, to the bigger question of how Fabi generates winning chances. If he plays the move F4 here, okay, um, this actually becomes extremely complicated. And F4 isn't actually the only move. Robert, I think before the break, you showed uh, a line. I forget exactly how that line went. But after F4, Black has to find, I think, the move king to A6, which is not an easy move at all, allowing the check on A8. I mean, come on. Why does king B7 or a different move lose? Yeah, queen E8, king B5. And I'll get to this line in a second. This itself is still not a dead draw. If you play a move like king b7 and you sit, Fabi will just continue pushing the f pawn. And I think black has missed the opportunity train. Queen takes f5, already relinquishes the grip, and white takes h2. Queen e6 check has to be assessed, but I think that's winning. So king a6, what is the point of that move? The point of king a6 is that if white still plays f5, now you have the move knight to d3. And this subtlety is hard to spot. Why did we need king a6? Because if the king is on the seventh rank, white's queen is able to deliver a check on g7 and move back to c3, essentially thwarting uh, any possibilities. If white plays queen g7 now, he might actually lose the game due to, yes, knight c1, king a1, and queen queen c4. And essentially, to stop checkmate, white has to give up the rook for the knight and allow a second queen to appear on the board. So (laughs) no comments, but... Therefore, if white gives the check on a8, the hardest realization might be that after king b5, white has no way to make progress other than to deliver perpetual. And I have one last point, if, if I may. Um, so is it okay to, to keep going? I want to uh, let you guys jump in. Keep, keep going. Keep going. What's the, go ahead. So after king to a6, uh, instead of f5, Fabi could try to get his queen to the e1 square. Uh, and that square might offer ways to continue the game. So queen a8, king b5, queen e8, king a6. You could try to play the move queen to e1, queen c4 check. Now another dilemma about where to go. This already loses for black, and I think it's because of king a1. I think, no, king b1. Oh, I had a 50% chance. Qu- king b1, queen <laughs> d3, perpetual? No, king a1. The same concept that should have won Fabi the game on move 41. And apparently black has no way to set up the perpetual. So what is black's move in that position after queen to e1? Well, I'm not seeing the engine here, so I don't know actually what queen, what the move is after queen e1. Maybe Robert, Danny, you could jump in here. This is a critical position before queen c4. Is it yeah. knight b3? Is it knight d3? I don't know. What a challenging position to figure out here because the black king is what I said before the break. The black king is also exposed, so there will be some variations where it may even have to get on out to b5. So for this position, neither player, I think, knows the exact evaluation. What they're seeing is black has chances to make a bunch of checks and hopefully make a draw. Uh, White is saying, okay, I should be better because I have a rook compared to a knight. But is it enough because the rook is very passive? And in you know this analysis board position, uh, whether we get down here or not is up to Fabiano and Jan. But I think it just is one of many variations that show that it's a delicate position and a delicate oh. one from both players' perspective. The drawing line is crazy, but Danny, go ahead. And uh, this is this is amazing. No, I, and it's I think, not I think the we dead draw. Show- I don't think we should avoid showing all the best lines here. And we need we need people to have complete information as to why this might be a draw mm-hmm. or not. So what exactly is the best line here for Black? We need to we need to show it because otherwise I think this is exactly what Fabi mm-hmm. would want. You are threatening to get the Queens off the board. Mm-hmm. Doing so would maybe get the rook out of its cage. So what does Black mm-hmm. have to play here? 
This is the thing. Ikaru's game is a dead draw. This is not a dead draw, even though the eval bar shows the same thing. Only move is king okay. b7. Back to b7. By the way, uh, a4 was found by Nepo, but that's the easy move. The point is this. Let's say after king b7, white plays the move. Uh, queen to d1. Black gives a check on c4. White plays king b1. Black plays queen e4. King a1. So the same zigzag pattern trying to induce knight b3 and then hide using the knight as an umbrella. Knight b3, king a2. And the only move is knight to d2. <laughs> only drawing this is move. insane. This is ridiculous. I'm going to make a and prediction. Uh-huh. It I'm going to make a prediction that's going to sound bold, just given what we're seeing here in terms of the level of complexity required to convert and or keep the draw alive for Jan. I'm going to make a prediction that we have not seen the last of the eval bar going crazy and that Fabiano will get winning chances again in this game. Like, this just seems insane to me to expect that these players will mm -hmm. continue to find these moves. And I could be wrong, but it, it makes me, regardless of the excitement of who you're rooting for, this is not as simple as it seems. I mean, look at the variations required to show black keeping pressure and finding those moves. This just this seems like it's going to be an impossible position for both players to keep playing accurately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it doesn't mean the game won't end in a draw if, if uh, Jan makes a mistake. It doesn't mean Fabio will find out for Robert. It just means right. let's understand the reality of the situation. There is work to be done if Fabio can avoid uh, you know, the emotional reaction and hunker down, find the best chances. And what's so annoying from Fabi's perspective about this position is that there's always this like rinse and repeat, where if the queen leaves the light square diagonal, we'll see the black queen jump to it, and then knight checks will be in the air. So Fabiano is currently trying to win this h2 pawn, but leave his queen on this light square diagonal. What he really needs is to go queen h9, right? That would be a winning strategy in many positions. It, it, sound, it, it sounds like a joke, but I'm just trying to emphasize that the white queen is really struggling here because it needs yep. to coordinate with the rook to get rid of that h2 pawn because otherwise the white rook can't get in the game. It can't do that. And so I'm looking at this position. I'm really uh, trying to come up with it. Is F4 was one move suggestion that Danya made. I think that uh, bringing the queen to the dark square diagonal to preemptively defend the B2 pawn is another possibility. Giving a queen check on G7, for example. But it's not easy to know, you know which check to give or which diagonal the queen even belongs on because we've shown many variations where black gets all that activity and white can't escape. And it's just such a tricky position. I mean, queen h8 comes to mind for sure because you're defending the b2 pawn, you're attacking the h2 pawn. And if we go down a variation, if we can briefly, then I think queen h8 yep. is met by queen c4 check. And what I'm trying to do is just a little dance. King b1, queen d3 check, king a1, knight b3 check, king a2. And you can't play queen c4 trying to line this up again. But I actually believe that in that position, there's not any sort of vicious threat in the white queen may even be able to slide back to c3 and help shield the king so there are these types of positions where even a double check oh maybe that wasn't the correct move maybe take on h2 actually uh, you can get away yeah, with that it, queen take laugh in the face a danger R ridiculous right you're allowing double check and yet it's not that big a deal wow yeah I only move is 46 queen c2 there it's crazy danny i actually love your idea that queen h9 would be a move it my brain cannot stop trying to highlight queen h9 right now on the board <laughs> that it's not possible because there is no but it it does show the geometry right the queen needs to guard the diagonal and help the rook and she is not able to do so at least not with some insane calculation that probably is going to get us to these lines you guys are talking about if Fabi wants to win this game which he desperately does he's going to have to at some point walk into the danger of the queen and knight doing their dance on the light squares and that is going to be wild um by the way speaking of wild look at the clock fabiano already back under time pressure and uh that just shows you how complex this position is we just made time control and we don't have a lot of uh of time left with more drama deep breath <laughs> deep, deep breath. breath everybody i mean we should go back and take a good another good look because Again, it's it's just getting closer to a draw in theory, and I, and I hate that we've neglected it so much because we know how much the fans love watching Hikaru Nakamura's games, and of course, just as many fans tuning in from India for Gukesh Namaraju. Let's go ahead and back up to the two-board view to just 
show everybody, but the reality is it's uh, it's been a matter of formalities almost. We're just getting closer and closer to a draw with obstacle bishops having been on the board for many moves. I will say it is interesting that at least now we have a race. We have an A pawn versus an E pawn, both sides with passers. We're not outside of the crazy realm that uh, someone could blunder, but it's just highly unlikely. Definitely unlikely. I mean, you look at the left-hand side of our screen here, uh, both sides only have one pawn. And theoretically speaking, even if you had to give up your bishop for a pawn, that still is a theoretical draw that these players have worked on, have had in their own games. But uh, look at the black pawn. It's actually uh, more advanced than Hikara's pawn. That's on the left-hand side of our screen. Gukesh's pawn is more menacing. His king is safer. The white king on the second rank, the black king on its own third. So I feel like... The small pluses in the position still in Gukesh's favor. So Hikaru's doing everything he can to play for a win, but there just isn't anything that I see. And I'm not trying to be that downer who's for all those Hikaru fans out there who really are rooting for him. And I know there are so many. It's just that Gukesh is playing stubborn defense. He not for a moment has been worse in this game. And he, if anyone, is the one who would have better winning chances than White at this stage. Mm-hmm. Complete control, Danny, over the proceedings. Just Hikaru, he keeps running out of pieces. He keeps trying and trying, but every time a pawn disappears, you know, the the result just comes closer and closer uh, to being uh, a reality. And Gukesh is only getting help on the other board, not to say that he he, he believes that the result is, has been determined in any way. In fact, maybe both players could still win it. Even Fabiano could blunder, given how tricky that position is. But I, I think he's seen what's happened. He knows it's definitely murkier than it was when Caruana was the only one pushing. So Gukesh, to my point, is even more happy with a draw now because it's possible he ends up getting clear first at the 2024 FIDE candidates with a draw and, and won't be tied anymore because, because of what happened in that game between Fabi and Nepo. I, I wonder if we should show a little bit of Hikaru's game real quick. I have a feeling Fabi's going to be thinking for a minute. I, I, I want to just show how easy it is and or not easy, given that uh, both sides do have a pass pawn now. The only idea White might have would be some world where you get the rook behind the A pawn and also defend your king to push. But let's just, del let's just demonstrate a couple lines to show how, how straightforward this is. Gukesh just played the move king f6. What's a, what's a line we think might happen here? Robert, I'm going to follow your lead. <laughs> really me, making me work predictions. forward here. Yeah, okay, let's work. say rook c, rook c5. I, I get your plan. You told me. Rook c2, get your rook yeah. behind the pass pawn. I, I wanted to I go think... here because you, you asked me to create chances yeah. for blunders. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, Whoa. go ahead. So rook, rook c5 instead. What a blunderful world we live in there. So rook c5, yeah. bishop, bishop g5. So I see what you're going for. I'm going to try to get yep. my rook to d2. And so you're going to play rook c2 to stop that. And what if I push my pawn to e3? Like, how are you stopping my rook from coming to d2 with the next turn and trading yep. off the rooks? And after Trade that off. happens, yeah, there's no more winning. And actually, just quickly to finish off this variation, let's say a5 happens, rook d2 check, trade rooks, <laughs> pawn a6. It looks like, oh, that pawn can't be stopped. Black has bishop e3. You could also promote first and play bishop e3 next, but the bishop is untouchable because then black promotes. And if you don't take the bishop, the bishop stops the pawn before it can get to the other side. So this is I mean, a very clean draw for Gukesh. And it just goes to show that even in the scariest of possibilities, it is still a hold for him. Okay. And I think the, yeah, I think the bishop g5 and, and e3 idea is really straightforward and, and shows it um rook, okay sorry donya as you said rook a8 was played but uh not not my analysis just rook a8 instead but bishop g5 immediately on the board from gukesh rook d2 check doesn't just help maybe the e pawn advance but also prepares to put the rook behind the pawn if you ever needed to do that so these types of lines show that very hard, despite the fact that Hikaru Nakamura probably has more fans watching around the world and certainly on a regular basis than just about anybody uh, in the in the online chess streaming space. His candidates has been an incredible ride and uh, and in many ways already very successful, but it is not going to end with him competing for a world championship match at this point. No, there's no chance of that. And we are talking about this like Hikaru is trying to find chances to win. You know, yes. Ibarra might be finding chances to lose because Robert's point, and, and again, I, I want to make it clear that 
my hat is off to Hikaru for even making it this far, for, for winning the pawn back uh, and avoiding that losing line in the middle game. It's a testament to his fighting spirit. But Robert, am I off the off the mark here and claiming that after rook d2 and e3, if someone asked me who's who would I rather be, it would probably be black. Maybe Hikaru is doing that deliberately, trying to go king f1 and bishop e2 and saying, you think you're so cool because your pawn's more advanced? Well, look at my a pawn. That pawn is going to be on a7 before you can blink. I've played Hikaru enough times uh, to know that you cannot relax for a single second. Doesn't matter whether it's a dead draw or not, which it is. What do you do if you're Gukesh? What is the safest path? I Sorry. I no, go you ahead. Go to either me or Robert. I, I should defer to the GM. I, I, I was going to suggest I think the safest path is exactly what he's doing, which is rook behind first because you actually keep the e3 square for the bishop. And if this bishop comes to this diagonal, then it's no matter who you are. I dare say almost I could draw this position against Hikaru. I know. Do not do not smite me where I stand. But but that's where we're at. Go ahead, Robert. <laughs> No, and, and look at the rook on a2. It's going to give a whole bunch of checks to the white king. And the mm -hmm. only way to stop that is getting passive by bringing the bishop back. And then the black king can enter the uh, the field. So it just seems like a position where, sure, the pawn may even get to a6. But as soon as the dark square bishop, even on this turn, goes to e3, or the next turn, I should say, goes to e3, your pawn can only get so far. So unless Hikar wins the e-pawn, keeps his a-pawn, and then can try to come up with something which still by the way should be a split point i really am not yep. trying to mm -hmm. eliminate hope for the fans of a out there but what i am trying to say is that gukesh has earned every bit of this result that he is on the path of making he, the way he's played just a, just said no you're not getting any chances against me and every move has been played with purpose so i don't think he's had any reason to be nervous in this game there's the magnitude of the moment, there's a world championship match at stake, but the way he's played has just demonstrated a confident player hard at work. Couldn't have said it better. We uh, we wanted to make sure we paid this off for at least everyone who is having that game on their second monitor as we're going to focus now on Fabi versus Nepo. You kind of have had the ideas highlighted why we expected it to be a draw. Uh, and now let's go back to that game, because if that is a draw, as we said, that is a result that greatly helps the young man from India. But Fabi has played F4. Danya, you were analyzing the line. You're now our resident expert on what that means for the position. Take it away. Will, will Jan find the move King A6 here? We're just seeing so much spirit today, you know, so much gumption by the players. And, and things don't always go your way. You know, these types of tragedies... They happen, and it's the testament of a great, experienced player uh, to be able to take it in stride and find the best chance. Yeah, I wasn't expecting uh, to have this position, but I'm going to make my opponent work for it. F4 is, an, is a really nice move. Fabi took a long time to find it. He's down to nine minutes. Yeah, there's increment, but there's no more extra time controls. And King A6, let me just summarize what's at stake here. It is the only move, according to my analysis, uh, that maintains an objective draw. Knight b3, knight d3, very, very tempting, but those moves actually lose. So people might say, well, the eval bar is the same as 0, 0.0 on both boards. Can you even speak about these games in the same universe? <laughs> of course, Hikaru, he advances his pawn to a5, and we're always watching both games. If anything crazy happens, we'll notify you of it, but this game has a lot more uncertainty. Robert, I'm starting to hold my breath this time, it's Jan who's on the hot seat. Well, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this move. King to A6. Bring your king up. And actually, it's going to go to B5 by 4. So if we can make a few moves here. And King A6 is yeah. not an easy move. Especially when you can bring your knight closer to the enemy king. But Queen A8 check. I'm saying, okay, step forward. Go up to B5. And after the king goes to B5, I'm going to go Queen D5. Perfect centralization where my queen pins your knight on the first turn here. And then it also helps the F pawn go forward while keeping the black queen off this important checking diagonal. So I would assume black's best move is to get out of the pin with king to a6. But even here, I'm looking at this like, can white just step back with the queen to d4, for example? And this queen remains perfectly centralized. The knight can't easily move because knight b3 hangs the a4 pawn with check. Knight d3 will threaten absolutely nothing because your know, knight c1 check I, I get that's where you're going but i could probably even bring my own queen back 
to C3 in this position. And mm-hmm. I say, let's try to trade queens, get rid of your one threat on the board. And then I have this F pawn that I can push. And it feels like black's pieces are stepping on each other's toes. So King A6 in the live board is step one, but there are going to be many difficult choices for black to make along the way. Whereas white is doing a very natural zigzagging to centralize that yep. queen. And that's, again, it wasn't, the point I made earlier was not meant with any sort of Fabiano bias. I was just, as I hear, you know, two of the best chess commentators in the history of the world, and we have an engine and an eval bar. I hear you guys talk about this. I'm like, this is insane. Like to expect that these two players are about to play perfect chess to maintain the balance that our evil overlords have bestowed upon the position. I just, I just don't think that's going to happen. And I don't mean that it may be Fabiano blunders, right? We've shown many variations where there are tactics with the queen and knight getting jiggy with it on the light squares, but it just feels so difficult. And I love the point you highlighted about the queen centralizing Robert, because it, it really is, again, the practical way a human should look at this. Is queen d5 even objectively the best computer move? I don't know. I don't care. It's exactly the kind of move a human would play when someone's king is in the center. You don't see anything else concrete. And try to try to put yourself in Yonda Palm to choose here. This is going to be absolutely crazy. So they may do it. These guys have played the best moves on the board with limited time uh, many times over. But I have a feeling we have not seen the last of the fireworks. And I'm not just saying that so that everybody sticks around. I really think that this is about to get wild. Yeah, I completely agree. I have another insane line in mind, insane line. But I'm also looking at the other board where they have repeated the same position twice. And Gukesh has paused. I'm not looking at it too closely because I was mesmerized by this incredible variation. I will need to show it at some point. Um, And that variation, by the way, starts with a very tempting move here. Uh, Knight to b3, which is my big fear. Knight b3. Queen g7, king a6, queen c3. And we stopped here, but after queen g2, why on earth is white winning? This could be an attempt to force the draw by Jan Nepomnishi, and the win here is insane. Might not even be a win. Queen d3 check, trying to go to h7, so black has to play b5, so that queen h7 is in a check. I just want to show that. That's really critical. If the king goes here, you check and win. Just have to show that. Okay, so b5. b5. Now watch this. I go queen to d6 check. King goes back to a7 <gasps> if you go it's on the board it's on the board oh my gosh it's on the board the line, it's not totally the line we're showing winning, is though. on the board now here's the crazy part this is where i blow your mind if king to b7 if king to b7 then you go rook to e1 and this same idea is going to repeat itself potentially three times rook e7 is made if you promote so you have to go to a7 why because rook e1 is invalid here the queen from g2 will be able to block and black will actually win the game. But here there is a secondary idea. And it is to go queen c7 check, king a6, and now same concept, rook to d1. If you promote, I mate you on uh, d6. But still the game isn't over. Still the game isn't over. Here you have to actually sack both of your queens to avoid getting mated, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Black has knight d2, blocking the rook. White gives a check on d6. King b7. Now, rook takes knight, loses to queen g8, I think. Or no, it's still a draw, but comes close to losing. I mean, just look at how many details you have to foresee. So you have to go queen d7 check first, king b6, um, queen d8 check, (laughs) king b7. And I think here you have to play rook takes d2. And the difference... Is... There is no queen g8. There is no queen g8. And if you take, you just go to the queen exactly. ending with the extra f bomb. That's the point. And who Sorry, knows? Is this complete. winning? Is this draw? No, this is exactly the position that should appear, I think, if they go down this insane line. Robert, I don't mean to be taking up so much space here showing these long lines, but hopefully people can forgive me because it's so forcing. And Fabi's gone queen g7. He found it. He's. He's found the first move, and some of the moves in that sequence were actually quite natural and logical. You know, the queen c3, getting closer to your king, stopping knight c1. I do think that this task, we we saw the evaluation bar react to saying before this move knight b3, that it was around the middle, but the task was always more difficult for black because you have to find the right time to move your knight. You have to bring your king up to a6, voluntarily bring your king out in the open with seemingly no actual threat. So that wasn't an easy 
decision for Jan Nepomshi. You're looking at both players here. I mean, they don't know that there was a draw. They knew that there were chances. So I just want to reiterate that point. And to your yep. point, Danya, I mean, King A6, Queen C3, that makes sense. Queen D3 check after the Black Queen slides all the way over there also makes sense. And the Rook, the ability for the Rook to slide out into the open to go after an exposed Black King, that's not an idea that uh, is new to Fabiano. He has been thinking about this from the beginning because when Black's pawns are extended so far, you're thinking, how do I get at the enemy king? And that H7 check that you mentioned is so critical where the black king yep. can't step back. And if the mm -hmm. pawns go forward even more, well, then we understand that the king is even more vulnerable to mating nets. Mm -hmm. I like showing that line again, because again, Don, you started it. Sometimes when some things are that complicated, you got to see them twice, right? Uh, for a kid who oh. didn't always go to the school for those who'd play chess good. That's me. <laughs> so sometimes you got to see those lines twice. That is absolutely crazy. But it does go back to my point. And, and again, it was like, I think you called it, Robert. And what I was saying is that we were, you know, sometimes people can suffer from the eval bar making it look like it's more winning than it is. Hey, the eval bar says it's winning, but this is hard. I think sometimes even commentators can suffer from, oh, Bobby seems to have blown his win. Now we're back to equal. But the more we looked at this position, it was so difficult to really to really anticipate that Jan could continue to find every engine move. And he didn't. He played knight to b3 instead of king a6. Bobby has played queen g7. And by the way, he's now already played queen to c3. So I'm not that surprised. Doesn't mean it's over, but I'm not that surprised that Caruana is back in the driver's seat. Wow. Incredible. Queen g2 will happen, I think. And there is we're getting one this crucial exact detail. Line. You have to go queen d3. I mean, queen c8, king a5 is a dead end. You'll have to repeat. But after queen d3 check, king a5 is another tree that white could bark uh, go down. Um, and after queen d3, king a5, you have to find a different win, which is queen to f1. Queen trade is off the table, so queen d5. And here, you can't take on h2 because knight d2 picks up the queen. So here's the subtlety. Here in this line, you have the intermediate check on e1. Whereas if black goes the other way, um, the line that I ended up showing, uh, king to a7 instead of king a5, the difference is that queen f1 here is wrong because queen d5, white does not have this intermediate check and the win is uh, relinquished. So here white, white well, has to he, go queen d well, here, Oh, sorry, b5. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. You're exactly right. b5, I meant queen f1, queen d5. There is no queen e1 check. So it's not just Nepo, it's also Fabi. Um, yep. When you see the winning line, it's so easy to say, well, nothing else makes sense, but tons of other things make sense. And yep. wow. Well, and I would even say in the line that you that you that you gave on Queen A five. I mean, we should point out that, uh, by the way, we're 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 stopping casually on Queen E one like it's over. Um, Knight D two is check with discovery. <laughs> like it's just super super awkward here. Like now the king moves, and can I unpin? I know you're winning the H pawn, but this is just so wild, right? You have to calculate all of this, and and in the end, white is indeed out of check. So it works. I'm just I'm just trying to complete the line Wait, to show. But, uh oh. But Denny, he gave a different check, which was given a question mark here, and it was not the right move. So we shouldn't you know pretend like it is. But the black king is still wide open. So Fabi's point is that if black plays b5, like we we're talking about in the other variation, well then there's queen c8 check, and the black king is still wide open. And if you go king up to a5, then the white queen goes to b4 with check. The king has to step back. You take on a4 with check. And now that knight is loose and you've stolen a very important pawn. So queen c4 mm -hmm. check makes sense. And it appears that black's best move by process of elimination is probably king to b7. But that invites rook to e1. And now we have to find a way out for black because rook e1 threatens rook e7 check with an immediate checkmate. So I think we should just show that if black queens after rook e1, like in many of the variations that Danya was showing, that rook e7 is the first check. There is no blocking with the queen because it's too fast and too furious, and that is checkmate. So after king b7, let's say rook to e1 is in fact played, I guess black has to step back with the knight to c5, and then it looks like a very vicious attack to my eyes, but that h2 pawn is one square away from promotion. Will the white queen go behind it? Is there enough time to do that? Uh, queen f1 also is going to be available in some mm -hmm. positions, but then you give up that light square diagonal in front of the king. So Jan, he very quickly found the best move, king to b7. This game continues. The As you said, 
Danny, it was a great call by you. The evaluation bar, it's going to go up and down. But even with the best move here, I do think that Jan's King is in serious danger. And so it's not like he's out of the woods, even if that move Quincy Ford is given a question mark. Hmm. That's so true. Queen F1 here, the move to avoid Danny. Um, I, I don't trust the computer. The computer is very myopic here at a low depth. There's so many lines, even the engine struggling. I think rookie one knight C5, queen F1, and it's game on. But I'm looking at the other board as well. The bishops are coming off the board, and maybe a quick status update would be nice. I'm My heart's starting to beat a little bit for Gukesh. Can we just verify um, that that is, in fact, a, as dead of a draw as it looks? King takes bishop. Um, because Hikaru could push a7, and people might be freaking out here, but Gukesh has planned this. He plans to give up the rook for the pawn, and the ensuing endgame will be a dead draw. Yeah, we saw the players adjusting their score sheets there. That's probably because they've reached move 60. Didn't have the uh, analysis or the board up in front of me just to confirm that that was indeed the case, but indeed it is now that I've switched over. So yeah, it's, as you said, Gukesh is playing this. I think we're headed toward a drawn rook ending. I don't think he's really giving Hikaru any chances. Move 60 means the players get even more time. And uh, I still think we're headed toward peace there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's... Okay, so the rook comes to a5. If the king takes the bishop, very important. Rook a5, king e3, rook a4. Um, it's move for move. Tempo for tempo, but Gukesh has done, as usual, an incredibly professional job of simply taking any chances off the board. Hikaru will be thinking, but it's there's no chances, Robert. I, I don't see a single we way to probably, continue the game now. We should probably just show it real quick. I mean, a7 is being threatened on the board, so just for everyone looking, if a7 is played by white instead of taking the bishop. The whole point is that you're threatening to give check and get a queen. So move like rook a5 can be played, and after check, the king moves, you get a queen. And the point is, this is still a draw. We have king and king and bishop and pawn versus king and rook. There's no real way for white to win this. Um, doing so, you risk losing. If you try to coordinate the king and rook in any kind of fashion, you probably get a queen. And even if you lost the pawn, it's a theoretical draw. So sorry to sound dismissive, but just showing again that even if black has to part ways with the rook for the new queen on a8, this is still a draw. Sorry, Robert, you but go if, ahead. If that black king were on e6, for example, we might be singing a different tune because in the line where white takes this bishop on d2, and then, and we see Hikaru thinking about it just quickly after King takes d2, uh, you know, instead of, uh, okay, the, whatever move okay. order you want. But yeah, yeah. Initially, yep. King takes d2, a7, right here, rook a5, a7, excuse me, I got confused now in the move order. But the point is that rook f8 check is a big threat for the black king go back to g7. So if the king were on e6, it would be in the wrong square. But we see that the yep. players, it looks like they're just going down these forcing lines. Danny, if you go back to the live board here, it seems yep. like... We're just a matter of time between Gukesh at minimum getting to a tiebreak. He moves the king forward. Hikaru is about to get a queen, which will quickly exit the board as Gukesh snaps her off. And uh, and yeah, I think Gukesh is moments away from, at the very least, clinching a tiebreaker affair, depending on what happens in the other game. Mm -hmm. After E3, I wouldn't even be surprised if they just agree to a draw here soon. Yeah. And even without the pawn, it's a draw. But then Hikaru would make 50 moves. With the pawn on e3, Hikaru is likely to just give up his rook for the bishop. There will be bear kings on the board. And that is an indication of what this means to the players, how hard they fought. But ultimately, Gukesh, the professionalism, the composure, until the very last moments. You can move the bishop. It's essentially the same thing, Robert. That's it. What a game. And what a performance by Gukesh. All eyes now on the other board. And, you know, we see that the moves, they're trickling in, and Hikaru has just moved his rook along the fourth rank, it would seem. They're moving faster even than yeah. uh, we can get on display. But it seems like the last pawn is gone. So Hikaru's given up his rook. He's given up his winning chances. The game is officially a draw. The handshake is in. And Gukesh officially, at minimum, goes to tie breaks. But Denny, he may be our world championship challenger if Fabiano Caruana cannot find a win. And what a candidates the young man has had, as I said at the top of the show. People thought he was here to get experience. Turns out he was giving us an experience, the Gukesh experience. And we might be living in a Gukesh world here for many years to come. That guy has at the very least 
punched his ticket to a tiebreaker and what a thrilling one it would be if it does happen tomorrow but it may not even happen he might he might be the man already having clinched a match against the world chess champion in dingley wren so breathe it in folks shout out to the fan base shout out to the youngest player in the candidates field who has clinched at least a tie for first and I just want to note that he wasn't even smiling there. So, Danya, these yeah. two players not smiling either. But how mature Gukesh is where he is still keeping control of his emotions. I think he'll celebrate a bit later. But, Danya, in this position, it looks like Fabi. He found his queen. It, it's an avenue back to the first rank. Is this trouble in paradise for Jan Napomashi? Well, this many people have never been rooting for a drawn result at the same time in the history of chess. <laughs> and this game is going to be vintage candidates action. Yesterday, I said if we get another finale like we saw in uh, Gukesh's game against Faruja, I wouldn't be able to take it. Well, we've got that and more as Fabiano finds precisely the narrow path that we laid out. Rookie one, knight c5 and queen f1. But that's just the first step because the queen's going to drop back to d5. It just did. King to b1 by Caruana executing the zigzag pattern that we talked about with queen f5 now met with king a1 nepo has to find a way to basically keep the status quo keep milking time off white's clock i'm my heart is beating 100 miles a minute this is incredible how does jan keep his chances alive i don't have an answer for it it, it already seems with best play probably Carwana can wiggle his way out of the zigzag that we keep talking about or or the computer's eval wouldn't be what it uh, what it is, but that of course, in no way uh, tells the story here of just how tricky the position is. But he's he seems to have found it. I'm just looking at how quickly they played the last few moves. Robert Fabi shuffling the king appropriately to what looks to be an open check on f5. But I think that there's a, whether he's calculated as many variations as we were able to show because we have the help of the computer. I think Fabi seems to be confident that there's probably a way to wiggle his way out of the queen and knight's gaze. It's the same wiggle that we've seen many times in many variations. It's that the queen and knight, the knight will deliver a check on the light squares, and we might just go down uh, this route, that the knight delivers a check on the light squares, but blocks the queen's check next. So you can't just go check, 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 check nonstop, because when this knight, on the next turn, after king to a1, the knight jumps into b3 with a check, and the king steps up to a2, there is no check on the light squares for the black queen. So uh, we see here that um, Jan Nepomshi, he's trying his best, but the white queen is ready to deliver a check all the way in the corner of the board and pick up that loose h2 pawn. So Jan's in trouble here. He needs to find some moves just to keep himself in the game because if he drops that h2 pawn and Fabi's not getting checkmated, well, then most of his hopes to survive are going to be out the window. John, yeah, I want to throw to you because I think that we're in the concrete territory now with the Rook having freed itself from that, that prison it was on in H1. The fact that there are very concrete threats now. If Black doesn't play the right check, Bobby's just going to pick up the pawn. So how does John maintain the balance? You asked the question, and now I'm going to pass the ball right back to you. You take the shot. How does John how does play this position? Man, this is so complicated, and I will congratulate Gukesh properly when we have the chance to do so. Uh, but for now, congratulations on an incredible performance by the 17-year-old. Uh, this will be looked, looked on for years to come. What a breakthrough event. But all eyes right now on this crazy position. Knight b3 is a hard move to resist. Danny, I want to point out that this is exactly the idea, the one that's Fabi that he's carrying out now, that he could have done in reverse on move 40. This is actually why uh, he wanted to provoke this move uh, after the time control, that feels like an eternity ago. If I'm Jan, my first attempt here is to give the check on b3 and to come back to f7 with the queen. My worry is that black will lose the h pawn and have nothing to show for it. So maybe this, this line is important. Apparently this is a draw though. How? King a7? Okay, is, and... Is there knight d2 to f3 fork? Oh! oh. Don't and what happens the, the upper at the end? Robert. No, but you that is wrong. ridiculous. You see how deep this variation is that there is a fork at the end, but that actually perhaps if we just go back a few moves, because we do see that instead of Queen H1 check, which apparently is wrong, so Queen G2 check, process of elimination, would feel right to me, that perhaps it's this that the king moves to the side, and if you gave okay. black a free turn. There isn't actually that scary of an idea. So I'm not going to give Black a free turn. If I slide my rook to h1, maybe the engine will hate it, but let's see. 
There is no useful discover check. What an incredible position this would be because it looks scary. There's a double check on C1. There's a check on D2. But either direction that Black goes, the king steps out. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a different move on the board. The live game, he brought his queen back into C2. But Danya, this is clearly worse than it was before because White has a queen behind his own pass pawn. And White can start pushing the F1. Remember, what was the idea of F4? It was to eventually get a situation where your king is safe enough where you can squeeze that pawn through one more square. I don't see what Jan wants here. Knight b3, king a2. We've barked up this tree before, and now knight d2, you could also get checkmated because there is a check on e7 yeah. um, hanging over black as well. But knight d2 doesn't even pose a threat. What on earth does Jan want here? There must be some way to keep the game going was, is it knight is, d3 is there anything with knight d3 that's what sorry that's what i was going to say that must I'm be so it danny excited. you're right I, i'm not sure it works probably white is still winning with best play but i i'm i'm thinking that at least we threaten checkmate here and what is the uh -huh. way forward for white rook. we have we have rook b1 is probably the only move and fabi's moving quickly he's played yeah. f5 so that was the best choice and he's just defending everything jan creates a threat yeah uh, fabi deals with it and his F pawn is suddenly more dangerous than the H pawn because a rook is more powerful than a knight. A knight is a slow moving piece. That rook has long range possibilities. Mm. It defends the B2 square and covers the promotion square all at once. And Jan, you see it on his face. He's trying to come up with an idea, but ideas, uh, they may not actually save him at this point. Queen C6, maybe. Thing. Maybe, but Queen C6, Queen H1 allows the queen trade. What is his move well, here to gone, keep the he's game gone going? For the line that I. He's gone for the line I suggested, which we all know is the first mistake. Uh, knight d3 is on the board, but I think Fabi will play rook b1. He does even faster than I can say it, and we're in the exact position we talked about. Jan is, is playing quickly, I think, because at this point, he probably realizes the clock is as much uh, one of his chances as anything else. But I, I think he understands this is, this is getting out of control in a hurry. Here comes Freddy. Knight. Where do you want the knight? Maybe on d2. Using Robert's idea. How do you get it? Knight c5 looks way too slow. I think you'd run out of time. Knight c5 f6. Maybe that's knight c5 f6, knight b3, king a2, knight d2. Robert, <laughs> you need something <laughs> murky. Help, help. <laughs> yeah, you, you need some help here, but the queen could step out with check, which I think is of vital importance. And, you know, there, it's not easy. Queen h1 check. And then rook c1 will be available. So black doesn't get all the checks in the world. But even there, there's still a lot of tricks. So Jan is not out of this. And Danny, Fabi's time. He's under six minutes. You could definitely see a player going wrong when they don't have enough time to calculate all the checks and all the forks and that h pawn. That's still on the board. Yep. Again, this is now, now just like before we were in the position of... Uh of the eval bar saying it was equal, but we said this was going to get spicy again, and we were right. I think this is back to the point of saying, yeah, it says White's winning, but I am scared AF. Again, scared as Fabi right now, because you've got a rook hanging, you've got an H pawn. I wanted to show a line that if you go F7, it just doesn't work. In fact, is, is Black winning how? With queen takes or knight takes? Knight, knight takes F1 and queen C4. By the way, in the live board, oh, no. Jan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Jan has the made a move. On F Wait. And it is knight c5. He played knight c5. He's, played this move. He's headed for the idea. Strap in, folks. It's the only idea. Oh. Black is just trying to use that knight. And knights are tricky pieces, especially in time trouble. So Fabi's clock, 5 minutes, 30 seconds. He's grateful that they've passed move 40. They get that bonus time with every move that's played. And you see Fabi, I mean, he's looking at both sides of the board here. He needs to stop the checks against his king. He needs to push his pawn. And he can get away, it would appear, with pawn to f6. But it's not the end of the story. Because of this knight d2 fork, the black queen gets back to stop the passer, and there still will be checks. But the, the issue for Jan is we keep mm -hmm. seeing this mechanism. The knight and the queen line up on a diagonal, and there isn't a checkmate threat. So Fabi pushes the pawn. He needs wow. to go forward, and he may get himself that chance to play Gukesh tomorrow on tie breaks. Unreal. This is unreal. And maybe the pawns will liquidate. There's a chance that Jan gets his queen at f7. He gives up h2 and takes f6. A long time ago, Robert, you made a great point. If the queens get traded, it is not a given that rook and two versus knight and two is a draw. That's another variable to keep in mind. They're going down this line, Danny. Knight to d2 will happen. And queen h1, rook c1, Robert's idea, just shifting those pieces. I mean, mm -hmm. white is walking on a razor wire. You could lose this. 
I was okay. Ninety two is happening, so we're just going to show it. We'll we'll bring up the live board, but keep analyzing because earlier in the position we were pointing out that the knight and queen are threatening the queen, the rook, and you still have the h pawn. But Robert's point is a calm, cool, and collected check. Has Fabi already played it? Indeed, he. Yes. It looks like he has. The king moves and followed by rook c1, which does multiple things. Not only does it guard c4, if you go to b3, now the queen and knight are kind of wrestling each other. So they've, you can't have both the queen and the knight on b3 at the same time. Believe me, I've tried. So if the queen moves anywhere else, you have rook to c7 and f7 still problems. I think we are, we're about to see a long think from Jan, if I had to predict, because I think he knows that he, he might be down to his last moments here pretty soon. And I think that mm. this line with rook c1, queen, uh, it's your first king a7, of course, you have to get out of check. But then when white plays rook c1 and the black queen goes to b3, the queen will venture back to f7, safeguarding the black king, stopping the f-pawn, threatening forks on the b3 square. So Fabi has successfully evaded a bunch of checks and forks and all that, but they will still come at him. Jan is not giving up. Jan is fighting to the bitter yeah. end. And let's say we do trade the f6 pawn for the h2 pawn. Danya was speaking about it. I mentioned earlier, are we in a winning scenario where it could be with the queens off the board, rook and two versus knight and two with pawns on the same side of the board. It's not clear cut that that's the case. And Fabi's time, he doesn't get more time than this, not an additional 30 minutes. He will have to figure things out and use that 30 second increment that he gets with every move and make the best use that he can. Oh my gosh. Rook c1. Rook c1 is very important because the threat is queen, not queen b3, the threat is queen c4. But yeah. if the h2 and f6 pawns are exchanged, one thing that works in white's favor, that black pawn on a4, if the queens get traded, the b4 square is a huge weakness. So Jan would do anything to shift that pawn back to a5. That might be a factor in white's favor because if Fabi concludes that trading queens is winning for him, he can get the queen trade no problem. But we're not there yet. I think queen f7 is an only move and Fabi cannot take on h2 just yet he'll have to play a move like rook to d1 i think we will get the liquidation of our king side pawns and we will get another very difficult stage where there's a, a million forks a million mates and if you're fabiana caruana you know he's been here before the time control now he's got another shot so far it's been incredible precision by Fabi. robert he is nowhere near uh, a one let's, on his let's show table. these yeah. lines you guys you guys keep mentioning the queens can get traded. Let's show mm -hmm. the line. So a queen to f7 is played. This threatens the fork on b3. How How is white simplifying this and getting to the end game where the pawns are off? I actually like rook c2 here because that actually takes away one of the diagonals. And the knight is under attack. And if the knight moves yep. to b3, it's one check. The king slides to b1. I will give you my f6 pawn. I have no choice. But then rook takes h2. And forget a queen oh. trade. Forget I ever said that. Yeah. Is queen e6 rook was H7? played, by the way. I I'm sorry to interrupt you guys, but queen e6 was played by Jan. That changes everything. I'm so sorry to cut you guys off, but this this is a very different move because this allows rook c7 check, which might be wrong. Oh. Queen to c7, sorry, rook to c7 check followed by queen to b7, saying two things at once is insanely dangerous. But queen e6 laughs in the face of danger, still renews the threat of knight to b3 check. Let's keep wow. looking at it. So what happens on rook c7? Let's go. King a6. Only move, king a6. Queen oh my gosh. a8. There's king b5. b5. No checks. And there's, that is incredible. That there's You have to probably bring your queen back to h1 because black oh is threatening checkmate. Queen e1 followed by queen b1 is a checkmate threat. Oh, and rook c2 doesn't work either, I think, Robert. Your idea, why is the queen on e6 better than on f7? Rook c2, knight b3, king b1. I think there's queen f5 pinning the rook. And that's a resource which didn't exist with the queen on f7. I mean, maybe queen g6 you could play, um, but then white could simply pick up the pawn on h2. Here, queen h2 mm -hmm. gets checkmated with queen f1, queen a1. So, oh my gosh, Jan yeah, Abomnish is a show, wizard. Show that real quick. The whole reason why is because, again, you're, you're calculating fast. Just to show, the whole point was with the queen on g6, there would have been queen h2 because there's no queen to g1 check. You just win. But in this case, queen to f1 and queen to a1 is mate. And so... The idea from Jan, which, by the way, just insane that Jan calculates and comes up with those tricks in, in under pressure time and time again. It's why he keeps saving these games, everyone. He should be applauded for just the subtlety of choosing queen e6 instead of queen f7. Now Fabi is in a real dangerous spot. The obvious move, rook c7, doesn't lead to anything. Rook to c2 was winning before on queen f7. Now it, it 
doesn't doesn't do good at all. So what's, what's the move? The move? Rook D one. Rook to D or E one. I'm not sure because I'm just trying to figure it out like everybody else. But look at Jan de Pomeshi. He is trying to relax just so he could focus on his next few moves. Fabiano is down to four minutes. Rook C seven check. If you're playing bullet chess, if you had just seconds under cock, that's the move you play because it's check and it looks like you're heading towards mate. But we just showed that there are no more checks once the black king gets to b5. So for Fabiano, he's he also understands that Jan isn't just blundering checkmate. That eliminates rook c7 check from his calculation. But rook c2, that queen f5 idea, that actually is hard to spot. So Daniel, we could see Fabi making a mistake here because instead of taking on f6, stopping on f5, that's a an aggressive move that's easy to miss from a little bit of distance. Oh, Rook D1 makes sense, of course, but again, there's so many tempting moves he's got to eliminate. He had this dilemma close to move 40. He had to figure out how to pick up the pawn on H2. Now that pawn, it's still on H2, and he's got another dilemma about where to put his Rook. Rook D1 and Rook E1, both moves probably do win. What Black will take on F6, White will take on H2, and by win, I mean eliminate those pawns, and then he'll have to win that position with now three minutes on the clock, the increment is huge, but it might not be enough if a mistake happens. First step, do not go rook c7. But the fact that he's thinking tells me he understands rook c7 is wrong, and that's big. This is a problem. And I mean, the Ugh. move queen e6. Danny, something we haven't even mentioned is that if the pawn h2 is... Oh! Did he just... He's done it! Do you want rook c7 check? Uh -oh. No. Uh-oh. He doesn't wow. see... He didn't see oh, that there was a Oh, he's going to go win. F7. I think he wants F7, and I don't actually see the draw off the top of my head. Oh! I think Black has a miracle draw with a perpetual where he sacks the knight, guys. That might be okay. what Fabi missed. Sorry. I didn't have anything to offer. I was distracted because if, if, if there was ever a time we were going to go to a break, that was it. But damn the torpedoes. We're not going anywhere until we know what happens in this. And I'm now back engaged. My apologies. Knight to b3 check has been found and possibly this saves saves the game, which ruins the candidate's chances for both Jan and Fabi if this ends in a draw. But at this point, you can't blame Jan if that's but what how? he settles on. Where's yeah, the actual is draw? Is it knight d2 and you sack the knight and that's a perpetual? Come on. No, he didn't do that. He moved his queen. Yeah, I'm pretty I've... sure he just... And he, it's a mistake. And this position is so difficult. We see the eval bar yeah. go up and down. People often criticize players for making the mistake. But come on, knight d2 check inviting the king to the center. That's what Fabi actually wanted. He might have miscalculated something. But this is a mistake. There's only one move here. King to a2. So actually, what is Jan's follow-up after king to a2? I don't see a check for him, and there are all sorts of checks against the Black King. It, it makes you realize maybe Jan was looking at time. The players don't get any bonus time added at move 60, so it's purely the increment. Perhaps he was like, I just want to keep moving, keep the pressure, keep Fabi under the clock, but he might have missed that chance. Of course, again, no mm -hmm. judgment. Easy to say. Knight d2 was almost impossible to find. He might be playing for a win, too. I know it sounds insane, and my guess is he missed knight d2, but maybe he's just trying to keep chances alive because Fabi, with a mistake, we've seen lines where you accidentally allow promotion. I think that's extremely unlikely, but that was impossible, Robert. To understand that's a perpetual down a rook with the king darting around the center, we cannot blame him even for a single second uh, for not no, playing he, that. He might blame himself if he does go on to lose this game, but we say it, said it from the beginning, we'll say it again. A draw is more or less the equivalent of a loss in a weird way for these players because Gukes drew. He is in clear first place. Fabi and Jan both need to win this game to catch up to him and force tie breaks. And you see Fabi here. He is determined, but he's also down under three minutes, two minutes, 40. Tick, 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 tick. He might throw in a check. That might be the wrong move. It is a blessing to have the evaluation bar off to the side. The players don't have that. Fabi must sense that he's winning, but Queen mm. A8 check to promote the F-pawn and then you can make a knight. That's, that's not the way forward. Queen a8 and f8 queen is a perpetual. Queen a8, king b5, f8 queen. There's queen e6 with a perpetual. But can you make a knight there to cover the e6 square? That is forcing black to give up the h1. Insane. I don't think that's the best win, though, but I don't see a clear win other than I, that. <laughs> I, I want to show it. I, I want to keep Fabi on the big screen. We know that we're down to the final moments, but I am going to quickly show Donja's idea. We don't have to leave. But if check and the king moves and you get a knight, 
you guard E6. The F7 is going to It's not the best idea, but I just had to show that that it's crazy. Uh, I, what happens next? H1? <laughs> I, and then and then you have to take it, and then we get, That's I don't know. That's not the move. Are you serious? It's some quiet I move. have no idea. Queen F1. Not, anyway, we, 90 seconds. 90 seconds for Fabi. But this is He's exactly what Fabi needs to... It's what he needs to calculate, Danny. I mean, it, that line there, white girls will promote to a queen, but then the black queen will get that check on e6, which is why we promote to a knight to stop the queen from getting on the diagonal. But Fabi, look at him. He is trying to find a move. He's down to one minute, 10 seconds. He does not have a lot of time. And queen a check might be the right move, but then you leave your king uh, out in the open. So Fabi, Danny, he's down a minute now. He needs to find something. Yeah, and you can see the nerves, right? Again, we don't need to even pretend that we're reading into body language. We know that these guys are on the edge of their seat. Their hearts have to be pumping. No game is bigger in their entire chess career to this moment. A win is the only option to tie Gukesh Damaraju and force tiebreakers. He's played queen a8 check. King to b5 will be on the board in a moment. And what will Fabi do next? Queen e8 allows the crazy thing is if you play queen e8 and promote black has a different perpetual because you relinquish the d5 square so maybe the move is queen e8 but after king a5 or king a6 as fabi maybe he will repeat the position once to gain some time what's the move there but that's exactly what he's doing and it's instructive for everyone at home that the black king has to go back to a6 if the king steps forward into c4 and you're walking into a danger zone. Your knight is actually pinned in that variation, and you're taking away your own check. So the king has gone back to a6. I think Fabi will give that check on a8. Instead of going back to c6, he can also go to e8 and quickly pick up a minute. So queen a8 check, that's not your arrow, Danny. That's the only move that keeps white ahead. And it's funny because we're getting that exact thing we talked about in the meta of this moment for the candidates. We are going to have it on the board Players might objectively have taken a draw if they were in this position at any other time than the last round where a win is the only result because both players have to know this is crazy. But Fabi doesn't want to draw. Neither really does Jan. But what's he going to do I'm to worried. keep chances alive? I think he's going to underpromote. I'm looking and looking, scanning the board. I'm not even sitting there with the clock ticking down. Queen a8, king b5, queen e8, king a6. Now you're facing three-time repetition, so you can't repeat again. You need to make a decision, <clears throat> Wait. Robert. Well, that what? is he, the move. Wait, wait. He just went back to c6. Wait a second. Isn't that if he does it again? It... No, that relinquishes the win. He can't go back to a8 anymore. He's going to have to make a different move. Well, and the computer said queen a8 was the best there with a quick arrow, the the blue arrow. But again, nothing matters right now. Besides, what is promote. the rule? Do the he needs to promote? By the way, Danny, go ahead. That's the only way to keep what, the game alive. What? Uh... <laughs> rookie seven or again not. it's easy for us to freak out with the evil bar but it's not like yon goes yes thank you you just gave me a draw <laughs> yon has no freaking clue what's going on here this is insane but he's got and how much minutes, time Robert. that's exactly what i was about to say you see yon he's <laughs> like okay what's going on here but queen for black needs to get a check in against the white king the queen on c6 for white is covering the promotion square in the corner. And in the other corner, it's threatening a big check against the Black King. We saw the queen there. So Jan, I mean, he can bring his own queen all the way down to F1, which simultaneously tries to help his pawn promote and threads a queen C4 check back and forth on a yo-yo string because White's pieces are far away from his own king. So queen F1 here, that seems to be the holding move. Yes, Gukesh watching this must be happy that the bar goes right down to the middle, but it's still not that simple. And I think people should be reminded of that, that just because it says it is zeros, there's some draw somewhere. One of them involved a knight sacrifice. There's an under promotions to knights for white. The black pawn is about to promote as well. This is still complicated and Jan will have to settle down and try to find the way to make this draw. Wow. Well, queen F1 is a pretty natural move. If we compare this to the moves that they've had to find, that's obvious and i think danny i'll give you the say because you've got the board we should show first of all why queen a8 and f8 queen um doesn't win the game i mean it actually might come close to losing the game um but jan with 11 minutes he'll probably spend at least another 30 seconds on this move so queen f1 maybe queen c2 also draws queen a8 king b5 f8 queen queen c4 and at the very least black has perpetual and if white walks to c1 he gets mated here he okay, also yeah, gets he's mated, mated with knight b3. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Um, my idea was to go queen a8, queen e8, just like Fabi was supposed to on the previous move. And then maybe you get another resource. So where does the king go? Probably back to a6, right? Rook e4. Rook e4. No, knight takes e4. That... Wait, knight e4, you have queen takes a4. One second. And queen e4. And it's still a draw? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Come on, engine. Stop. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Can we both, put it on permanent detention? <laughs> <laughs> this is insane. Again, it doesn't matter what the computer says because players finding those moves uh, when uh, they've, they've never been more nervous in their life. And one of them is down to a minute and 30 seconds. This is uh, we are in blunderable territory, as they like to say. This is a blunderful position. And rookie four, that idea is unreal. And I think we need to show the uh, final touch. So if we quickly can, uh, if uh, Danya was saying, check, king b5, queen e8. And On the board. We are seeing this. Uh, if rookie four, h1 equals queen. The problem is that queen a8 check is available because the rook actually blocks the black queen's path to the corner. And then rook b4 is mate. So this is actually just sick stuff from both of these players coming up with tactics. They may not always find the perfect move, but these ideas are truly beautiful. So Fabi's on the clock. He did give the check on e8. The Black King steps back to a6. That, of course, was the natural reply. But Danya's rookie four here, that's the only try because everything else seems to either repeat the position or maybe even give Black some winning chances. So rookie four, that's nasty. If I had to guess, we'll get re repeating one more time because that's the thing you tend to do here. But if rookie four is indeed the only thing Fabi has left on you, uh, are we actually headed for, for a peaceful result? The old-fashioned way here, there's nothing else to do but head for this line. I don't know if you'll even find this. I mean, rookie four is so hard to spot. When you're sitting there with a World Championship qualification, potentially on the line, um, I was just going through every possible move. And Fabi now down to a minute. I think we should just wait for his move now because rookie four, Jan will see the mate. Jan's time management has been incredible. And I think Fabi, to the heartbreak of so many of his fans, he might be coming to terms and ultimately repeating moves here, Robert. He's under a minute now as we go to the live board after King A6. Oh, oh wow. My gosh. Fabiano Caruana contemplating his last options what to do you have to keep the fight alive a draw is as good as a loss i mean it literally is all that matters is a win to tie gukesh damaraju and give yourself an opportunity for the world championship but yeah the the breath is being taken out of my body feels like the the wind has been taken out of bobby's sails unless he can come up with one last trick he's given a check and the Robert king goes right back <laughs> yeah well jan has no choice so that's actually for his defense, good news, because Fabi's the one down to about 40 seconds. So if he is going to play for a win, he could be teetering on the edge. He could be playing for a loss, and Gukesh doesn't want to hear that. He doesn't want to hear win, loss. He wants a draw in this game, because that means the 17-year-old faces off against Ding Li Ren. But you see the de de determination in Fabiano's eyes. He wants this win, but Jan, he's looking skeptical of Fabi's winning chances. He's even shaking his head a little bit. <laughs> well, in the I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think the head shake is, in my opinion, translating body language, as I tend to do sometimes, is actually shaking his head because he thinks that mm -hmm. he's he's actively killing both their chances. I think he's he's sort of shaking his head like, hey, man, I think we both know what's about to happen here. Maybe not for this game, but overall, he was leading the tournament. But let's take a moment just to appreciate this moment. And Fabi, it's too late. Well, not too late. Rookie four, maybe one more chance, but with 20 seconds on the clock, I'm just not seeing it. His clock is dwindling. And he's done it. Rookie four still keeps the spark alive. Robert, this right here is a moxie by Fabiano. Still keeping the flame burning. And now knight takes e4. Is that the only move? And Nepo has no other moves potentially because he'll see a maiden too. Uh, he's one, two candidates in a row, by the way. <laughs> and well, Danny, quite, <laughs> I, I was going to throw to you really quickly. I mean, he likely will find this. But even that continuation leads a position where white is going to be up a pawn in a queen ending. So does that give Fabi some chances? Is Jan completely out of the woods? He did have to settle back in because you saw Jan, he was stretching, he was all over the place, but his work is not done. 
Sorry, I, I was literally going to say the same thing. Is Does Fabi at least uh, take heart in the fact that he's not going to give up? And we should take heart in the fact that if Fabi goes for that line, we're going to be here for another three and a half hours. <laughs> so everyone should buckle up because he is going to push for a win in an endgame that makes us makes us earn our keep. And the line that Robert's talking about is if the knight takes the rook on the board, everybody, if you can just follow the highlights in your head, white doesn't take back right away. That would let the pawn hang with check and, and then maybe white loses. White will take the pawn with check here and only then take take on on e4. Eventually, both sides will swap f for h, and we will have a two versus one queen and pawn ending, and we are going to be here all night long, if that's the case, because Fabiano is not going to let his candidate's chances go by. But uh, but Gukesh, Gukesh, who, uh, Damaraju Gukesh, who is watching this, is probably very happy if that's the kind of position that we see on the board. Wow, and look at Jan holding himself back because knight takes e4, easy to, easy to say. Yeah, take the rook. To give up this pawn on a4, which is the pride of your position with check, to allow any capture with check by definition is hard. And my question there is whether or not Fabi will actually be able to trade the f pawn for the h pawn. And probably he will. And even if he does, the two on one, Fabi will try, but it might be a mood point. Look at Jan holding himself back. Queen takes f7 check is the move you would play if you were if you were to panic because after queen takes f7 black promotes and that gets us into the position we thought we would get with a two on one there's no way that jan misses knight takes e4 and right now gukesh he's jumping on his bed with nervousness with excitement his millions tens of millions of fans i don't know if they can stand to watch this game i can barely stand to keep my eyes on this board robert what well, do you mean tens of millions what? <laughs> hundreds of millions <laughs> No, no, we're talking about billions. Gukesh is a hero in India. And look at Yanda Pamshi. He takes the rook. Fabi takes the pawn with check. He'll then take the knight with check. We're heading down this exact line. And for Fabiano Caruana, he will be a pawn ahead as he gives up his F pawn for Jan's H pawn. But we know, and the players know, that should be a drawn end game. It's not one of those situations where should and it's difficult. It actually is one of the easier draws for a player of this caliber. Yanda Pamashi, I mean, he doesn't lose in candidates at all, but to lose this position once these pawns get off the board, uh, I would be truly shocked. I was I was just going to say, as as uh, Don just said, can't, uh, that the fans probably can't stand it. I was about to say, well, it's 4 a.m., so they probably are not standing. They're probably watching this in bed <laughs> uh, from India. <laughs> nah. And... Um, and and the uh, the coverage we have, of course, on the Chesscom India channel, and shout out to everybody who's tuning in from around the world. Are we about to see a perpetual? So perhaps I was wrong that we would be here for hours more, and Fabi would try to win the two on one. Maybe he's he going to settle. No, no way. Okay, he, he goes queen d seven, queen c eight, and promotes, and he takes yeah. this to bear kings. And right now, four a.m. in India, not not only are they not going to sleep, Danny. Um, tomorrow's a Monday. They're going to come to work. Uh, hundreds of billions are going to come to work blurry-eyed, red-eyed, and nobody's going to care if Jan can make a couple of moves. It's so heartbreaking for Fabiano Caruana. It doesn't matter who you root for. We're all chess players. We all appreciate the action. You can simultaneously feel joy for one player and feel the pain, Robert. It's pure pain for another as Fabi still trying. He will promote, and Jan still needs to hold the two-on-one. Yeah, this is a position that neither player wants. We entered this round with both players mathematically needing a win. It was a requirement. And we're in a position where Jan is shaking his head, even though he might feel fortunate not to have lost. Fabi is kicking himself because he had a winning position. And now we're in one where it's just going to be a long, drawn-out battle. And, well, will the draw happen? If Jan needs to continue to play defense, but at least the toughest seems to be behind him. We have officially reached the end game that we we knew was inevitable, at least for the last few minutes, a two on one queen and pawn ending. As Robert said, at this level, this is a bit of a textbook draw. It's it's hard to mess up. It's even one of those those rare draws where depending on what happens with the pawns, you can even trade queens at, at times. And even the king and pawn ending can be a draw. Of course, not something you want to do uh, very quickly. But the point is, we have a game that uh, while Fabi is going to give every ounce of his energy, I believe, I don't I don't think we're going to see a quick draw just because of what this means to the players. 
but I think the result is is uh, is likely no. Sorry for being anticlimactic there, guys, but you know what? It uh, chess is a game with three results, like it or not, and often the best play by both sides can lead to this. There is no doubting that these two guys wanted it more than anything. They probably, if given other options, would both take losing chances back on the board if they were given the option right now, if it meant they had a chance to win. But that is not an option, and we will likely have a draw. So on that note, we're going to take a break. When we come back, the chess will continue. You shouldn't go anywhere. Of course, we could be wrong. Maybe blunders happen. Stranger things have happened. Hikaru Nakamura's chances to compete for the World Championship are over. Kukesh Damaraju eagerly watches and hopes this game does end as we think it will. But don't go anywhere. The final moments of the 2020 tour, 2024 FIDE candidates happen when we get back. This April, intergenerational rivalries spill over to the chessboard. Face off against the boomers. Grapple with Gen X and the millennials. Or take on the young guns of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and Gen Beta. And then the mighty Martin? Play them all on chess.com. I'm Levy Rosman, and I have the privilege of being joined by none other than Vishianan, five-time world champion, absolute legend of the game. Thank you so much. Well, your official capacity here is commentator yes. or deputy president. Which one are you? I'm here principally as a commentator, but I'm also deputy president, so... So if two players at this event start punching each other and you have to make some sort of big decision, it, it's on you. <laughs> I suppose yes, but uh, in, in first it'll go to the arbiters. How much did you have to sacrifice throughout your career? Not really, and but the thing is, it, it never felt like a sacrifice. It felt like something you have to do in the same way that you have to uh, sacrifice a pawn, sacrifice a piece in order to get sure. somewhere. <laughs> sure. It just felt like, uh, of course, I have to take this seriously to do well. But uh, if I do well, I'll feel happier later. It seemed very uh, immediate. Did you like school? I, by now, I remember that having enjoyed it immensely, but I think that's just your memory playing tricks. Uh, in, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I suspect, now everything about my youth seems fantastic. I mean, that, at that age, everything seems full of promise. I must say, I'm quite privileged. Uh, I had a blast uh, the whole time, and I can't complain. I suspect uh, these youngsters have their own favorite uh, things about chess but uh, they must be having just as much, uh, just as intense an experience. And you can feel free to be as arrogant as uh, you'd like, as not humble as you like, because are, are you an A-list celebrity in India, like an A-list athlete? I think in terms of uh, being recognized or my name meaning something, the thing is my name uh, has been on school textbooks. Yeah. I get recognized even more now than uh, before. And I think it's this new audience that mm -hmm. I'm saying. Uh, people who are still far from the game, but not as far as they used to be. Um, arrogant enough. What were your expectations going into the 2013 match? It's hard for me to believe that I didn't think I'd at least have some chances. And I always thought um, as long as I could settle into the match and play and, you know, do the things the way I normally do it, then I don't see why I shouldn't have a chance. Uh, I found it impossible to disregard his strength. And um, the hardest thing was simply seeing his results against others and my mm -hmm. results against others. And realizing at some point you can't ignore that data point. Uh, he's winning way too many games against everyone else. Yeah. And I'm not.
We are officially watching the longest game in the 2024 FIDE candidates. And that's not necessarily the duration of the game in terms of time, but the moves on the board. The move 90, queen to d3, was officially marking this battle as the longest one in the event. Um, I think you can see by the body language of the players, guys, we know what's going through their brain. Talk about a couple of amazing chess players, champions in their own way. They gave everything they had. I think you can tell that they're uh, they're aware the result of this one is pretty much in the books already. Robert? It's unfortunate for the two of them. I mean, they had such great runs. For Yana Pamashi, it's been a three candidates run. He hasn't lost in the candidates since 2021, and I include an asterisk for that because he'd already wrapped up the tournament. Uh, so to not win when you haven't lost a game in the candidates in so long, that's going to be devastating for Fabiano. He got off to a slow start. He had an even score after eight rounds. And we see here the position is even, but he then started his winning ways. He was fortunate of the white pieces in this final round. Jan went for it. Fabi missed some wins. But it's one of these situations where you have to feel for both of them and also feel happy for Gukesh because Gukesh himself played a marvelous, marvelous tournament. So if this game, nothing weird happens and it's drawn, these players are going to be devastated. But Gukesh and all of India will celebrate. And Danya, what can you what can you say at this point, right? Obviously, all the applauding to Gukesh will happen the moment it is official. But as far as how these two guys feel, if you told Nepomnishi coming in, Danya, that he would not lose a single game and be on the right side of, uh, of of a few decisive ones, he'd say, okay, I'll take it, right? But it wasn't good enough this time around because of the performance of Gukesh Damaraju. This is, I mean, the emotions that are circling through my head um, I can't even imagine uh, the emotions that are in that playing hall in the Great Hall of Toronto. As I said before we went on break, I mean, this game keeps going. Fabi will make it to move 100, but it's just an easy perpetual at this point. I mean, on the one, on the one hand, it's jubilation, euphoria, and so well-deserved fans of Gukesh should feel like they deserve some credit. The environment that allows players like Gukesh to succeed in the way that they have to come into the candidates your first time, age 17. No, I'm not just trying to get experience. I am trying to win this thing and become the youngest world champion in history. And on the other hand, for Fabiano Caruana, oh so close to what would have been an incredible chance and an amazing comeback. But in the end, of, in the end, this is chess. It's the game that produces the most happiest grandmasters and the saddest grandmasters, the pain and the pleasure, the opposite extremes, Danny. And our job is to capture all of that to sympathize with the losers and to celebrate with the winners. We can do that at the same time. And uh, this is a story of two players who will experience the greatest pain and the greatest happiness. Indeed. And uh, that's, that's, that's how the battle goes sometimes, right? This was awesome today. I mean, we, we had, we had amazing fighting chess. We had the, the, Former, I almost said the world champion, the former world champion, arguably greatest player of all time and highest rated, highest rated player in history. I can't talk, guys. It's been a long day. Magnus Carlsen was with us at some point. We had a lot of fun analyzing the games here, but uh, but yeah, we're we're pretty confident that uh, Fabi's going to be thinking for a minute what are his last chances, and so we're going to take a second, let Fabi maybe try to come up with one more swindle and uh, throw to our own Mike Klein, who had a chance to catch up with Gukesh Damaraju moments after the game. And he caught up with Gukesh when the result of this one was a little less certain than it is now. So let's see what Mike and Gukesh got up to in their combo. To held the draw success back today, and it should be noted before we get to the questions that everything is still in the balance. Plus, if anything dramatic changes, let's get back to your game. What were you expecting out of Hikaru today? Try and get a game, and uh, um, I mean, obviously, he would uh, do everything. All right. Apparently, we're we're not going to take that interview right now. Hopefully, we'll uh, we'll check it out later. For anyone who wants to see it, I'm sure it'll make its way to the media that is social at some point. So. All right, guys, back to this one. Fabi is on the clock. Um, at this point, you wonder if he's thinking more about creative ways to create winning chances or just sort of uh, replaying this game in his head. Robert, what do you think is going through his brain right now? 
just all the emotions of what's been a long event. And you know, we think back to 2022 in Madrid, where he was a half point behind Jan Napomji, his opponent here, after the first half. He had all the chances. He didn't know that Magnus Carlsen was going to sit out. He was the one player who felt certain that Magnus would play. And then in the second half of the tournament, he just had a horrendous performance because he was kind of going all in. Then we fast forward to 2024 and Fabiano, well, he did not get off to a good start. He didn't win that first game in Sakaru. He, in fact, lost the second time they played against each other. He still had a chance because he's that strong. He's gaining rating points as the only player not named Magnus Carlsen over 2,800. He is having a positive tournament. But when Gukesh goes on the run that he has, unfortunately for Fabi, it's a little bit too late. He didn't get going early enough, and Gukesh has just been so strong. So I feel for both these two who have played in the last World Championships, Jan the last two, Fabi the one before it, but neither of them will be playing going forward unless Ding Li Ren decides not to play. I mean, we haven't really spoken about that. Ding has said he will play in the World Championship, but I guess I'm wondering if Ding says suddenly he won't play, do Jan, Fabi, and Hikaru have to play some kind of tiebreaker? Blitz at my house. We're doing it. <laughs> Winner take all. Okay? No, I'm kidding. Danya, <laughs> what what happens if that's the case? Is there a regulation that you're aware of that I'm not? I think my, my head is just going to explode if that actually happens, as we see. Uh, as far as the game goes, it's move 104. I and mean, Fabi has zero winning attempts here. I just wanted to kind of clarify. White is up a pawn, but... There is no way to do anything in this position. You can never push a5. Uh, and even if you do, it's a draw. Even if you lose the b6 pawn, it's a stalemate. So Jan is just going to continue checking and shuffling. He understands this pain very well. But let's wait for that to happen. I mean, your house may be mine. I think we're all happy to host that, uh, Danny. That will be quite the party. But right now, Gukesh, she can basically start jumping on the bed. Although he might be a busy guy for the next couple days. Blitz house, your house or mine, just not at not at Robert's house. Uh, Robert, you guys are welcome to come over, though. And by the way, I forgot to say that Talia has been watching the show today, and she asked two questions. I've been getting texts from my wife. She said, one, why hasn't Robert come to visit in a while? Just letting you know. And two, she said, why has Danya never come to visit? So just so you guys know, you know, she's she's wondering what's going on. She's never met you, Danya. But shout out to the girls and everyone who watched the show today. And uh, she, Talia was rooting for Fabi. You know, she's a Fabi fan, so this one did not work out in her favor. Well, many Fabi fans out there, and he's earned them. And he is one of the best players in chess history. Uh, he has been the second highest rated player behind Magnus for pretty much a decade. He started a podcast. Right? What doesn't he do? Unfortunately, what he hasn't done is win this game, an all-important final round game. And yeah, I just it's hard to sit here and talk about it because we know both of these players, how hard they work for Yana Pamashi to be this close to a third straight candidate's win, that's unreal, the skill that he has. And then for Fabi to be so highly rated, Magnus was on the show earlier saying that Fabi played the best chess in 2023, and yet to not be the challenger once again, it's going to hurt. Uh, it's going to sting. And I hope both of these two are back here in the candidates next time around because they're just such great players, and I'll never get sick of watching and commenting their games. It's heartbreaking to even unpack the last sentence you just said i hope these guys are in the candidates the next time around but i want to throw to you danya on that point part of the reason this is so devastating is not just because of the opportunity to compete for the world title but you never know when you're going to get another chance and just getting to this event is is such a gauntlet let alone the chances of winning it uh what do you say about that danya right i mean i expect they'll be back because i think these guys are are just still playing some of the best chess of their careers, even if the young guns are are coming and they won't be stopped. But it's true, right, Danya? I mean, they might not be back in the candidates ever again. That's kind of tough to mm -hmm. let sink in. Yeah, and, and we've been focusing on Fabi, obviously, for Jan, that close to winning a third straight candidates. But to make one more comment about Fabi, his career, whether or not he eventually gets a shot, another shot at the world title, will be defined by resilience, right? Just keep coming back he had that downturn in his career and his performances leading up to the candidates were nothing short of incredible breaking 2800 again and then in the candidates itself just the amount of work that you put in it's not just the pain of this game it's not just the shock um of of giving up what seemed like a, a foregone conclusion a winning position it's all of the work that you put in to bounce back from that loss to hikaru to win the game yesterday against pragnananda in 
one of the most incredible positional technical displays that we that we've seen in the candidates along with Gukesh's win it's all of that rolled up into this one moment that one moment where you have to literally accept the inevitable because the handshake is coming and uh, your heart breaks for Fabi uh, no matter who you are it's it's incredibly difficult it's hard to transmit this level of pain I can't even begin to imagine what he'll be dealing with over the next couple of weeks but this is why I like the chess community as a whole that no matter who you're rooting for you can be the most diehard Gukesh fan and your heart can still go out for the players who put all of this effort came oh so close but ultimately we'll have to try again next time well said and as you're talking about what Fabiano's going to do over the next couple of weeks to sort of grieve this I think you know again for Jan the the same can be said right I mean what can you say about this guy he's he's uh maybe oh and nothing more to say then because we might be about to say that uh, the result is official. Fabiano takes a look at Jan, offers the draw. I think Jan is uh, letting the moment sink in because it's not like he's pretending he was the one pushing for this, if I'm translating what's being discussed correctly. <sighs> Absolutely crazy. And indeed, they do shake hands. Both players surrendered, submitted, resigned in their defeat, even though they draw on the board. But competing for another world championship title is not in the cards for either of them. But Gukesh Damaraju, those that applause right here is for these two competitors, Jan Napomsi and Fabian Karwana. But Gukesh is the one that is celebrating and what a performance it was from him. And yeah, these two players, we're hearing them still talking, but I mean, this is just going to be so hurtful for them for the next weeks, maybe months. And it's one of these situations that there had to be a winner, but these two players are so tough and resilient that there couldn't be one. Yeah, not much to say. These guys would probably analyze the game all day um, if uh, if they could. It's obviously just so heartbreaking. And shout out to everyone who's live on site applauding these guys. They deserve it, as does Gukesh. If he's still in the building in the Great Hall, uh, feeling pretty great right now. He may or may not be. Who knows? But these guys deserved an applause. Gukesh Damaraju, what can you say? He deserved an applause. Mm -hmm. Hikaru Nakamura, by the way, we, we haven't uh, shouted out him probably enough today. Obviously, today's game was not his favorite, not getting really any winning chances as white, but what a, what a, what a candidate Hikaru had putting himself in the position. And, and Robert, you asked a question, what would happen if Ding Lee Ren was to resign the opportunity to compete for the title to forfeit it? I have no idea. <laughs> we actually, I, and now we're sitting here frantically looking for the regulations because even though I think it's a hypothetical, it is fascinating. Apparently Hikaru Nakamura is second on tie breaks based on the number of wins he had. Um, again, I don't know what that, what that actually means, if that's how it's decided or not. Um, but, uh, or whether the, the players would be brought together. That's what I vote. Like I said, blitz at my house, Robert. <laughs> well, I, th I don't think tie breaks by number of wins is a good metric here because it also means you've had the most losses and the players should always play it out and play it out. Yana Pomshi and Fabian Akarana just did. And, you know, you could see it on both of their faces. They didn't want to make the draw because it meant that their chances at the world championship title were over. They believe that Ding Li Ren is going to play. He said as much himself. And that leaves us with just one player sitting atop the standings. It is Gukesh. He has been unreal. The Indian fans all over the world are going to celebrate his success, but his road is just getting started. He's 17 years old. He's playing for a world championship title. I think that everyone can celebrate success, prodigious talent, and now Gukesh. Danya, I'm going to ask you for final words, but we're probably going to be back and do some post-game analysis. So maybe I'll ask you to save your final words, if that's okay. You'll have an opportunity to do so. And, uh, we will be right back. We're going to give you a post-game breakdown. Of course, wrap up, final thoughts. Uh, talk a little bit, again, about what the tie-break scenario would be for players tied with second or how that works, because I think even though it's unlikely, it might be interesting to be aware of what would happen if Dingley Red didn't compete. So answers to all those questions and more don't go anywhere. Our final coverage of the 2024 FIDE candidates will really be right after this last break.
I'm here with Grandmaster Nijat Abbasov from Azerbaijan, currently rated 2,632. He is a, uh, we were discussing right before we went live, top five, maybe top 10 in Azerbaijan, uh, the runner up for the World Cup spot and qualifying sort of in a, in a strange fashion for the candidates, but yeah. here you are at the candidates. How is it feeling? First of all, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. How's okay. it feeling to be in Toronto? Uh, first time in Canada. Yesterday I had a little tour, just trying to get used with the time zone and uh, with the weather, because now it's sunny in Baku, and here it's a bit cold. And in two days they promise snow. Yeah, trying to Sorry. get, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to get used uh, with all this vibe. Otherwise the tournament, everything like uh, starting, it's a, a bit excitement in uh, in here. So, all good. Well, yeah, I'm, now you're going to have to talk about that a little bit. What uh, We'll get into the chess too, but yeah. what uh, what happened? This wasn't chess related, I hope. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was trying to move my rook too far and yeah. then I could, couldn't play. I couldn't play with the hand, so I tried to. Yeah, but uh, I'll do that again. Though, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. so the reality is that the rook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the reality is that um, first time in 20 years of my football career, I would wow. say, I tore my ACL. Oh my God and i had surgery about like 25 days ago so yeah now i'm here re recovering my doctor says in, within 15 days i should be able to get rid of this one which is somewhere around in like the mid tournament where everyone gets tired yeah. i'll just you know start uh, walking properly so that's where I mean, I'm looking forward. I, yeah. I'm also looking forward. I can't wait. It's going to be like the cast off. It's going to be yeah. like a, a, like an anime moment, like a movie yeah. moment. You drop the weight yeah. and yes, yeah. and then you uh, you get back into run uh, forest run. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, I have so many questions for you. I guess I'll start with um, with the fact that look, obviously, elephant in the room. You are your your journey to qualification was a little bit. I don't know. I want to say straight. It's it, maybe was it annoying? Like you had to wait for an answer, or did you just sort of assume from the beginning Magnus was not going to play? No. In fact, when I was playing against Magnus, I already could tell that he's not going to play the candidates because, well, before our encounter, he said that he's not going to play. So it was more about like technicality, and I wasn't really waiting for his answer. I was just doing my stuff, what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm and uh, just wait for the you know fide to contact me and say that okay you got this spot and when they did that when they contacted you you were ready i imagine you already had some some sort of team some sort of preparation ready to go and... yeah i was ready for you know them to offer me regarding preparation yeah i started around that time uh so do you still feel the same level of pressure coming here because it might be a similar story as the world cup where it's yeah. like yeah, you do interviews, people do interviews, they say, well, yeah. you're going to have a tough time or whatever, all this yeah. stuff. You say, I'm just going to play my game and I'll see what happens. Exactly. That's my okay. reply. I'm just going, I, I just came here to, you know, show my best, enjoy every moment. And, uh, well, I don't have any goals in the tournament in terms like, okay, I'm playing for the first place or any other place. But uh, all I want to do is just uh, enjoy every game and try my best. I'm here with Grandmaster Nijat Abbasov from... What an amazing event this was. What an amazing job all the players did. The commentators who held it down, I, I jumped in here for the last day, but I'm just sitting here reflecting on what a wild ride. What an awesome job you guys did and everyone. But let's give the now officially official, official congratulations to Gukesh Damaraju, who has made history as the youngest player ever to win the candidates and to compete for a world championship title. Danya, take the floor, sir. Well... There's just so many things to talk about and, and so many discussions that will be had, uh, so many reports and recaps that will be written. You know, our hearts go out to Fabi, but the man of the hour is Gukesh. I mentioned that I would congratulate him properly when the action subsides and it has subsided. It's time for me to take my hat off officially again. I'm not wearing a hat. Proverbially, of course, what a performance by Gukesh at 17 years old. You really don't need any other reasons to root for him, just his play alone makes you wonder, is this guy 
the next to start a chess dynasty? Is he going to be the youngest world champion in history? And how much better can Kukesh become with how many more years left, maybe even before he reaches the peak of his abilities? This is such an exciting time in chess. But also, of course, as I've pointed out throughout the broadcast, Gukesh would be the first person, I think, to express his sympathies to Fabi, you know, to come up, to shake his hand, uh, to express how he feels for him, because that's the kind of person that Gukesh is, despite his age. If you looked at his games, if you looked at his manner of being, you would never think that this is his first candidates, that this is his first chance to perform on the world stage. He plays like he's been doing it for ages, and perhaps he even will. Time will tell, but a congratulations to Gukesh and to all of his fans. Danny, this has been one of the wildest rides of my life, and I enjoyed every second of it. Robert, I mean, uh, as as Danya highlighted, the condolences to Fabi feel most in order, mainly because Fabi was the one who seemed to really have chances there. But I think Gukesh would do the same for Yanda Pamishi and Hikaru, who, by the way, are also tied for second place and also just miss out. But your thoughts on uh, Gukesh's performance and anything you want to add here? Gukesh is a beast there. He is so, so strong and his age belies his maturity, his strength. And I've said this every single round for the most part that I've covered that he took a nosedive in the Isle of Man Grand Swiss event. He lost so many rating points just after becoming the number one rated player in India. The first person not named Vishwanathan Anand to do that in decades, literal decades. And then he had a very bad term in the Isle of Man to win the Chennai Masters after that, then to play in Vikanze. And he tied for first and lost what at the time felt like a heartbreaking tiebreaker to Wei Yi in that championship match in the quick tie patrol. So he has shown time and time again, he's able to bounce back here in the candidates, Danny. He lost a game to Ali Reza Frugia. We all saw it on camera. He had a chance to be in the lead. And then suddenly what was an unlosable position was lost. His head was on the table. He still extended his hand, reset the pieces, kept his attitude, and then went on to win the darn tournament. So he is just an unbelievable player at just 17. You have to be proud of him. Again, it's just insane to see someone so young show such poise, resilience, perseverance. You just highlighted perhaps what was the lowest moment for Gukesh in the candidates, that blown uh, victory or game that he seemed to have in hand against Ali Reza Faruja. So all, all you can do now is just continue to applaud. We kept talking about it. We kept saying... Don't turn your back on any of the young players from India who were there apparently to get experience. And as the event went on and the victories continued to mount for Gukesh Damaraju, here we are. As you said, a billion fans in India. We might be living in a world known as Gukesh Damaraju's world championship title at the end of the year. Who knows? And on that note, we'll, we'll wrap a ribbon on the conversation. I'll throw it back to you, Danya, to react to this first. But apparently in the the rules are that a second place nod would go to tie breaks and there would not be a tiebreaker or a blitz event at my house pool party. That would mean Hikaru Nakamura in the crazy event that Ding Lee Ren did choose not to defend the title would actually get the nod and you would see a match between Gukesh Damaraju and Hikaru Nakamura. I think it's crazy to speculate on that, especially because there's no reason Ding Lee Ren wouldn't play. But it is kind of weird that we live in a world where we have to wonder about that, given the actions of Magnus Carlsen and given what people have wondered about Ding Lee Ren. So your thoughts on, on the tiebreak system there and whether that feels right or what that would look like if Hikaru and Gukesh played? Well, you know, absolutely. It's it's in the realm of possibility. Uh, but, you know, compared to the situation after the Madrid candidates, uh, I forget if there was confirmation that Magnus wouldn't play, but essentially the the feel in the chess world was that people uh, had a very good sense that, that Magnus was not going to defend uh, his title. And a shout out, of course, to Magnus for appearing on, on today's show. Uh, but we don't have that evidence with Ding. He's been struggling, but at the same time, um, he's he's been playing and he's been trying to work through it. And I don't see any reason to believe that he won't defend his title. That's still a long way away if he does. And uh, if Hikaru Nakamura gets a chance, then that's going to be absolutely incredible. And either way, Hikaru's performance deserves a lot of applause as well. The fact that he let people into his thinking process, he did recaps, win or lose. So many people gave everything to this candidate's uh, Danny and it's it's incredible it just shows that you can never predict what's going to happen the playing strengths of the players are so close this young generation 
It plays like the old generation. And Yana Pomnushi played like he was 17 years old. Gukesh played like he was 30. There's just no way to predict how this stuff is going to go down. And I think that not a single one of us is disappointed at the level of play we saw throughout all of these 14 rounds and the individual performances that will be talked about. Of course, Gukesh's victory, but also the performances of so many other players who are going to come away with a smile on their faces. Or in the case of Jan, Fabi, maybe Hikaru, bittersweet and maybe a frown. Robert, it's hard if you're Hikaru, Jan, or Fabi, I think, to actually be upset with your play. Uh, how do you feel if, you, if you're thinking about that? You go, well, wow, the young the young guy came and took it. What do you do to reflect on that, knowing that you didn't achieve your goal in Toronto? But ultimately, I think all three of them probably played good enough to win the event, if not if not for the 17-year-old prodigy, now, now, now arrived superstar. Well, I think everyone has regrets when they don't win a game and especially when they don't win a tournament. And each one will have a different regret. For Jan Napomashi, his score against the player in last place, Nijad Abasov, two draws. Gukesh scored two wins against Abasov. So that is a place where you may think, oh, you know, maybe he should have made the most of his rating advantage because everybody else was in a similar field. Then for five minute Karwana, it's like, well, if I didn't lose that eighth round to Hikaru and have an even score, I wouldn't have had to go on a blazing hot streak just to finish the tournament in a tie with Gukesh. And if you're Hikaru, you're thinking, man, can somebody get Vidit Gujarati out of here? He beat me in both games. He lost twice to Yana Pamshi. Uh, you know, things just didn't go his way with respect to Vidit. And that's a credit to Vidit, who is such a strong player. And he made his mark on this tournament with so many decisive games. In the end, he couldn't stay uh, keep footing with the others at the top. But still, he made his mark felt. So you look at all these players, they're going to regret certain moves, certain games. Fabi can regret game one against Hikaru because if he beat him with white, that could have sent Hikaru into an early tilt and uh, Fabi on the yep. ascent. So regardless of who you are, you look back and missed opportunities. But I think you also look ahead and see that the future is bright, both for all these players and especially for Gukesh, who deserves all the congratulations in the world. He does deserve all the congratulations in the world. I think we should throw up that that amazing image of him winning one more time. Let's do it again. For anyone who might be bouncing in right now and going, wait, what happened? We officially know who is competing in the next World Chess Championship match, and it is the youngest player ever in history to do it. Gukesh Damaraju, at 17 years of age, will face Ding Lee Ren and challenge for the World Championship title. If you missed it, it might be worth the full replay. Hope you enjoyed your Sunday. Otherwise... But wow, what a wild ride this was, guys. I uh, don't know if we need to even give any more further wrap-up thoughts. We know what the, the standings shake out with Gukesh on top. For those wondering, again, Hikaru Nakamura, Fabiano Caruana, and Yanda Pomnishi finish uh, tied for second. I think actually in that order, based on the fact that total wins apparently is the tiebreaker. Uh, but uh, right now, all that matters is Gukesh gets to celebrate as he as he well, as he very much deserves to do so. So, guys, should we throw it? Are you ready? I mean, you guys are in charge of this. I just, I just got here. You guys get to, you guys get to make the call. Any final thoughts you have? Donna, you first. Well, obviously, um, it takes, it takes a village, and congratulations are in order, of course, to Gukesh's team. Uh, most of all, his family, his parents, who I'm sure probably are are more relieved than anything else. Uh, but the joy will come once the uh, once their heart stops pounding, uh, and it might keep pounding for a while. So, uh, just an amazing moment. But of course, eventually the preparations for the World Championship will begin. The celebration can only last so long, and the job is not done yet. And we hope to see. I think Gukesh, above everybody else, hopes to see a fully recovered Dingley Ren defending his throne. That will be an incredible match, whether or not uh, we see Ding or Hikaru or somebody else. I've learned not to even try to make predictions, Robert. Uh, but I just wanted to express, as I did at the start of the show, that it was a great privilege to cover so many of the rounds, these last two rounds. Um, and uh, I feel like I have courtside seats as I watch chess history getting written. And uh, that's an amazing spot to be in. So uh, I'm just really happy uh, to watch so many hours of amazing chess with uh, two amazing people and uh, millions of others watching from all across the world. Well, it is a pleasure of a lifetime to cover these major events with the two of you. It is truly an honor. And I wanna give a special shout out to one person in particular, 
Vish Vanathan Anin, because the former world champion, the Tiger from Madras, he has inspired a nation. He has lit up the country of India in the best way possible. He has helped grow the chess scene there. The young talent, he works with them and bites them into his home. We've seen plenty of footage of that. So Vishy Anand, I know you're covering this event. One of the official commentators, you deserve a round of applause because it's not just you anymore. We have Gukesh playing for a world championship and all eyes will be on the Indian prodigy. So his team, his seconds, his family, his friends, everybody who has shown him support, they deserve a round of applause too. And it's been a great event. Every player in the candidates and the women's candidates, shout out to Tan Zhang Yi for winning and getting another shot at the Women's World Championship. This would not happen without the great play, the great fighting spirit, and just the pure love of the game that every single participant has. Well said by both you guys as uh, someone who was a fan for this entire event and was just lucky enough to sit alongside you for the last day. I want to say this was incredible. Shout out to the whole commentary team. Shout out to everyone who brought us here. Before we throw it finally to our last break, let's show everybody how they finished. Of course, we already know Gukesh Damaraju takes highlighted in orange in many ways. I guess the only place that matters. Hikaru Nakamura, Yanda Pomnishi, and Fabiana Carwana came just short although neither of them, and none of them didn't play well enough to win the event, but Gukesh was just dominant above them all. As you can see, Pragnananda bit it, Ali Reza and Nijad Abbasov finished respectively to round out the field, and those were their earnings. All right, I think everyone here has earned a break. The, the whole team who worked super hard, shout out to the production, shout out to the crew, the mods, the community staff, everyone who brings these events together, the content team and everyone Covering this thing around the clock at chess.com. I'm grateful. I think the whole world is grateful. Thank you, fans, for being here. More than 200,000 of you at one point during the peak of the broadcast today. And uh, hopefully you got uh, you got your money's worth. The show, the show will go on. We, of course, will have coverage of the World Championship match. That's at the end of the year. For now, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your weekend, what's left of it. Uh, and if you're in India, go party. Be safe. Keep the streets safe because it's it's going to be a party in India all year. So for the whole team, I'm going to sign off on that note and say thank you for watching the 2024 B-Day Candidates coverage on Chess.com. <laughs>